Preface to On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Preface. My business has been to give, in the following pages, a literal translation of the six books of Lucretius. This task I have carefully performed, and it will, I trust, be no presumption to say that he who wishes to know what is in Lucretius without perusing the original will learn it from this volume with greater certainty than from any other previously offered to the English reader. The tax immediately followed is that of Forbiger, which may, indeed, be rather called Wakefield's, for the one varies but little from the other. But I have not dismissed a single page of the translation without consulting the texts of Lumbinus, Creech, and Haverkamp, which are substantially the same, and in many instances far more satisfactory than Forbiger's. Concerning all disputed or obscure passages, I have diligently examined the commentators, especially Lumbinus, who is almost instad omnium, Creech and Wakefield, and have added explanatory notes respecting either the subject matter or the translation of particular words or phrases. The words which it has been found necessary to supply are distinguished by italics. Where a parcel and a verb, having a similar signification, come together in construction, they have occasionally been rendered as two verbs. Thus, sparsus disicitur will be translated is scattered and dispersed. The particle yam is sometimes omitted, and where a succession of copulative conjunctions occurs, which Lucretius uses superabundantly, one has occasionally been left out in the translation, or been rendered by while, as well as, or in some similar way, for the sake of variety. Any other deviations from the structure of the text, which in the least concern the student, are pointed out in the notes. Tu and tus, in the addresses of the poet to Memmius, or the general reader, are sometimes translated by thou and thine, and sometimes by you and your. Where Lucretius seemed to be particularly earnest, I have adopted the former mode, and in other cases, the latter. J. S. W. Remarks on the Life and Poem of Lucretius Of the life of Lucretius, but little information has reached us. Ad nos vix tenuis famae per labitur aura. That he was a Roman by birth is inferred from the passages in his poem in which he speaks of the Roman world as his country and of the Roman language as his native tongue. As to the time of his birth, it is stated by Eusebius in his Chronicon that he was born in the second year of the hundred and seventy-first Olympiad, or ninety-five years before Christ. At this period, Aeneas had been dead about seventy years. Cicero was in his twelfth year. Twenty-five years were to elapse before the birth of Virgil, and four before that of Julius Caesar. His style, indeed, would make him seem older, but its antiquated character may be partly affected, in imitation, perhaps, of Aeneas, for whom he expresses great veneration. Concerning his family, nothing is known. The name of Lucretius, from the time of Lucretia downwards, occurs frequently in the history of Rome, with the surnames Trisipitinus, Cinna, Ophella, and others attached to it. But with whom the poet was connected, or from whom descended, it is impossible to discover. There was a Lucretius Vespillo, contemporary with him, a senator mentioned by Cicero and Caesar, of whom Lambinus conjectures that he may have been the brother, suggesting that the one brother, by engaging in public life, might have attained senatorial dignity, while the other, devoting himself to literature and retirement, might have continued in the equestrian or even plebeian rank in which he was born. But all this is mere empty conjecture. Equally groundless is the supposition, started also by Lambinus, that in his youth he went to Athens to study, and there, under the instruction of Zeno, who was then at the head of the Epicureans, became imbued with the doctrines of Epicurus. 
that he attached himself to the tenets of Epicurus is certain, but when or where he studied them is not now to be ascertained. Dunlop, however, asserts that Lucretius was sent with other young Romans of rank to study at Athens. Thus it is that errors crept into biography and history, the learned conjecture and the less learned affirm. Lambinus suggests that Lucretius might have gone to Athens. Dunlop states that he did go. Lambinus says that it is probable. Dunlop says it is fact. He wrote his poem, or part of it, as appears from a passage near the beginning of the first book, at a time when the Roman commonwealth was in a disturbed state. But whether the disorders to which he alludes were, as is generally supposed, those excited by Catiline, or, as Forbiger suggests, those which were raised by Claudius eight years afterwards, there is no means of deciding. His poem and his life, if we may trust Eusebius, were ended in the manner following. Having been driven to madness by an amatory potion, and having composed several books in the intervals of his insanity, which Cicero afterwards corrected, he died by his own hand in the forty-fourth year of his age. By whom the potion was administered is conjectured only from a passage in St. Jerome, who says that a certain Lucilia killed her husband or her lover by giving him a filter which was intended to secure his love, but of which the effect was to render him insane. This Lucilia is supposed to have been the wife or mistress of Lucretius, but by whom the supposition was first made I am not able to discover. He is said by Donatus, or whoever wrote the old life of Virgil, to have died on the day on which Virgil assumed the toga virilis. That Cicero corrected what he wrote, there is, except from the passage in Eusebius, no indication. From a passage in Varro, it has been concluded that he wrote many more books than have reached us. For Lucretius, says he, suorum unius et viginti librorum initium fecit hoc, aetheris et terrae genitabile quaerere tempus. But Lambinus has very plausibly conjectured that for Lucretius should be substituted Lucilius, or the name of some other writer known to us. This is the more probable, observes Eichstadt, as Varro was older than Lucretius, and was not accustomed to draw examples and testimonies from younger writers. From the six books, as they now stand, there is no inference to be drawn that more were written. That something more was intended is perhaps true, for when we consider how the sixth book breaks off, we must either suppose that he designed to write a conclusion to it, or that he meant another book to follow. It signifies, however, that he was drawing to the conclusion of his undertaking, and indeed the doctrines of Epicurus are so fully set forth in the six books that little more could have been added respecting them. It is true that there are two or three allusions among the grammarians to passages and verses which are not now found in the six books, allusions which have led to the belief that there were more books, but which, with other considerations, led Spalding the editor of Quintilian, to the suspicion that there were two editions given by the author himself, and that, though the second was generally followed, the first was not quite forgotten. Thus, the 937th verse of the first book, which is now read, Contingunt melis dulci favoque liquore, is cited by Quintilian, Aspirant melis dulci favoque liquore, and Servius, on those lines in the Georgics, non ego cum tameis amplecti versibus opto, non mihi si linguae centum sint ora qui centum, ferea vox, says, the verses are Lucretius's, but he has ainea vox, not ferea, verses which are not now to be found in Lucretius. This notion of two editions Eichstadt has noticed at some length in his dissertation De Lucreti Vita et Carmine, and Forbiger has written a long essay to show that Lucretius's verses have been much altered. Fateor enim, says Forbiger, ex quo primum Lucreti Carmen, sudiosius per legerim operamque meam e inavaverim, plures mihi oblatas esse causas suspicandi, nobis in his sex de rerum natura libris non unius Lucreti, 
seduorum scriptorum longe diversorum manum agnoscendam, ideoque hunc etiam autorem is anumerandum esse, quorum scripta a serioribus multis in locis mutata, auta vel contracta, emendata vel corrupta, denique longe alia ab ea, quam autor ipsis dederit, forma induta, ad nostra tempora pervenerint. I confess that, since I first read the poem of Lucretius with attention, and bestowed serious labor upon it, many reasons occurred to me for suspecting that, in these six books concerning the nature of things, we have to recognize not the hand of Lucretius alone, but those of two writers of far different characters, and that this author is therefore to be numbered with those whose works have come down to us altered in many places by later writers, having been augmented or diminished in bulk, amended or corrupted, and invested with a different form from that which the author himself gave them. But perhaps, in the case of Lucretius, the variations which we find in the verses which are cited from him are to be attributed not to any regular revision or emendation of his writings, but to the casual mistakes of transcribers and the lapse of memory in grammarians. Perhaps also passages containing verses cited by Servius and others have been lost, Lachmann, the last editor, finds, or imagines that he finds, deficiencies in several pages. The Memmius to whom the poem is addressed was, as Lambinus and others think, Caius Memius Gemellus, a Roman knight, who is described by Cicero as a learned man, well-read in Greek, but disdainful of Latin literature, a clever orator, and of an agreeable style, but shrinking from the labor, not only of speaking, but even of thinking and doing injustice to his ability by his want of industry. He became praetor, and after his praetorship had the province of Bithynia, to which he was accompanied by Catullus the poet. Being supported by Caesar, he stood for the consulship, but was unsuccessful, and after being accused and condemned of bribery, went into exile at Petri, where he died. Cicero defended him on his trial, and addressed to him some letters, which may be found in the thirteenth book of his epistles to his friends. The general voice of criticism has awarded to Lucretius high praise as a poet. The earliest notice which we find of his works is that of Cicero, in a letter to his brother Quintus, in which he says, as the passage stands in Ernesti, Lucretii poemata ut scribis ita sunt, non multis luminibus ingenii, multae tamen artis. The poetry of Lucretius is such as you say, having not much splendor of genius, but a great deal of art. Wakefield would omit the non, but is opposed by Eistad and Schutz and by general opinion. Cicero, however, if we read his words rightly, seems hardly to do justice to the poet, or to hit the general character of his work. To us of the present day, he appears to be chiefly distinguished by a rough vigor, and to have been anxious, rather, to express his thoughts strongly than to clothe them in elegance or niceties of language. Not that he disdained poetical beauties, for Virgil and others have found in him many worthy of adoption, but vigor and animation seem to have been his chief aim. Stasius did him more justice when he spoke of the docti furor ardus lucreti, the lofty rage of the learned Lucretius. Ovid thoroughly understood his merit, and predicted that his poem was destined to be immortal. Carmina sublimi stung sum peritura lucreti, exitio terras, cum dabit una dies. Cornelius Nepus ranks him in elegance with Catullus, for speaking of a certain Julius Calidus, who was rescued from prescription by Pomponius Atticus, he calls him the most elegant poet since the death of Catullus and Lucretius. Quintilian gives him similar praise, saying that he is elegance in sua materia, elegant in his peculiar department, though he thinks him difficult for the student. Aulus Julius calls him a poet excelling in genio et facundia, ingenious and force of language. Serenus Simonicus styles him the great Lucretius, and Valius Paterculus, Vitruvius, Seneca, Macrobius, and Pliny the Younger notice him as ranked among the most eminent poets, though without bestowing on him any specific commendation. 
he is recognized in a similar way by Propertius and Tacitus. There was therefore a little cause for Dunlop to complain of the slight mention that is made of Lucretius by succeeding Latin authors, and of the coldness with which he is spoken of by all Roman critics and poets, with the exception of Ovid. Horace, indeed, who makes abundant mention of Aeneas and Lucilius, has, it must be acknowledged, not named Lucretius. Dunlop, to account for this silence of Horace, and the supposed intended silence of others, suggests that the spirit of free thinking which pervaded his writings may have rendered it unsuitable or unsafe to extol his poetical talents. There was a time, he adds, when, in this country, it was thought scarcely decorous or becoming to express high admiration of the genius of Rousseau and Voltaire. With reference to Horace and his times, there may have been some ground for this supposition. Cicero, in his De Amicitia, introduces Lelius, saying that he does not agree with those who have lately begun to assert that souls perish together with their bodies, and that death makes an end of all. I rather submit myself, he continues, to the authority of the ancients, or of our own forefathers, who appointed religious rites for the dead, rites which they would not have instituted had they thought that the dead could not be affected by them, or to the authority of him who has pronounced by the oracle of Apollo the wisest of men, and who did not on this, as on most subjects, assert sometimes one thing and sometimes another, but maintain invariably the same opinion, that the souls of men are divine, and that, when they are released from the body, a return to heaven is open to them, and first of all to the best and most worthy. But, he concludes, as if unwilling to side too closely with either party, should the opinion of those be true, who think that the soul and the body perish together, and that all sense is terminated by their separation, death will then be attended with neither good nor evil. The moderns have certainly not been less willing to praise Lucretius than the ancients. Barthius and Turnibus commend the attractive simplicity of his antique Latinity. Crinitus and Cosabon speak of his style in a similar manner. And Julius Scaliger calls him a divine man, an incomparable poet. The elegies bestowed upon him by Lambinus, Faber, and his other commentators, I omit, as they might be regarded as the offspring of partiality. Our own countrymen have not been behind others in offering their tribute of admiration, as exhibited in editions, translations, remarks, and quotations. Dr. Wharton, in his essay on Pope, calls the nature of things the noblest descriptive poem extant, and has most happily illustrated the poet's vigor of conception and execution. The Persians, says he, distinguish the different degrees of the strength of fancy in different poets by calling them painters or sculptors. Lucretius, from the force of his images, should be ranked among the latter. He is, in truth, a sculpture poet. His images have a bold relief. If Lucretius had not been spoiled by the Epicurean system, says Lord Byron, he should have had a far superior poem to any now in existence. As mere poetry, it is the first of Latin poems. But the most discriminating and ample praise that has been given him by any English author is that of Dryden. If I am not mistaken, says he, the distinguished character of Lucretius, I mean of his soul and genius, is a certain kind of noble pride and positive assertion of his own opinions. He is everywhere confident of his own reason, and assuming an absolute command, not only over his vulgar readers, but even his patron, Memmius, for he is always bidding him attend, as if he had the rod over him, and using a magisterial authority while he instructs him. He seems to disdain all manner of replies, and is so confident of his cause, that he is beforehand with his antagonists, urging for them whatever he imagined they could say, and leaving them, as he supposes, without an objection for the future. All this, too, with so much scorn and indignation, as if he were assured of the triumph before he entered into the lists. From this sublime and daring genius of his, it must of necessity come to pass that his thoughts must be masculine, full of argumentation, and that sufficiently warm. From the same fiery temper proceeds the loftiness of his expressions, and the perpetual torrent of his verse, 
when the barrenness of his subject does not too much restrain the quickness of his fancy. For there is no doubt to be made, but that he could have been everywhere as poetical as he is in his descriptions, and in the moral part of his philosophy, if he had not aimed more to instruct in his system of nature than to delight. With regard to the subject of his poem, Lucretius is to be contemplated as a natural and moral philosopher. The physical part of his philosophy, and most, indeed, of the moral part, he took from Epicurus, who, as Cicero observes, had previously adopted his physics from Democritus. Of this, the great principle is that nothing can proceed from nothing, and that, consequently, this world in which we live and every other object in the universe was formed from matter that previously existed. How this matter came to exist, we need not inquire. We are to suppose that it existed always. In its original state, it was an infinitude of detached atoms, moving or falling through unlimited space, for that space is unlimited is by Lucretius elaborately proved. These atoms are infrangible and indestructible, for matter is not infinitely divisible. There must be a point at which division ends. They are hard and solid, or they would be unable to endure agitation and attrition throughout an infinity of ages. They are of different shapes, suited for the formation of various substances by combination. The number of their forms, however, is limited, but the number of each form is infinite. The atoms were moving, but whence had they the beginning of motion? From their own gravity, for all bodies moved downwards by their own weight. This is the commencement of absurdity in the system. For, if space be infinite, one direction in it cannot be called downwards more than another. As Lucretius himself indeed acknowledges, observing that nil est funditus imum, nor can any reason be assigned why an atom should move from one part of infinite space to another. This commencement of motion, however, being assumed, it is next to be shown how atoms combined. Had they all moved, as might have been supposed, in straight lines, as they fell or proceeded through space, there could have been no coalition among them, unless the heavier had overtaken the lighter. But Lucretius, or Epicurus, had sufficient conception of the motion of bodies in empty space to understand that light bodies must move through it as speedily as heavy ones, and that, consequently, one atom could not overtake another. It was necessary, therefore, to make some of them deviate from the straight or perpendicular line, and it is accordingly assumed that some do deviate from it. This supposition, says Cicero, is mere puerility, for he introduces the deviation arbitrarily, he makes some atoms decline from the straight course without cause, and to say that anything takes place without a cause is to a natural philosopher the most disgraceful of all things. To assert, too, that some decline and some go straight onwards is, as it were, to give properties and duties to atoms despotically, determining which is to go in a right line and which obliquely. But when from partial deviations, some had come in contact with others, they began to form combinations. They strove, as it were, for a long time ineffectually, but at length the larger and heavier atoms coalesced into the denser substances, as earth and water, the smaller and lighter into more subtle matters, as air and fire. From combinations of such substances arose plants and animals, as trees and worms still spring from the earth when it is moistened and warmed. Of the rise of animals in general, and of men specially, the reader will find an ample account, according to the notions of Epicurus, in the fifth book. Nature does not abhor a vacuum. On the contrary, it is necessary that there should be, throughout the whole of matter, certain portions of empty space, or the movement of particles would be utterly impeded. Water, for instance, could not be a liquid unless there were vacuities among its atoms to allow them to yield to pressure. Man consists of a body and a soul. The body is constituted of coarser and the soul of finer matter. Both are produced together and grow up and decay together. 
at death, the connection between them is dissolved. The soul takes its departure to be decomposed and mingled with other matter, and the body begins to decay that it may undergo a similar fate. The mind is intimately connected with the soul, so intimately that they must be said to form one substance. Both are composed of heat, vapor, air, and a certain fourth substance, which has no name, but which is the most important of the four, as being the origin of motion in the whole man. That both are wholly corporeal is indisputable, from their power to act on the body. Tangere nim et tangi nisi corpus nulla potest res. Ideas of objects in the mind are produced by the mysterious action of images of things on the soul and intellect, images of a light vapory substance, which are perpetually passing off from the surface of all bodies whatsoever, and exhibiting the exact resemblance of the objects from which they are detached. Other images, too, are formed spontaneously in the atmosphere, as we see clouds, at times, form themselves into likenesses of things on the face of the sky. Of images, accordingly, the number is infinite, so that, whenever a man wishes to think on anything, the image of it is generally ready to present itself for his contemplation. If he cannot recollect what he wishes to think on, he may consider that an image of it is not at hand. Dreams are excited by images, which, as they pass through the air, penetrating the coverings of the body, come in contact with such atoms of the soul as are at the surface of the body, and thus communicate their impressions to the whole of the soul and mind. Vision is produced by the same images flying off from the surface of the objects at which we look, and striking on the eye. Reflection from mirrors and other smooth surfaces is produced by the image first striking the reflecting plane and then being reverberated to the eye. Voice, like all sounds, is a corporeal substance, because it frequently, as it passes forth, causes abrasion of the throat, and because much speaking exhausts the corporeal frame by detraction of atoms. The members and organs of the body were not formed with a design that they might be used, for there could have been no design in the offspring of fortuitously meeting atoms. But as they have been formed, and we find them capable of being used, we apply them, accordingly, to the uses for which they seem adapted. The feet were not formed for walking, but as we find they enable us to walk, we employ them in walking. Of all our knowledge, the foundation must rest on the perceptions of our senses. To our senses we can assuredly trust, for what shall refute them? Will anything distinct from them refute them, or will they refute one another? That which shall convict them of falsehood must be more trustworthy than they. But what can be more trustworthy? What shall convince us that those bodies which appear to the senses square, or hot, or black, are not possessed of those qualities? The motions and combinations of atoms being established, all natural phenomena, as thunder, lightning, rain, earthquakes, are easily shown to arise from their changes of place and effects on one another. Even were it not demonstrable that the world was fortuitously formed by the coalescence of atoms, it might yet be safely affirmed, from the numerous faults apparent in it, and from the various causes of suffering to animal life which it contains, that it was not made by divine wisdom as an abode for living creatures. It sprung into being casually, and animals that casually sprung from it make the best of that abode to which they are confined, and from which there is no release but death. This world which we inhabit is not the only one in the universe. The number of atoms being infinite, it is naturally to be supposed that they must have produced more worlds than one. It is therefore probable that there are many worlds of many kinds. And as these worlds have been generated, we may fairly argue that they also decay. Men, other animals, and the trees of the forest are born but to die. And why should not a world be subject to the same fate as the things which grow in it? We see, indeed, the symptoms of decadence in the world which we inhabit, for the present productions of the earth are not of the same vigor as those of its earlier days. All, then, around us, we may conclude, is making progress towards dissolution. 
the great globe will continue to sink and grow infirm, until at last, mouldering and disruptured, it scatters its atoms through surrounding space to contribute to the formation of other worlds, like or unlike itself. Star after star from heaven's bright arch shall rush, suns sink on suns, and systems systems crush, headlong, extinct, to one dark center fall, and death and night and chaos mingle all. Till, o'er the wreck, emerging from the storm, immortal nature lifts her changeful form, mounts from her funereal pyre on wings of flame, and soars and shines another and the same. Darwin Such were the general tenets of Lucretius as a natural philosopher, tenets on which the reader will find him amply enlarging in the following pages. His doctrines as a moral philosopher may be noticed with greater brevity. His great boast as a moralist was that he freed men from the terrors of death and of suffering after death. The soul, says he, when it is separated from the body, is dispersed among the matter from which it was collected, and the man ceases to be. His atoms continue to exist, for they are indestructible, but his own existence as an individual being is no more. He is separated into his parts, and his consciousness that he ever existed as a whole is at an end. Of what has been, he will have no recollection. Of what shall be, he will have no knowledge. Why then should he dread to die, when after death no suffering can ensue? He that is about to die young may felicitate himself that he shall escape that trouble and affliction of which some falls to the lot of every man. He that dies at an advanced age may be satisfied that he has had so long opportunity for those enjoyments of which no man fails to obtain some. After a certain period, life offers nothing new, and why should we seek to prolong it? The greatest enjoyment of life consists in tranquil pleasure. To labor for honor and dignities, which are unsatisfactory when attained, is mere folly. Nature has supplied everything necessary to satisfy our wants, and to enable us to spend our existence in ease, contentment, and pleasure if we only study the best method of making the most of what is set before us. A wise man can live on a little, and to live contentedly on a little is to be equal in enjoyment to him who has more than ourselves, and who, however much he may have, can have no solid satisfaction unless he is contented with that which he possesses. The highest degree of wisdom that we can attain is to be able to look down from the serene elevations of philosophy, on the unreasoning crowds wandering beneath us, seeking for the path of happiness, and vainly hoping to find it in the pursuit of the splendors and distinctions of the world. Whether he really believed in the existence of gods, that is, of beings of a similar but superior nature to ourselves, it is not easy, from the perusal of his works, to decide. He at times speaks of gods, like Epicurus, as certainly existing, and enjoying a state of tranquil felicity, unconcerned about the affairs of the world, and unaffected by human good or human evil. At other times, he seems to consider them as mere creatures of the imagination, to which men have attributed, in the operations of nature, those effects of which they cannot discover the causes. The first edition of Lucretius was printed at Brasses by Ferrandus, without date, but, as Wakefield and others think, about the year 1470. It is of all Editiones Principes the most rare. The second edition appeared at Verona, printed by Freidenperger, in 1486, and the third at Venice, by T. de Ragazzonibus, in 1495. From Venice, too, in 1500, came forth the first edition of Aldus, and fifteen years afterwards the second, superintended by Naugerius, who did more to make his author intelligible than had been done in the former edition. In the meantime, however, 1511, had appeared at Bononia the edition of Baptista Pius, who brought much learning and ability to bear upon his author, and many of whose notes are still worthy of preservation. To have been greatly improved from the revised text of Michael Marullus, which was published from his manuscripts after his death by Petrus Candidus, whose name the edition bears, 
at Florence in 1512, of which text succeeding editors have overlooked the merits or have been unwilling to do justice to them. But all other editions were thrown into the shade by those of Lambinus, of which the first appeared in 1563, the second in 1565, and the third in 1570. Of all editors and expounders of Lucretius, Lambinus still deserves to stand at the head. He is accused by Wakefield of inconsulta temeritas, injudicious rashness, and intruding his own conjectures into the text, and by Eichstadt of having had too high an opinion of his own judgment and ability. But though there be some grounds for such accusations, his character as an editor is still of the highest order. He brought to his work a powerful mind, and knowing that Lucretius always intended to write sense, he took upon himself to put sense, perhaps at times too arbitrarily, into verses which had been left meaningless by transcribers. And it is surely no dishonor to him to have shown his contempt for such a man as Giphanius, who, in 1565, printed an edition at Antwerp, and whose annotations have little other claim to notice than that of stacking Lambinus with the meanness with which a low mind always attacks a higher. There were some other editions, but of not much account, between Giphanius's and that of Tanaqui Faber, which was published in 1662, containing notes, brief indeed, but evincing the great learning and acuteness of the editor. To Faber, in 1695, succeeded Creech. His text is Lambinus's with scarcely any variation, and though he never fails to expose a mistake of Lambinus when he finds one in his commentary, he is very ready to profit by all Lambinus's instructions. His interpretatio, after the manner of the Delphin editions, is of little use, for wherever there is any difficulty of construction, he invariably abbreviates. Yet, if we may credit the last editor, Lachmann, Multa rectius interpretatus est quam scripsit, in philosophia explicanda sane diligens, sed linguae latinae impeditissimus. This is too strong, but there are in his notes inelegances and inaccuracies. In 1725 appeared the splendid edition of Haverkamp, which is extremely useful as containing all the notes of Lambinus, Giphanius, Greech, and Faber, with a selection from those of Pius, and with a few of considerable value from Abrahamus Praegerus, a friend of Haverkamp. Of Haverkamp's own there is comparatively little. At length, in 1796, came out, with a dedication to Fox, the well-known edition of Wakefield. Wakefield had discovered, by the inspection of a manuscript or two, that Lambinus had taken, as he thought, unjustifiable liberties with the text of Lucretius, and conceived that he should be enabled to restore it to something like its original integrity. Had he been content to reinstate only those words or phrases which Lambinus or others had unreasonably ejected, he might have done greater service, but he replaced also such readings as any editor would have been blamed for suffering to remain. I will give one instance. In Lambinus and Creech, the 863rd verse of the third book stands thus. Interrupta semel cum sit repetentia nostra. Repetentia nostra, our memory or recollection. This is intelligible, but Wakefield, finding in manuscripts nostris, replaced it as a crux to his reader, who, as soon as he comes to it, is stuck fast. What, he inquires, is to be understood with nostris? It is vain to seek for anything in what precedes, and he must consult Wakefield's notes to find that, according to Wakefield's notion, rebus must be supplied. How much the difficulties in an author may be increased by such changes is easily conceivable. But he who has only read Lambinus or Creech's edition of Lucretius can have no conception how much the difficulties in Lucretius have been increased by Wakefield's arbitrary alterations. Whether Wakefield ever construed through a brick wall I do not know, but that he has raised abundance of brick walls through which others are left to construe is manifest. There is in his notes, besides other unnecessary matter, a vast quantity of superfluous railing 
at the inscitia and inwerecundia of Lambinus, and the inscitia and stupor of Creech, of which the reader may see an average specimen on 6582, and in various other places. A man worthy to edit Lucretius should have forborne to apply the term inscitia to such a predecessor as Lambinus. In 1801, Wakefield's text was reprinted at Leipzig by Eichstadt, who had previously obtained repute by his edition of Diodorus Siculus. The first volume, containing the text of the six books, Judicius Prolegomena, and an excellent index, is the only one that has appeared. In 1828 came forward the edition of Forbiger, which, chiefly perhaps from the convenience of its size, has been much used. His text is Wakefield's, with but very few alterations, and all his explanations of passages are Wakefield's. His work, says Lachman, was mercenary, and it would be doing him great injustice to suppose him capable of seeing anything by the light of his own intellect. In 1850, at Berlin, appeared Lachman's edition, in two thin volumes octavo. He is a little too fond of transposing verses, and discovering deficiencies in the text, but deserves great commendation for restoring many readings that Wakefield had ejected. His notes are not at all explanatory, but are wholly occupied about changes in the text. With regard to versions of Lucretius, the earliest attempt to render him into English was made by John Evelyn, the author of Silva, who, in 1656, published the first book in verse with a commentary. His lady designed the frontispiece, and Waller prefixed a copy of verses. The translation is faithful, but tame. In 1682 was published the translation by Creech, which, as the first complete version of the poet, was cordially welcomed. Evelyn furnished some laudatory couplets, saying how much he was pleased that the entire work had fallen to more vigorous hands than his own. Duke, Tate, and Otway gave also their tribute of verse, and Creech was everywhere known as the English Lucretius. But posterity have had time to discover the faults in his performance. Many of his lines are vigorous, but many are stiff and awkward, and the licenses which he has taken with the original are almost beyond belief. Whoever will look at the commencement of his first book will find that between the tenth and sixteenth verses he inserts five lines of his own. Similar interpolations may be found in other places, and he likewise curtails with equal freedom whenever it suits his purpose. About the same time Dryden produced some translations, or rather paraphrases, of particular passages, executed with his usual vigour. In 1743, there appeared, in two volumes octavo, a prose translation, which Good calls Garnier's, but which was the work of an unknown hand. Garnier, with others, furnished the plates. The version is but indifferent. Some parts of it, though printed as prose, run into blank verse. In 1799 the first book was translated in rhyme by an anonymous author, and in 1808 also in rhyme by the Rev. W. Hamilton Drummond. Both versions have merit, but the greater share of praise belongs to Mr. Drummond. In 1805 Dr. Good laid before the public his two quarto volumes, containing a version of the whole poem in blank verse, with copious notes. This translation is in general pleasing and animated, but some parts are rather stiff. Taken as a whole, it is by far the best extant, and is deemed by my publisher a desirable addition to the present volume. In 1813 was published by subscription, in two pompous volumes quarto, the rhymed version of Thomas Busby, Music Doctor. He is, to do him justice, tolerably faithful to the sense, but his couplets are far inferior to those of Mr. Drummond's first book. His notes are heavy and tedious, and all his learning second-hand. The whole book reminds the reader of the commencement of his well-known prologue, which Lord Byron, says Moore, unnecessarily travestied. When energizing objects men pursue, what are the prodigies they cannot do? In French, Lucretius has been translated several times. The earliest version is that of the Abbé de Marol, in prose, published in 1650, which has not obtained more esteem than his other translations of classical authors. In 1685, another prose translation was published by the Baron de Couture, which is paraphrastic, 
which seems tolerably faithful to the sense. In 1768, Lagrange published a third, which gives the thoughts of the poet with exactness, but wants vigor and animation. And in 1794, Le Blanc de Guillet brought out a fourth, in verse, which I have not minutely examined, but on which his countrymen set no very high value. The last, in 1825, was that of Pougerville, in prose, rather a paraphrase than a translation, and preserving nothing of the sententiousness of Lucretius. The Italian version of Marchetti, in blank verse, published in London, 1717, and since several times reprinted, has always been highly esteemed. The Germans have three translations, one by Mayr, 1784, in prose, which Degen, cited by Moss, calls pretty accurate, another by Meinecke, 1795, in examiner verse, which is generally considered faithful to the sense, and the last by Gnebel, 1821, which is also in examiner verse, and which is the most highly valued of the three. The Dutch have a prose translation by De Witt, printed in 1701, which Good says that he had seen, but without being induced to imitate it. I beg leave to observe that, in the notes attached to the following translation, I have not taken upon me to refute any of the doctrines of Lucretius or Epicurus. To have offered formal refutations of them would have occupied more space than could be afforded in the present volume, and many of them, in these days, require no refutation. I have, therefore, restricted myself to discharging that which Dryden admonishes me to be the duty of a translator, to do my author all the right I can, and to translate him to the best advantage. Those who seek for arguments against his tenets, physical or moral, may find them in Lactantius, in Arnobius, in the anti lucretius of Cardinal Polignac, in the Bridgewater Treatises, and in abundance of other English books. The famous refutation by Cardinal Polignac, called anti lucretius I might have quoted in every page, and the reader will perhaps wonder that I have not done so. But I forbore to quote him, as I forbore to quote others. He assailed Lucretius with great determination. His versification, though, deficient in Lucretian order, is always respectable, and sometimes elevated, and he would perhaps be more read, had he not unluckily, as Voltaire observes, when he attacked Lucretius, attacked Newton. End of Remarks on the Life and Poem of Lucretius Section 1 of On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 1. Book 1. Part 1. O bountiful Venus, mother of the race of Aeneas, delight of gods and men, who, beneath the gliding constellations of heaven, fillest with life the ship-bearing sea and the fruit-producing earth, since by thy influence every kind of living creature is conceived, and springing forth hails the light of the sun. Thee, O goddess, thee the winds flee, before thee, in thy approach, the clouds of heaven disperse. For thee, the variegated earth puts forth her fragrant flowers. On thee, the waters of ocean smile, and the calmed heaven beams with effulgent light. For, as soon as the vernal face of day is unveiled, and the genial gale of Favonius exerts its power unconfined, the birds of the air first, O goddess, testify of thee and thy coming, smitten in heart by thy influence. Next, the wild herds bound over the joyous pastures, and swim across the rapid streams. So all kinds of living creatures, captivated by thy charms and thy allurements, eagerly follow thee, whithersoever thou proceedest to lead them. In fine, 
throughout seas and mountains and whelming rivers and the leafy abodes of birds and verdant plains thou infusing balmy love into the breasts of all causes them eagerly to propagate their races after their kind since thou alone dost govern all things in nature neither does anything without thee spring into the ethereal realms of light nor anything becomes gladsome or lovely i desire thee to be my associate in this my song which i am essaying to compose on the nature of things for the instruction of my friend memmius whom thou o goddess hast willed at all times to excel graced with every gift the more therefore do thou o goddess bestow on my words an immortal charm cause the fierce pursuit of war meanwhile to cease being lulled to rest throughout all seas and lands for thou alone canst bless mortals with tranquil peace since mars the lord of arms who controls the cruel tasks of war often flings himself upon thy lap vanquished by the eternal wound of love and thus looking up his graceful neck thrown back he feasts his eager eyes with love gazing intently on thee o goddess and his breath as he reclines hangs on thy lips bending over him o goddess as he reposes to embrace him with thy sacred person pour from thy lips sweet converse entreating unruffled peace illustrious divinity for thy romans for neither can we pursue our task with tranquil mind in this untranquil time of our country nor can the illustrious scion of memmius at such a crisis desert the common interest for what remains lend me o memmius thy unprejudiced ears and apply thyself released from cares to the investigation of truth and leave not as things despised my offerings arranged for thee with faithful zeal before they are understood for i shall proceed to discourse to thee of the whole system of heaven and the gods and unfold to thee the first principles of all things from which nature produces develops and sustains all and into which she again resolves them at their dissolution these in explaining our subject we are accustomed to call matter and the generative bodies of things and to designate as the seeds of all things and to term them primary bodies because from them as primary all things are derived for the whole nature of the gods must necessarily of itself enjoy immortality in absolute repose separated and far removed from our affairs for exempt from all pain exempt from perils all sufficient in its own resources and needing nothing from us it is neither propitiated by services from the good nor affected with anger against the bad when the life of men lay foully groveling before our eyes crushed beneath the weight of a religion who displayed her head from the regions of the sky lowering over mortals with terrible aspect a man of greece was the first that dared to raise mortal eyes against her and first to make a stand against her him neither tales of god nor thunderbolts nor heaven itself with its threatening roar repressed but roused the more the active energy of his soul so that he should desire to be the first to break the close bars of nature's portals accordingly the vivid force of his intellect prevailed and proceeded far beyond the flaming battlements of the world and in mind and thought traversed the whole immensity of space hence triumphant he declares to us what can arise into being and what cannot in fine in what way the powers of all things are limited and a deeply fixed boundary assigned to each by which means religion brought down under our feet is bruised in turn and his victory sets us on a level with heaven in treating of these subjects i fear thou mayst haply think that thou art entering on forbidden elements of philosophy 
and commencing a course of crime. Whereas, on the contrary, that much extolled religion has too frequently given birth to criminal and impious deeds. As when at Aulis, the chosen leaders of the Greeks, the chief of men, foully stained the altar of the virgin trivia with the blood of Iphigenia. When the fillet, clasping her virgin tresses, dropped from each cheek in equal length, and she saw her sire stand sorrowing before the altars, and the attendant priests close by him, concealing the knife, and her countrymen shedding tears at the sight of her, she, dumb with fear, dropping on her knees, sank to the earth. Nor could it, at such a time, avail the hapless maiden that she had been the first to bless the king with the name of father. For, raised by the hands of men, and trembling, she was led to the altar. Not that, the solemn service of sacrifice being performed, she might be accompanied with the loud bridal hymn. But spotless, though stained, she might, even in her wedding prime, fall, a sad victim, by her father's immolating hand, that a successful and fortunate voyage might be granted to the fleet. To such evils could religion persuade mankind. Wilt thou, too, overcome by the frightful tales of bards, ever seek to turn away from me? Surely not, for doubtless I, even now, could invent for thee many dreams, which might disturb the tenor of thy life, and confound all thy enjoyments with terror. And with reason, too, under the present system of belief, for did man but know that there was a fixed limit to their woes, they would be able, in some measure, to defy the religious fictions and menaces of the poets. But now, since we must fear eternal punishment at death, there is no mode, no means of resisting them. For men know not what the nature of the soul is, whether it is engendered with us, or whether, on the contrary, it is infused into us at our birth, whether it perishes with us, dissolves by death, or whether it haunts the gloomy shades and vast pools of Orcas, or whether, by divine influence, it infuses itself into other animals, as our Aeneas sung, who first brought from pleasant Helicon a crown of never-fading leaf, which should be distinguished in fame throughout the Italian tribes of men. Though, in addition, however, Aeneas, setting it forth in deathless song, declares that there are temples of Acheron, whither neither our souls nor our bodies penetrate, but only phantoms, strangely pale, from amongst whom he relates that the apparition of undying Homer, rising up before him, began to pour forth briny tears, and to expound in words the nature of things. Wherefore, with reason, then, not only an inquiry concerning celestial affairs is to be accurately made by us, as by what means the courses of the sun and moon are effected, and by what influence all things individually are directed upon the earth, but especially also we must consider, with scrutinizing examination, of what the soul and the nature of the mind consist, and what it is which, haunting us, sometimes when awake and sometimes when overcome by disease or buried in sleep, terrifies the mind, so that we seem to behold and to hear speaking before us those whose bones after death is past the earth embraces. Nor does it escape my consideration that it is difficult to explain in Latin verse the profound discoveries of the Greeks, especially since we must treat of much in novel words, on account of the poverty of her language, and the novelty of the subjects. But yet thy virtues, and the expected pleasure of thy sweet friendship, prompt me to endure any labor whatsoever, and induce me to outwatch the clear cold nights, weighing with what words, with what possible verse, I may succeed in displaying to thy mind those clear lights, by which thou mayst be able to gain a thorough insight into these abstruse subjects. This terror and darkness of the mind, therefore, it is not the rays of the sun or the bright shafts of day that must dispel, but reason and the contemplation of nature, of which our first principle shall hence take its commencement, 
that nothing is ever divinely generated from nothing. For thus it is that fear restrains all men, because they observe many things effected on the earth and in heaven, of which effects they can by no means see the causes, and therefore think that they are wrought by a divine power. For which reasons, when we shall have clearly seen that nothing can be produced from nothing, we shall then have a more accurate perception of that of which we are in search, and shall understand whence each individual thing is generated, and how all things are done without the agency of the gods. For, if things came forth from nothing, every kind of thing might be produced from all things. Nothing would require seed. In the first place, man might spring from the sea. The scaly tribe and birds might spring from the earth. Herds and other cattle might burst from the sky. The cultivated fields, as well as the deserts, might contain every kind of wild animal, without any settled law of production. Nor would the same fruits be constant to the same trees, but would be changed, and all trees might bear all kinds of fruit. Since, when there should not be generative elements for each production, how could a certain parent producer remain invariable for all individual things? But now, because all things are severally produced from certain seeds, each is produced and comes forth into the regions of light from that spot in which the matter and first elements of each subsist. And for this cause all things cannot be produced from all, inasmuch as there are distinct and peculiar faculties in certain substances. Besides, why do we see the rose put forth in spring, corn in summer heat, and vines under the influence of autumn, if it be not because, when the determinate seeds of things have united together at their proper time, whatever is produced appears, while the seasons are favorable, and while the vigorous earth securely brings forth her tender productions into the regions of light. But if these things were generated from nothing, they might arise suddenly at indefinite periods, and at unsuitable seasons of the year, inasmuch as there would be no original elements which might be restrained from a generative combination at any season, however inconvenient. Nor, moreover, would there be need of time for the coming together of seed, for the growth of things, if they could grow out of nothing. For young men might on a sudden be formed from puny infants, and groves, springing up unexpectedly, might dart forth from the earth, of which things it is plain that none happen, since all things grow gradually, as is fitting, from unvarying atoms, and as they grow, preserve their kind, so that you may understand that all things individually are enlarged and nourished from their own specific matter. Add to this, that the earth cannot furnish her cheering fruits without certain rains in the year. Nor, moreover, can the nature of animals, if kept from food, propagate their kind and sustain life. So that you may rather deem that many elements are common to many things, as we see letters common to many words, than that anything can exist without its proper elements. Still further, why could not nature produce men of such a size that they might ford the sea on foot, and ran great mountains with their hands, and outlast in existence many ages of human life, if it be not because certain matter has been assigned for producing certain things, from which matter it is fixed what can or cannot arise. It must be admitted, therefore, that nothing can be made from nothing, since things have need of seed, from which all individually being produced may be brought forth into the gentle air of heaven. Lastly, since we observe that cultivated places excel the uncultivated, and yield to our hands better fruits, we may see that there are in the ground the primitive elements of things, which we, in turning the fertile glebe with the plowshare, and subjugating the soil of the earth, force into birth. But were there no such seeds, you might see things severally grow up and become much better of their own accord, without our labor. Add, too, that nature resolves each thing into its own constituent elements, 
and does not reduce anything to nothing. For if anything were perishable in all its parts, everything might then dissolve, being snatched suddenly from before our eyes, for there would be no need of force to produce a separation of its parts and break their connection. Whereas now, since all things individually consist of eternal seed, nature does not suffer the destruction of anything to be seen, until such power assail them as to severe them with a blow, or penetrate inwardly through the vacant spaces and dissolve the parts. Besides, if time utterly destroys whatever things it removes through length of age, consuming all their constituent matter, whence does Venus restore to the light of life the race of animals according to their kinds? Whence does the variegated earth nourish and develops them when restored, affording them sustenance according to their kinds? Whence do pure fountains and eternal rivers flowing from afar supply the sea? When does the ether feed the stars? For infinite time already past and length of days ought to have consumed all things which are of mortal consistence. But if those elements of which this sum of things consists and is renewed have existed through that long space and that past duration of time, they are assuredly endowed with an immortal nature. Things, therefore, cannot return to nothing. Further, the same force and cause might destroy all things indiscriminately, unless an eternal matter held them more or less bound by mutual connection. For a mere touch, indeed, would be a sufficient cause of destruction, supposing that there were no parts of eternal consistence, but all perishable, the union of which any force might dissolve. But now, because various connections of elements unite together, and matter is eternal, things continue of unimpaired consistence, until some force of sufficient strength be found to assail them, proportioned to the texture of each. No thing, therefore, relapses into non-existence, but all things at dissolution return to the first principles of matter. Lastly, you may say, perhaps, the showers of rain perish when Father Ether has poured them down into the lap of Mother Earth. But it is not so. For hence the smiling fruits arise, and the branches become verdant on the trees. The trees themselves increase and are weighed down with produce. Hence, moreover, is nourished the race of men and that of beasts. Hence we see joyous cities abound with youth, and the leafy woods resound on every side with newly-fledged birds. Hence the weary cattle, sleek in the rich pastures, repose their bodies, and the white milky liquor flows from their distended udders. Hence the new offspring gambles sportive with tottering limbs over the tender grass, their youthful hearts exhilarated with pure milk. Things, therefore, do not utterly perish, which seem to do so, since nature recruits one thing from another, nor suffers anything to be produced unless its production be furthered by the death of another. Attend now further. Since I have shown that things cannot be produced from nothing, and also that, when produced, they cannot return to nothing, yet, lest haply thou shouldst begin to distrust my words, because the primary particles of things cannot be discerned by the eye, here, in addition, what substances thou thyself must necessarily confess to exist, although impossible to be seen. In the first place, the force of the wind, when excited, lashes the sea, agitates the tall ships, and scatters the clouds. At times, sweeping over the earth with an impetuous hurricane, it strews the plains with huge trees, and harasses the mountain tops with forest-rending blasts. So violently does the deep chaff with fierce roar and rage with menacing murmur. The winds, then, are invisible bodies, which sweep the sea, the land, the clouds of heaven, and agitating them, carry them along with a sudden tornado. Not otherwise do they rush forth and spread destruction than as when a body of liquid water is borne along in an overwhelming stream, which a vast torrent from the lofty mountains swell with large rain-floods, 
dashing together fragments of woods and entire groves. Nor can the strong bridges sustain the sudden force of the sweeping water. With such overwhelming violence does the river, turbid with copious rain, rush against the opposing mounds. It scatters ruin with a mighty uproar, and rolls huge rocks under its waters. It rushes on, triumphant, wheresoever anything opposes its waves. Thus, therefore, must the blasts of the wind also be borne along, which, when, like a mighty flood, they have bent their force in any direction, drive all things before them, and overthrow them with repeated assaults, and sometimes catch them up in a writhing vortex, and rapidly bear them off in a whirling hurricane. Wherefore, I repeat, the winds are substances, though invisible, since in their effects and modes of operation they are found to rival mighty rivers, which are of manifest bodily substance. Moreover, we perceive various odors of objects, and yet never see them approaching our nostrils. Nor do we behold violent heat, or distinguish cold with our eyes. Nor are we in the habit of viewing sounds, all which things, however, must of necessity consist of a corporeal nature, since they have the power of striking the senses, for nothing except bodily substance can touch or be touched. Further, garments when suspended upon a shore on which waves are broken grow moist. The same, when spread out in the sun, become dry. Yet neither has it been observed how the moisture of the water settled in them, nor, on the other hand, how it escaped under the influence of the heat. The moisture, therefore, is dispersed into minute particles which our eyes can by no means perceive. Besides, in the course of many revolutions of the sun, a ring upon the finger is made somewhat thinner by wearing it. The fall of the drop from the eaves hollows a stone. The crooked share of the plough, though made of iron, imperceptibly decreases in the fields. Even the stone pavements of the streets we see worn by the feet of the multitude, and the brazen statues, which stand near the gates, show their right hands made smaller by the touch of people frequently saluting them and passing by. These objects, therefore, after they have been worn, we observe to become diminished. But what particles take their departure on each particular occasion, jealous nature has withheld from us the faculty of seeing. Lastly, whatever substances time and nature add little by little to objects, obliging them to increase gradually, those substances no acuteness of vision, however earnestly exerted, can perceive. Nor, moreover, whatever substances waste away through age and decay, nor can you discern what the rocks, which overhang the sea and are eaten by the corroding salt of the ocean, lose every time that they are washed by the waves. Nature, therefore, carries on her operations by imperceptible particles. Nor, however, are all things held enclosed by corporeal substance, for there is a void in things, a truth which it will be useful for you, in reference to many points, to know, and which will prevent you from wandering in doubt and from perpetually inquiring about the entire of things, and from being distrustful of my words. Wherefore, I say, there is space, intangible, empty, and vacant. If this were not the case, things could by no means be moved. For that which is the quality of body, namely, to obstruct and to oppose, would be present at all times, and would be exerted against all bodies. Nothing, therefore, would be able to move forward, since nothing would begin to give way. But now, throughout the sea and land and heights of heaven, we see many things moved before our eyes, in various ways, and by various means, which, if there were no void, would not so much want their active motion, as being deprived of it, as they would, properly speaking, never by any means have been produced at all since matter, crowded together on all sides, would have remained at rest, and have been unable to act. Besides, although some things may be regarded as solid, 
yet you may, for the following reasons, perceive them to be of a porous consistence. In rocks and caves, the liquid moisture of the waters penetrates their substance, and all parts weep, as it were, with abundant draughts. Food distributes itself through the whole of the body in animals. The groves increase and yield their fruits in their season, because nourishment is diffused through the whole of the trees, even from the lowest roots over all the trunks and branches. Voices pass through the walls and fly across the closed apartments of houses. Keen frost penetrates to the very marrow of our bones, which kind of effects, unless there were void spaces and bodies, where the several particles might pass, you would never by any means observe to take place. Lastly, why do we see some things exceed other things in weight, though of no greater shape and bulk? For, if there is just as much substance in a ball of wool as there is in a ball of lead, it is natural that they should weigh the same, since it is the property of all bodily substance to press everything downwards. But the nature of a void, on the contrary, continues without weight. That body, therefore, which is equally large with another, and is evidently lighter, shows plainly that it contains a greater portion of vacuity. But the heavier body, on the other hand, indicates that there is in it more material substance, and that it comprises much less empty space. That, therefore, which we are now, by the aid of searching argument, investigating, that, namely, which we call void, is doubtless mixed among material substances. In considering these matters, I am obliged to anticipate that objection which some imagine, lest it should seduce you from the truth. They say, for instance, that water yields to fishes pushing forwards, and opens liquid passages, since the fish leave spaces behind them, into which the yielding waters may make a conflux. So also that other things may be moved among themselves, and change their place, although all parts of space be full. But this notion, it is evident, has been wholly conceived from false reasoning. For in what direction, I pray, will fish be able to go forward, if the water shall not give them room? Or, in what direction, moreover, will the water have power to yield, supposing the fish shall have no power to go forward, to divide it? Either, therefore, we must deny motion to all bodies whatsoever, or we must admit that vacuity is more or less inherent in all material substances, whence everything that moves derives the first commencement of its motion. Lastly, if two broad and flat bodies, after having come into collision, suddenly start asunder, it is clear that air must necessarily take possession of all the vacuum which is then formed between the bodies. And further, although that air may quickly unite to flow into the vacancy, with blasts blowing rapidly from all sides, yet the whole space will not be able to be filled at once, for the air must of necessity occupy some part first, then another, till in succession all parts be occupied. But if any person perchance, when the bodies have started asunder, thinks that that separation is thus effected by reason that the air condenses itself, he is in error, for a vacuum is then formed between the bodies, which was not there before, and the part likewise behind the bodies, which was vacant before, is filled. Nor can air be condensed in such a way, nor even if it could, would it have the power, I think, to draw itself into itself, and unite its particles together, without the aid of a void. For which reason, although you may long hesitate, alleging many objections, you must, nevertheless, at last, confess that there is vacuum in bodies. I have the ability, moreover, to collect credit for my doctrines by adducing many additional arguments. But these small traces which I have indicated will be sufficient for a sagacious mind traces by which, indeed, you yourself may discover others. For as dogs, when they have once lighted upon certain tracks on the path, very frequently find by their scent 
the lair of a wild beast that ranges over the mountains, though covered over with leaves, so you yourself will be able, in such matters as these, to note, of your own sagacity, one principle after another, and to penetrate every dark obscurity, and thence to elicit truth. But if you shall be slow to ascend, O Memmius, or if you shall at all shrink back from the subject, I can still certainly give you the following assurance. My tongue, so agreeable to you, will have the power of pouring forth from my well-stored breast such copious draughts from mighty sources, that I fear lest slow old age may creep over our limbs and break down the gates of life within us, before all the abundance of arguments in my verses concerning any one subject can have been poured into your ears. But now, that I may resume my efforts to complete in verse the weaving of the web which I have begun, give me a little more of your attention. As it is, therefore, all nature of itself has consisted and consists of two parts, for there are bodily substances and vacant space, in which these substances are situated, and in which they are moved in different directions. For the common perception of all men shows that there is corporeal consistence, of the existence of which, unless the belief shall be first firmly established, there will be no principle by reference to which we may succeed, by any means whatever, in settling the mind with argument concerning matters not obvious to sense. To proceed, then, if there were no place and no space which we call vacant, bodies could not be situated anywhere, nor could at all move any whither in different directions, a fact which we have shown to you a little before. Besides, there is nothing which you can say is separate from all bodily substance, and distinct from empty space, which would, indeed, be as it were a third kind of nature. For whatsoever shall exist must in itself be something, either of large bulk, or ever so diminutive, provided it be at all, when, if it shall be sensible to the touch, however light and delicate, it will increase the number of bodies, and be ranked in the multitude of them. But if it shall be intangible, inasmuch as it cannot hinder in any part any object proceeding to pass through it, it then, you may be sure, will be the empty space which we call a vacuum. Moreover, whatsoever shall exist of itself will either do something, or will be obliged to suffer other things acting upon it, or will simply be, so that other things may exist and be done in it. But nothing can do or suffer without being possessed of bodily substance, nor, moreover, afford place for acting and suffering unless it be empty and vacant space. No third nature, therefore, distinct in itself, besides vacant space and material substance, can possibly be left undiscovered in the sum of things. No third kind of being, which can at any time fall under the notice of our senses, or which any one can find out by the exercise of his reason. For whatsoever other things are said to be, you will find them to be either necessary adjuncts of these two things, or accidents of them. A necessary adjunct is that which can never be separated and disjoined from its body without a disunion attended with destruction to that body, as the weight of a stone, the heat of fire, the fluidity of water, sensibility to touch in all bodies, insensibility to touch in empty space. On the other hand, such things as slavery, poverty, riches, liberty, war, conquered, and other things, by the coming or going of which the nature of the subject affected remains uninjured, these we are accustomed, as is proper, to call accidents. End of section 1on the nature of things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. 
On the Nature of Things by Lucretius, translated by John Selby Watson, Section 2, Book 1, Part 2. Time, likewise, is not an existence in itself, but it is merely our understanding that collects from things themselves what has been done in the past age, what also is present, what, moreover, may follow afterwards. And it must be owned that no one has conceived of time existing by itself apart from progressive motion and quiet rest. Moreover, when writers say that Helen was carried off, and that the Trojan people were subdued in war, we must take care lest perchance those writers induce us to admit that those events, that is, the abduction of Helen and the subjugation of the Trojans, were of themselves, when time, irrevocably passed, has carried away those generations of men of whom these transactions were the events or accidents. For whatever shall have been done, will properly be called an event or accident, whether occurring to lands or to legions, that is, men themselves. Furthermore, if there were not this bodily substance in things, nor this room and space in which all things severally are done, the flame lighted up by the love of Helen's beauty, spreading through the breast of the Frisian Paris, would never have kindled the famous contests of cruel warfare nor would the wooden horse have secretly set fire to the citadel of the Trojans by a nocturnal delivery of Greeks. So that you may plainly see that all transactions whatsoever do not consist or exist of themselves, as body does, nor are spoken of as existent in the same way as a vacuum exists, but rather that you may justly call them events or accidents of body or of space in which all transactions are brought to pass. Bodies, besides, are partly original elements of things, and partly those which are formed of a combination of those elements. But those which are elements of things no force can break, for they successfully resist all force by solidity of substance, although, perhaps, it seems difficult to believe that anything of so solid a substance can be found in nature. For the lightning of heaven passes through the walls of houses, as also noise and voices pass. Iron glows, being penetrated by heat in the fire. Rocks often burst with fervent heat. The hardness of gold, losing its firmness, is dissolved by heat. The icy coldness of brass, overcome by flame, melts. Heat and penetrable cold enter into the substance of silver, for we have felt both with the hand, when, as we held silver cups after our fashion, water was poured into them from above, so that, as far as these instances go, there seems to be nothing solid in nature. But, because, however, right reason and the nature of things compel me to hold a contrary opinion, grant me your attention a while, until I make it plain, in a few verses, that there really exist such bodies as are of a solid and eternal corporeal substance, which bodies we prove to be seeds and primary particles of things, of which the whole generated universe now consists. In the first place, since a twofold nature of things, a twofold nature, or rather two natures extremely dissimilar, has been found to exist, namely, matter and space in which everything is done, it must necessarily be that each exists by itself, for itself, independently of the other, and pure from admixture. For, wheresoever there is empty space, which we call a vacuum, there there is no matter, and, likewise, wheresoever matter maintains itself, there by no means exists empty space. Original substances are therefore solid, and without vacuity. Furthermore, since in things which are produced or compounded of matter there is found empty space, solid matter must exist around it, nor can anything be proved by just argument to conceal vacuity and to contain it within its body, unless you admit that that which contains it is a solid. But that solid can be nothing but a combination of matter, 
such as may have the power of keeping a vacuity enclosed. That matter, therefore, which consists of solid body, may be eternal, while other substances, which are only compounds of this matter, may be dissolved. In addition, too, if there were no space to be vacant and unoccupied, all space would be solid. On the other hand, unless there were certain bodies to fill up completely the places which they occupy, all space, which anywhere exists, would be an empty void. Body, therefore, is evidently distinct from empty space, though each has its place alternately. Since all space neither exists entirely full, nor, again, entirely empty. There exist, therefore, certain bodies which can completely fill the places which they occupy, and distinguish empty space from full. These bodies, which thus completely fill space, can neither be broken in pieces by being struck with blows externally, nor, again, can be decomposed by being penetrated internally nor can they be made to yield, if attempted by any other method, a principle which we have demonstrated to you a little above. For neither does it seem possible for anything to be dashed in pieces without a vacuum, nor to be broken, nor to be divided into two by cutting, nor to admit moisture, nor, moreover, subtle cold, nor penetrating fire, by which operations and means all things compounded are dissolved. And the more anything contains empty space within it, the more it yields when thoroughly tried by these means. If, therefore, the primary atoms are solid and without void, they must, of necessity, be eternal. Again, unless there had been eternal matter, all things, before this time, would have been utterly reduced to nothing, and whatsoever objects we behold would have been reproduced from nothing. But since I have shown above that nothing can be produced from nothing, and that that which has been produced cannot be resolved into nothing, the primary elements must be of an imperishable substance, into which primary elements every body may be dissolved, so that matter may be supplied for the reproduction of things. The primordial elements, therefore, are of pure solidity, nor could they otherwise preserved as they have been for ages, repair things, as they have done, through that infinite space of time which has elapsed since the commencement of this material system. Besides, if nature had set no limit to the destruction of things, the particles of matter would, by this time, have been so reduced, by reason of every former age wasting them, that no body compounded of them could, from any certain time, however remote, reach full maturity of existence. For we see that anything may be sooner taken to pieces than put together again, for which reason that which the infinitely long duration of all past time had broken into parts, disturbing and dissevering it, could never be repaired in time to come. But now, as is evident, there remains appointed a certain limit to destruction, since we see everything recruited, and stated portions of time assigned to everything according to its kind, in which it may be able to attain full vigor of age. To this is added that, though the primary particles of matter are perfectly solid, yet that all things which are formed of them may be rendered soft and yielding, as air, water, earth, fire, in whatever way they may be produced and by whatever influence they may be directed. But this happens, because there is vacant space intermingled with the substance of things compounded. But, on the other hand, if the primordial elements of things were soft, how strong flints and iron could be produced? No explanation could be given, for, by this supposition, nature will be deprived of all possibility of commencing a foundation. The primordial elements, therefore, are endowed with pure solidity by the dense combination of which all compound bodies may be closely compacted and exhibit powerful strength. Moreover, if you still persist to say that no limit has been appointed to the dissolution of bodies, you will then, however, have to allow 
that there must remain certain dissolvable bodies in the world which have not yet been assailed with any trial of their strength. But since dissolvable bodies are endued only with a fragile nature, it is inconsistent to suppose that they could have lasted through an infinite course of time if they had been harassed age after age with innumerable assaults. Further, since also a limit has been assigned for the growth of things according to their kinds and for their support of life, and since it is established by the laws of nature what each kind can or cannot do, and since nothing is changed, but all things remain constant to such a degree that even the birds of different plumage, all in succession, show, existing upon their bodies, spots distinctive of their species, we must grant that such bodies must have in them an immutable material substance. For, if the primitive particles of things could be changed by being successfully wrought upon in any way, it would then also become uncertain what might or might not arise into being. It would be uncertain, moreover, how far limited power and a firmly fixed boundary is set to each kind, nor, with such a possibility of alteration, would the tribes of animals, according to their kinds, be so constantly able to reproduce the nature, motions, mode of life, and habits of their progenitors. Again, since even of such a body as our senses cannot perceive, there is yet a certain extreme point, whatever it be, that point certainly exists without parts, and consists of the least possible natural substance. Nor has it ever existed of itself, apart from its body, nor will it hereafter be able so to exist, since it is itself the first and last part of another body, after which other and other like parts in succession fill up, in a condensed mass, the substance of the body, which parts, since they cannot consist by themselves, must of necessity adhere to something else, from which they can by no means be detached. Primordial atoms are, therefore, of pure solidity, which, composed of the smallest points, closely cohere, not combined of a union of any other things, but rather endowed with an eternal, simple, and indissoluble existence, from which nature allows nothing to be broken off, or even diminished, reserving these primordial atoms as seeds for her productions. Moreover, unless there shall be some least, some point where division ends, the smallest bodies will individually consist of infinite parts, as, in that case, any part of the half of any body will always have its own half, nor will anything set a limit to this division. What, therefore, will be the difference in their nature between the greatest and smallest of bodies? It will not be possible that there should be any difference, for, though the whole entire sum of things, or the universe, be infinite, yet the smallest things which exist in it will equally consist of infinite parts. To which position, since just reasoning is opposed, and denies that the mind can admit it, you must be prevailed upon to acknowledge that there are bodies which exist having no parts, and consist of the least possible substance, and since they are so, since they are indivisible and undiminishable, you must also concede that they are solid and eternal. Further, unless nature, the producer of things, had been accustomed to force all things to be resolved into minutest parts, the same nature would now be unable to recruit anything from those parts, because those generated bodies which are augmented and repaired by no parts cannot have and retain unimpaired those affections which generative matter ought to have, namely, various connections, weights, concussions, combinations, movements, by which things are severally brought to pass. For which reason, those who think that fire is the original principle of things, and that the universe is maintained from fire alone, seem to have greatly erred from true reason, of which philosophers Heraclitus, as leader, first comes to the battle, a writer celebrated for the obscurity of his language, though rather among the vain and empty than among the sensible Greeks who seek for truth. 
for fools rather admire and delight in all things which they see hid under inversions and intricacies of words, and consider those assertions to be truths which have power to touch the ear agreeably, and which are disguised with pleasantness of sound. For how, I ask, could things be so various, if they were produced from fire alone and pure from mixture? Since it would be to no purpose that hot fire should be condensed or rarefied, if the parts of fire retain the same nature which the whole of fire still has. For, though there might be a fiercer heat in the condensed parts, and a more languid warmth in the separated and dispersed, there is nothing more than this which you can conceive possible to be effected in or by such causes. Much less can so vast a variety of things originate from dense and rare fire. For, though there might be a fiercer heat in the condensed parts, and a more languid warmth in the separated and dispersed, there is nothing more than this which you can conceive possible to be effected in or by such causes. Much less can so vast a variety of things originate from dense and rare fire. And this also is to be borne in mind, that if they admit vacuity to be mixed with things, fire will then have the capability to be condensed, or left rarefied. But because they see that, in this admission of vacuity, there are many things adverse to them and their doctrines, and therefore shrink from admitting a pure vacuum to exist among substances, they thus, while they fear difficulties, lose the true path, nor observe that, on the other hand, all vacuity being removed from substances, all things would be condensed, and one body would be formed from all, which body could eject nothing from itself, as glowing fire emits light and heat, in such a manner that you may see it does not consist of condensed parts. But if they think that fire may by any means be extinguished in close condensation, and change its natural consistence, and if, indeed, they shall not hesitate to allow that this may take place absolutely, then all heat, it is evident, will fall utterly to nothing, and whatever things are reproduced, supposing all to have been produced from fire, will be made out of nothing. For whatever being changed departs from its own limits, this change in it is straightway the death or termination of that which it was before. Something, therefore, supposing we admit their doctrine, must necessarily remain unchanged in that fire of theirs, that all things, as you may see, may not utterly fall to nothing, and that the multitude of objects in the universe may not have to flourish by being reproduced from nothing. And now, therefore, since there are certain most constant elements which always retain the same nature, by the departure and accession of which, and by their change of order, things alter their nature, and compound bodies convert themselves into a different consistence, it is easy to understand that these elements of things are not fiery. For it would be to no purpose that some of these elements should detach themselves and depart from one place, and be assigned to another, and that some should have their order changed, if they all still retain the nature of fire. For whatever fire might produce would be, in all forms, only fire. But, as I am of opinion, the truth stands thus. There are certain elementary bodies, whose combinations, movements, order, position, shapes, produce fire, and which, when their order is changed, change their nature as a compound. Nor, as I think, are they in themselves like to fire, or to any other thing, which has the power of emitting particles to our senses, and affecting our touch by its application. To say, moreover, that all things are fire, and that no real substance exists in the whole number of things but fire, an assertion which this philosopher makes, seems to be in the highest degree absurd, since he himself, while arguing from his senses, combats against his senses, and shakes the credit of those perceptions on which all things that we believe depend, and by the aid of which that which he names fire is known to him. For he believes that his senses distinguish fire accurately. Other things, which are not at all less clear, he does not believe that they can distinguish, an inconsistency which seems to me both folly and madness. For to what shall we refer for information? 
what can be a more certain criterion to us than the senses themselves? How, if we cease to trust them, can we distinguish what is true and what is false? Besides, why should any one rather set aside all other things and desire to admit the substance of fire as the only substance than deny that fire exists and still allow existence to all other substances? For to advance either assertion seems equal madness. Wherefore, those who have thought that fire is the primary matter of things and that the whole universe may originate from fire and those who have determined that air is the first principle for the production of things, those who have imagined that water can itself form things of itself, and those who have supposed that the earth produces all things and is changed into all substances of things, appear all to have wandered extremely far from the truth. To these add also those philosophers who couple the elements of things, uniting air with fire and earth with water, and who think that from these four things, namely, from fire, earth, and air, and moisture, all bodies may proceed. Among the chief of whom is Empedocles of Agrigentum, whom, within the triangular coasts of its land, that island produced around which the Ionian deep, flowing with vast windings, sprinkles on its salt from its blue waves, and the sea, rolling rapidly in a narrow channel, divides with its waves the shores of the lands of Aeolia from the boundaries of it. Here is the vast Charybdis, and here the murmurs of Etna threaten, indicating that the mountain is again gathering its wrathful flames, that its violence may vomit forth afresh the fires bursting from its jaws, and once more hurl to the sky its blazing lightnings, which great region, though it seems worthy of admiration to the human race on many accounts, and is extolled as deserving of being visited, being rich in valuable productions, and defended with a mighty force of inhabitants, yet appears to have contained in it nothing more excellent than this man, nor anything more sacred and wonderful and estimable. The verses, moreover, which proceeded from his divine intellect, proclaim and expound his noble discovery so eloquently that he scarcely seems to have been sprung from a human origin. He, however, and those whom I mentioned above, men distinguishably below him by many degrees and far inferior to him, although finding out many things excellently and divinely, they gave oracles, as it were, from the inmost temple of their heart, more sacredly and with much more true reason than the Pythia who speaks from the tripod and laurel of Phoebus, yet stumbled in attempting to expound the principles of things, and, great as they were, fell there with a heavy downfall. In the first place they erred, because they settled that motion may take place, though all vacuum be excluded from matter, and because they admit that there exist soft and subtle bodies, air, sun, fire, earth, animals, vegetable productions, and yet mingle no vacuity in their composition. Secondly, they erred, because they asserted that there is no limit at all to the division of material particles, and that no bound is set to their fracture, nor do they at all allow that any least exists in bodies, although we see that there is that least, namely, the extreme point of every body which seems to be least to our senses, so that you may hence conclude that there exists in bodies a least possible quantity which you yourself cannot perceive, but which nevertheless they have as an extreme. To this is also added that they make the elements of things to be soft bodies, which soft bodies we see to be generated and altogether of a perishable consistence. But if the elements of things were soft and perishable, the whole universe must fall back to nothing, and the abundance of things flourish by being reproduced from nothing. But how far each of these suppositions is distant from the truth? you have already had proof. Besides, these four elements are in many ways hostile and destructive to one another, for which reason, on coming together, they will either be naturally destroyed, or will start away from one another, as we see when a tempest has arisen, the lightnings and rains and winds not congregating together, but scattering themselves abroad. Moreover, if all things are produced from those four bodies, and all things are again dissolved into those bodies, 
how can those four be more justly called the primary elements of things than, on the other hand, things may be called the primary elements of them, and a backward computation, as it were, be made? For, according to this hypothesis, they are produced alternately, and change their appearance and their whole substance among themselves, perpetually. But if perchance you imagine that the substances of fire and earth, and ethereal air, and the liquid of water, meet together in such a way, that by their combination they make no change in their nature, nothing will be produced for you from them, neither animated creature, nor anything of inanimate substance as a tree. For each element in the conflux of the varying heat will exhibit only its own nature, and air will be seen to remain mixed together with earth and with some portion of liquid. But primary elements, for the production of things, must exercise a latent and unapparent influence, lest any element arise above the rest, which may resist their action, and prevent whatsoever is being formed from being able to attain its proper character. These philosophers, moreover, take a beginning from heaven and its fires, and make fire first to change itself into the air of the sky. From air they say that water is produced, and that earth is generated from water. And then they say again that all things return back from earth, first water, afterwards air, then heat, and that these elements do not cease to interchange, and to pass from heaven to earth, and from earth to the stars of heaven, which primary elements ought by no means to do. For it is necessary that there should remain something unchangeable, lest all things should be reduced utterly to nothing. Since whatsoever, being changed, goes beyond its own limits, this change becomes forthwith the death or termination of that which it was before. Wherefore, since these four bodies which we have previously mentioned pass into change, they must necessarily consist of other elements which cannot be changed in any way, lest all things should return, as you may suppose, utterly to nothing. But you may rather conclude that certain bodies exist, endowed with such a nature that, if perchance they have generated fire, the same bodies may, a few particles being taken away, and a few being added, and their order and motion being changed, produce the air of heaven, and that, in like manner, all other bodies may be changed into other bodies. But manifest fact, you perhaps observe, evidently shows that all things grow, and are nourished upwards, from the earth into the air of heaven, and, unless the season is indulgent with favorable weather, unless the groves are shaken with rains and with the moisture of showers, and, you will add, unless the sun, for his part, cherishes the productions of nature and affords heat, corn, trees, and animals would not be able to grow. Doubtless, and unless solid food and soft liquid were to sustain ourselves, our bodies, for want of them, being quickly exhausted, all life also would waste away from our nerves and bones. For we are, without all question, supported and nourished by certain substances, and other and other things are nourished by certain substances, because, as is evident, many common elements of many things are mixed in many bodies in many ways. Therefore, various things are sustained by various things, and it is often of great consequence with what other elements and in what position these same elements are combined, and what motions they reciprocally cause and suffer. For the same elements constitute the heaven, the sea, the earth, the rivers, the sun. The same elements constitute corn, woods, animals. But they are actuated and made effective by being mixed with other different elements and in different ways. Besides, even in my own verses you see everywhere many elements common to many words, although you must nevertheless allow that the verses and words differ one from another both in sense and sound. So much can elements effect, even if their order only be changed. But those elements which are the principles of things, being more numerous, can attract to themselves more, and form more combinations, from which all the various things in the universe may severally be produced. End of section 2 Section 3 of On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 3. Book 1. Part 3. And now, let us also examine the homoeomeria of Anaxagoras, as the Greeks call it. Nor does the poverty of our native tongue, indeed, allow us to name it in our own language. But it is easy, however, to explain in words the thing itself, which, as the origin of things, he calls homoeomeria. He thinks, that is to say, that bones are produced from small and minute bones, so likewise that flesh is generated from small and minute particles of flesh, and that blood is formed from many drops of blood meeting together. He is of opinion, moreover, that gold may consist of crumbs of gold, and that earth may be a concrete of little earths, that fire may be from fires, and moisture from moistures. Other things he imagines and supposes to be produced in a similar way. Yet he does not allow that there is anywhere a void in things, or that there is any limit to the division of bodies. Wherefore, in both these respects he seems to me to err equally with those of whom we have before spoken. Add to this that he supposes principles which are too frail, if indeed they are principles which are made to be endowed with like nature as the things themselves that are produced from them, and equally suffer and decay, nor does anything withhold them from destruction. For what portion of them will endure under violent oppression so as to escape the solution under the very teeth of death? Will it be fire, or moisture, or air? Which of these? Or will it be blood or bone? Not one of all those substances, as I conceive, since everything universally will be equally perishable as those things which we see manifestly perish from before our eyes when overcome by any violence. But I call to witness the positions which I have before proved, that neither can things be reduced to nothing, nor again grow up from nothing. Moreover, since food augments and nourishes the body, we may understand that veins and blood and bones and nerves consist of heterogeneous parts. Or, if these philosophers shall say that all food is of a mixed substance, and contains in itself small elements of nerves and bones, and also veins and particles of blood, it will follow that both all solid food and liquid itself must be thought to consist of such heterogeneous matters, and to be mixed up of bones and nerves and veins and blood. Besides, if whatever bodies grow from the earth are previously latent in the earth, Earth must consist of all those heterogeneous matters which spring from earth. Transfer this reasoning to other objects, and you may likewise use the same phraseology. In wood, for instance, if there is concealed flame and smoke and ashes, wood must necessarily consist of the heterogeneous particles of those substances. Here, some slight opportunity is left to this sect of philosophers for eluding the arguments of their adversaries, an opportunity of which Anaxagoras avails himself, by alleging that, although he thinks all things lie secretly mixed with all things, yet that that alone appears on the surface of each, of which there are most particles mixed in the composition of each, and placed more, as it were, in readiness than in front, which, however, is far removed from just reasoning. For, if this hypothesis were correct, it might naturally be expected also that corn, when it is broken by the overwhelming force of the millstone, would exhibit some token of blood or something of those substances which are nourished in our bodies, that when we rub stone against stone, blood should flow. In like manner, also, it would be probable that herbs would send forth drops of a sweet liquid, and of similar taste, such as are the drops of milk, that issue from the udder of the sheep. And, without doubt, we might also suppose that frequently, when clods of earth are broken, rudiments of the several kinds of herbs and corn and leaves of trees would appear, scattered about, and be proved to lie hid in the earth in minute particles. Moreover, that in wood, when it is broken, ashes and smoke and small particles of fire would be found to lie concealed. Of which occurrences, since manifest experience shows that none take place, we may understand that substances are not so mixed with substances. But, 
If Anaxagoras were right, the common seeds of many things must lie secretly mixed, in many ways, among other things. But, you will say, it often happens that, on the high mountains, the extreme tops of tall trees, when near to one another, are rubbed together, the strong south winds compelling them to act thus, until they shine with a flash of flame bursting forth. It is so. And yet the fire is not inherent in the wood, but there are in it many seeds of heat, which, when they have become confluent by friction, produce a conflagration in the woods. But if positive flame were hidden in the woods, the fire could not be concealed for any length of time, but would openly consume the forests and burn up the groves. Do you now see, therefore, what we remarked a little before, that it is frequently of great consequence with what other elements, and in what position the same elements are combined, and what motions they reciprocally impart and receive? And that the same elements, a little altered, in respect to each other, produce fire from wood, ignis e lignis, just as also the words themselves consist of elements or letters, a little changed, when we denote wood and fire, ligna atque ignis, by distinct appellations. Finally, if you think that whatever things you see in the visible world could not be conceived to have been formed without supposing the primary particles of matter to be endowed with a nature similar to the things formed from them, your original elements of things, by this hypothesis, become mere absurdities and fall to the ground. For the consequence of such a supposition will be that you must have primary particles which, as the origin of laughter, are themselves convulsed with tremulous fits of laughter, and others which, as the originals of weeping, bedew their own faces and cheeks with salt tears. And now give me your attention as to what remains. Learn and hear more fully and plainly. Nor does it escape my knowledge how obscure these matters are, but the great hope of praise has struck my heart with her powerful thyrsus, and has at the same time infused into my breast a pleasing love of the muses, with which, inspired, I now wander in vigorous thought over the trackless regions of the Pierides, trodden before by the foot of no poet. It delights me to approach the untasted fountains and to drink, and it transports me to pluck the fresh flowers and to obtain a distinguished chaplet for my head from those groves whence the muses have hitherto veiled the temples of no one. In the first place, because I give instruction concerning mighty subjects, and proceed to free the mind from the closely confining shackles of religion. In the next place, because I compose such lucid verses concerning so obscure a subject, touching everything with the grace of poetry. Since such ornament also seems not unjustifiable or without reason. But, as physicians, when they attempt to give bitter wormwood to children, first tinge the rim round the cup with the sweet and yellow liquid of honey, that the age of childhood, as yet unsuspicious, may find its lips deluded, and may, in the meantime, drink up the bitter juice of the wormwood, and, though deceived, may not be injured, but rather, recruited by such a process, may acquire strength. So now I, since this argument seems generally too severe and forbidding to those by whom it has not been handled, and since the multitude shrink back from it, was desirous to set forth my chain of reasoning to thee, O Memmius, in sweetly speaking Pierian verse, and, as it were, to tinge it with the honey of the muses, if, perchance, by such a method, I might detain thy attention upon my strains, until thou lookest through the whole nature of things, and understandest with what shape and beauty it is adorned. But since I have taught that atoms of matter entirely solid, pass to and fro perpetually, unwasted through all time, come now, and let us unravel whether there be any limit to their aggregate or not. Also, let us look into that which has been found to be vacancy, or the room and space in which things severally are done, and learn whether the whole is entirely limited, or extends unbounded and unfathomably profound. All that exists, therefore, I affirm, is bounded in no direction, for, if it were bounded, it must have some extremity. But it appears that there cannot be an extremity of anything, unless there be something beyond, 
which may limit it, so that there may appear to be some line farther than which this faculty of our sense cannot extend. Now, since it must be confessed that there is nothing beyond the whole, the whole has no extremity, nor does it matter at what part of it you stand, with a view to being distant from its boundary, inasmuch as whatever place any one occupies, he leaves the whole just as much boundless in every direction. Besides, if all space which is, be supposed to be bounded, and if any one should go forward as far as possible, even to what he thinks its extreme limits, and should throw, or attempt to throw, a flying dart, whether would you have that dart hurled with vigorous strength, go on in the direction in which it may have been propelled, and fly far forwards, or do you rather prefer to think that something would have power to hinder and stop it? For one of the two alternatives you must of necessity admit and adopt, of which alternatives either cuts off escape from you, and compels you to grant that the whole extends without limit. Since, whether there is anything to stop the javelin, and to cause that it may not go on in the direction in which it was aimed, and fix itself at the destined termination of its flight, or whether it is borne onwards beyond the supposed limit, it evidently did not begin its flight from a boundary of the whole. In this manner I will go on with you, and wheresoever you shall fix the extreme margin of space, I will ask you what then would be the case with the javelin. The case will be that a limit can nowhere exist, and that room for the flight of the javelin will still extend its flight. Further, if all the space of the entire whole were shut in and bounded on all sides by certain limits, the quantity of matter in the universe would before this time have flowed together to the bottom, by reason of its solid weight. Nor could anything be carried on beneath the canopy of heaven, nor indeed would there be a heaven at all, or light of the sun. For all matter, from sinking down for an infinite space of time, would be accumulated at the bottom of the whole. But now it is evident no rest is given to the atoms of the primary elements, because no part of the universe is completely and fundamentally lowest, whether the atoms might, as it were, flow together, and where they might fix their seat. And therefore all things are always carried on in all parts in perpetual motion, and the lowest atoms of matter, or those which we may conceive to be the lowest, stirred up from the infinite of space, are supplied for the generation of things. Moreover, in things before our eyes, object seems to bound object. The air sets a boundary to the hills, and the hills to the air. The land limits the sea, and the sea, on the other hand, limits the entire land. But, as to the whole, there is nothing beyond it that can bound it. The nature, therefore, of space in the extent of the profound whole, is such a vast, which neither famous rivers in their course can run through, though flowing for an eternal length of time, nor, by passing on, can at all cause that less distance should remain for them to go. To such a degree, on every side, vast abundance of room lies open for all things, all limit being set aside everywhere and in every direction. Besides, Nature herself prevents the whole of things from being able to provide bounds for itself, inasmuch as she compels body to be bounded by that which is vacant, and that which is vacant to be bounded by body. That so, by this alternate bounding of one by the other, she may render all infinite. Else, moreover, if one or other of these did not bound the other by its simple nature, so that one of them, the vacant, for instance, should extend unlimited, Neither the sea, nor the land, nor the bright temples of heaven, nor the race of mortals, nor the sacred persons of the gods, could subsist for the small space of an hour. For the body of matter, driven abroad from its union, would be borne dispersed through the mighty void, or rather, in such a case, never having been united, would never have produced anything, since, when originally scattered, it could not have been brought together. For certainly, neither the primary elements of things dispose themselves severally in their own order, by their own counsel or sagacious understanding, nor assuredly did they agree among themselves what motions each should produce, but, because being many and changed in many ways, they are for an infinite space of time agitated, 
being acted upon by forces throughout the whole, they thus, by experiencing movements and combinations of every kind, at length settle into such positions, by which means this sum of things being produced exists. And this sum of things, when it was once thrown into suitable motions, being also maintained in that state through many long years, causes that the rivers recruit the greedy sea with large floods of water, and that the earth, cherished by the heat of the sun, renews its productions, also that the race of living creatures flourishes undecayed, and that the gliding fires of heaven live, which effects atoms could by no means produce, unless an abundant supply of matter could arise from the infinite of space, whence everything that is produced is accustomed to repair in time the parts lost. For, as the nature of animals, when deprived of food, wastes and decays, losing its substance, so must all things fall away, as soon as matter, turned by any means from its course, has failed to supply itself. Nor can impacts, as some may imagine, produced externally on all sides, keep together the entire whole, or whatever of matter has been combined into a whole. For, though some external impacts may strike frequently, and thus may sustain here and there a part, until others succeed, and the requisite number of impacts for securing any particular portion may be completed, yet, at times, the bodies producing the impacts are compelled to rebound, and at the same moment to give the primary atoms of things space and time for flight, so that they may be carried away free from the aggregate. It is necessary, therefore, for such compression by impact, that many atoms should again and again rise up into action from the surrounding parts. And besides, in order that the impacts may be given in sufficient numbers, an infinite quantity of matter is requisite on every side. And, in these matters, O Memmius, be very far from believing that which some say, namely, that all things tend to the centre of the whole, and that therefore the nature and substance of the world stand, without any percussions or pressures from without, and that the highest and lowest parts, as we call them, cannot be resolved or thrown back in any direction, because all things strive towards the middle. If, indeed, you do believe that anything, as the earth, according to them, can rest upon itself in the middle, and that those heavy bodies which are on the lower part of the earth all tend upwards or to the centre, and rest upon the earth, although placed in a reverse position to ourselves, like the shadows of things which we every day see in the water with their lower parts uppermost and in like manner they contend that the animals beneath us range about with their feet upwards, nor can fall back from the earth into the lower parts of heaven, more than our bodies can spontaneously fly off into the upper parts of heaven, that when they see the sun we behold the stars of night, and that they share the times of heaven, the hours of light and darkness, alternately with us, and pass nights corresponding in time to our days. But a vain delusion must have devised all these things for foolish men, mistaken in that they have embraced a wrong opinion at the commencement. For there can be no middle where vacuum and space are infinite, nor, even if there were a middle, would anything at all rest there more on that account than it would stay there for any other far different reason, since all mere place and space which we call empty must, whether through the center or through what is not the center, yield equally a passage to equal weights in whatsoever direction their motions tend. Nor is there any place at which, when bodies have arrived, they can make a stand in vacuo, having lost the force of weight. Nor again must that which is vacuum give support beneath anything, but must proceed to yield that passage through it which its nature requires. Things, therefore, cannot be held in combination under such a hypothesis, namely, that they are influenced by a tendency to the centre. This sect of philosophers are in error, moreover, inasmuch as they do not suppose that all particles tend to the centre, but only those of earth and water, as the liquid of the sea and the great floods from the mountains, and those which are contained, as it were, in earthy substances, but set forth, on the other hand, that the subtle air of heaven and warm fire are, at the same time, carried away from the centre, and that from this cause the whole sky twinkles around us with stars, 
and the flame of the sun is fed throughout the blue expanse of heaven, since all the heat fleeing from the center collects in those parts. For the generations of men also, they say, are fed from the earth, by food rising from the center. Nor could the extremities of the branches of the trees produce leaves, if the earth did not gradually supply sustenance to each from the ground. While they add that the heaven above covers all things round about, lest the walls of the world, being dissolved into their constituent atoms, should suddenly fly, like winged flames, through the vast void, and lest other things should follow in like manner. Lest, moreover, the regions of heaven containing the thunder should fall from above, and the earth should hastily withdraw itself from under our feet, and all human beings, dissolving their bodies into their elements, should pass away, in the midst of the mingled ruin of things of earth and heaven, through the deep inane, so that, in a moment of time, no relic should exist of them, except desert space and blind atoms. For, wheresoever you shall suppose atoms to be first absent from their proper place, that part will be the gate of death to all things. By that part, the whole crowd of material elements will rush forth abroad. These things, if you shall understand, led on by my humble effort, for one proposition will appear plain from another. Dark night will not prevent your progress, or hinder you from seeing clearly in the last depths of nature. So effectually will truths kindle light for truths. End of section 3 Section 4 of On the Nitro Things this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Raven Notation. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Book 2, Part 1. It is sweet when the winds disturb the waters on the vast deep. To behold from the land the great distress of another, not because it is a joyous pleasure that any one should be made to suffer, but because it is agreeable to see from what evils thou thyself art free. It is also sweet to contemplate the contending forces of war arrayed over the plains without any share of thy own in the danger, but nothing is sweeter than to occupy the well-defended serene heights raised by the learning of the wise, from whence thou mayest look down upon others, and see them straying in all directions, wandering about to find the best path of life, contending in intellectual power, vying with each other in nobleness of birth, and striving by excessive labour, night and day, to rise to the highest power, and to obtain the government of affairs. O wretched minds of men! O blind souls, in what darkness of life, and in how great dangers is this existence, of whatever duration it is, past! We may not see that the nature of every man demands nothing more for itself, but that he, from whose body pain is removed and absent, may exercise his mind with a pleasurable feeling, exempt from care and fear. We are sensible, therefore, that very few things are necessary to the nature of the body. Those things, namely, which are of such a kind that they may keep off pain, and that they may afford, at the same time, many pleasures. Nor does nature herself ever require higher gratification. If there are not, in the houses of men, golden images of youths, holding in their right hands blazing lamps, in order that light may be supplied for the nocturnal feast, and if their dwelling neither gleams with silver, nor glitters with gold, nor harps cause the arched and gilded roofs to resound. Nevertheless, when they have stretched themselves upon the soft grass near a stream of water, under the boughs of a high tree, they socially, though with no great wealth, gratify their senses with pleasure, especially when the weather smiles upon them, and the seasons of the year 
sprinkle the green grass with flowers nor do hot fevers sooner depart from the body if you are tossed on woven figures and blushing purple than if you are obliged to lie under a plebeian covering for which reason since neither riches nor nobility nor the glory of a kingdom are of any profit as to our body we must further suppose that they are of no profit to the mind unless perchance when you see your legions moving with energy over the surface of the plain stirring up the images of war or when you see your fleet sailing with animation and spreading far abroad upon the water religious fears alarmed at these things flee affrighted from your mind and the dread of death then leaves your time undisturbed and free from care but if we see that such suppositions and expectations are ridiculous and merely objects of derision and that in reality the fears and pursuing cares of men dread neither the sound of arms nor cruel weapons and mingle boldly among kings and rulers of affairs nor shrink before the brightness gleaming from gold or the shining splendour of a purple garment why do you doubt but that to produce these effects is wholly the office of reason especially when all our life labours under the darkness of ignorance for as children tremble and fear everything in thick darkness so we in the light fear sometimes things which are not more to be feared than those which children dread and imagine about to happen in the dark this terror of the mind therefore it is not the rays of the sun or the bright arrows of day that must dispel but the contemplation of nature and the exercise of reason attend now therefore and i will explain to thee by what motions the generative bodies of matter produce various things and resolve them when produced and by what force they are thus compelled to act and what activity has been communicated to them for passing through the mighty void of space do thou remember to give thyself wholly to my words for assuredly matter does not constantly cohere as being closely condensed in itself since we see every object diminished and perceive that all things flow away as it were through length of time and that age withdraws them from our eyes while nevertheless the sum of all seems to remain undecayed and this happens for this reason that the particles of matter which depart from each object lessen the object from which they depart and endow with increase the object or objects to which they have transferred themselves and oblige the former to decay but the latter on the contrary to flourish nor do they continue always in the place to which they have gone and thus the sum of things is perpetually renewed and the races of mortal men subsist by change and transference from one to the other some nations increase others are diminished and in a short space of time the tribes of living creatures are changed by successive generations and like the races deliver the torch of life from hand to hand if you think that the elemental atoms of things can remain at rest and can by remaining at rest generate fresh motions of things you stray with a wide deviation from true reason for since the primary particles of all things wander through the void of space they must necessarily be all carried forwards by their own gravity or as it may chance by the force of another body for when being often moved they meeting have struck against one another it happens that they suddenly start asunder in different directions since neither is it to be wondered at that bodies should do so which are of the utmost hardness and of solid weight nor is it to be observed does anything behind oppose their motion and that you may the more clearly understand that all the atoms of matter are tossed about and kept in motion remember that in the sum of the whole or in the entire universe there is no lowest place nor has it any point where the primary atoms may make a stand since space is without bound and limit and shows of itself by many indications that it extends around infinite in every direction 
and this has been proved by indisputable argument. Which immensity of space being admitted, there was evidently allowed no rest to the primary atoms passing through the void profound, but rather, driven by perpetual and constant motion, part, when struck by other atoms, rebound to a great distance, and part also, when struck, rebounding only to short distances, are caught and intertwined, as it were, by the stroke of the particles that come in contact with them. And whatsoever particles being brought together, in a more close conjuries, rebound only to small distances, as being involved by their own entangling shapes. These form the strong substance of rock, and the rigid consistence of iron, and a few other things of their kind, and of similar hardness. Other particles, again, which wander through the vast void of space, fly, when struck, far off, and rebound away to great distances. These supply to us the thin air and radiant light of the sun. And many atoms, besides, wander through the great void, which are rejected by combinations of bodies, and have nowhere been able, admitted into union, to associate their motions with other atoms. Of which circumstance, as I conceive, an example and image is, from time to time, moving and present before our eyes. For behold, whensoever the beams of the sun pour themselves through a chink in the dark parts of houses, you will see in the light of the rays many minute particles throughout the open space, mingled together in many ways, and, as it were, in perpetual conflict, exhibiting battles and fights, contending in companies, nor allowing any pause to their strife, being agitated by frequent concussions and separations, so that you may conjecture from this spectacle what it is for the primary particles of things to be perpetually tossed about in the great void. Assuredly, a small thing may give an example, and traces leading to the knowledge of great things. On this account it is more fitting that you should give your attention to these motes, which seem to confuse one another in the rays of the sun, because such disorders signify that there secretly exist tendencies to motion, also in the principles of matter, though latent and unapparent to our senses. For you will see there, among these atoms in the sunbeam, many, struck with imperceptible forces, change their course, and turn back, being repelled sometimes this way, and sometimes that, everywhere, and in all directions. And doubtless this errant motion in all these atoms proceeds from the primary elements of matter, for the first primordial atoms of things are moved of themselves, and then these bodies which are of light texture, and are, as it were, nearest to the nature of the primary elements, being urged by secret impulses of those elements, are put into motion, and these later themselves, moreover, agitate others which are somewhat larger. Thus motion ascends from the first principles, and spreads forth by degrees, so as to be apparent to our senses, and so that those atoms are moved before us which we can see in the light of the sun, though it is not clearly evident by what impulses they are thus moved. And now, O Nemius, what activity and swiftness of motion has been given to the original atoms of matter, you may learn from what follows. In the first place, when Aurora sprinkles the earth with new light, and the various birds, flitting through the pathless groves, fill every part amid the soft air with their liquid notes, how suddenly, at such a time, the rising sun, overspreading all things, is wont to clothe them with his rays, we observe to be visible and manifest to all. But that heat and clear light, which the sun sends forth, do not pass through mere empty space, on which account it is compelled to go more slowly because it has thus to force a passage through the flood of air. Nor do the particles of heat pass every one singly, but connected and combined together, for which reason they are, at the same time, both retarded by one another, and externally obstructed, so as to be obliged to proceed less rapidly. But the primordial atoms, which are of pure solidity, 
when they pass through empty space, and nothing external retards them, and when, moreover, they themselves, being one and uncompounded in all their parts, are to that one place borne onwards by their own tendency, to which they have begun to proceed, must be thought, it is evident, to excel in swiftness and to be carried forwards much more rapidly than the light of the sun, and to run through a much greater region of space, in the same time as the beams of the sun traverse the heaven. For neither have they to delay, being retarded by deliberation, how they shall proceed, nor have they to pursue the neighbouring atoms, one after the other, that they may learn by what method everything is to be done. End of section 4《Section 5 of On the Nature of Things》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Raven Notation On the Nature of Things by Lucretius Translated by John Selby Watson Book 2, Part 2 But some ignorant persons in opposition to these opinions, think that the nature of matter cannot, without the will and providence of the gods, be ordered so suitably to human plans and conveniences, as to change the seasons of the year, and to produce the fruits of the earth, and to effect also other things in which the directness of life, divine pleasure, prompts mortals and herself leads them to engage so that they may propagate their kind through the allurement of gratification, lest the race of men should perish. For whose sake, when they imagine that the God settled all things, they seem in all respects to have departed far from just reasoning. Although I were ignorant what the primary elements of things were, yet this I could venture to assert from a contemplation of the nature of heaven itself, and to demonstrate from many other things that the world was by no means made for us by divine power, although these opinions incur reprehension among the generality of mankind. Which matters, O Memmius, I will make clear to you hereafter. We will now explain what remains to be said concerning the motions of atoms. This is now the place, as I think, in discussing these subjects, to make plain to you that no corporeal substance can, of its own proper force, be born and advance upwards, lest the particles of flame should deceive you in this matter. For though they are produced upwards, and take increase upwards, yet also the smiling corn and groves have their growth upwards, though all weights, as far as is in them, are borne downwards. Nor when fire springs up to the roofs of houses, and consumes the beams and rafters with a swift flame, is it to be thought that it does so without a compelling force, as is the case, for example, when blood, sent forth from our body, spouts out, springing up on high and sprinkling abroad a purple stream? Do you not see also with how strong a force the liquid substance of water repels beams and logs of wood? Do you not observe how, the more we have on any occasion urged them straight downwards, and have powerfully pressed them down with great force and with difficulty, so the more eagerly the water casts them back and sends them upwards, so that they rise up and leap forth with a larger portion of their substance. And yet we do not doubt, I suppose, that these bodies, as far as is in them, are all borne downwards through empty space. Thus, accordingly, Flames must also have the power to rise, when driven up, through the air of heaven, although their own weights, as far as is in them, strive to draw them downwards. Do you not, moreover, see that meteors in the night, flying through the height of heaven, draw long tracks of flame in whatever directions nature has given them a passage? Do you not see shooting stars fall to the earth? The sun, also, from the highest point of the sky, spreads abroad his heat on all sides, and covers the fields with his light. The heat of the sun, therefore, also tends downwards to the earth, and you observe likewise the lightnings fly through the oblique showers, 
the fires bursting from the clouds rush sometimes in one way sometimes in another and the body of flame falls very frequently to the earth in reference to these subjects also we wish you to understand this that the particles of matter when they are borne downwards straight through the void of space do for the most part by their own weights at some time though at no fixed and determinate time and at some points though at no fixed and determinate points turn aside from the right line but only so far as you can call the least possible deviation but unless the atoms were accustomed to decline from the right line they would all fall straight down through the void profound like drops of rain through the air nor would there have been any contact produced or any collision generated among the primary elements and thus nature would never have produced anything but if perchance any one believes that the heavier bodies as being borne more swiftly straight through the void of space might fall from above on the lighter ones and thus produce concussions which might give rise to generative movements he deviates and departs far from just reasoning for whatsoever bodies fall downwards through the water and the air they of necessity must quicken their motions according to their weights inasmuch as the dense consistence of water and the subtle substance of the air cannot equally retard every body but yield sooner to the heavier bodies being overcome by them but on the contrary a pure vacuum can afford no resistance to any thing in any place or at any time but must constantly allow it the free passage which its nature requires for which reason all bodies when put into motion must be equally borne onwards though not of equal weights through the unresisting void the heavier atoms will therefore never be able to fall from above on the lighter nor of themselves produce concussions which may vary the motions by which nature performs her operations for which cause it must again and again be acknowledged that atoms decline a little from the straight course though it need not be admitted that they decline more than the least possible space lest we should seem to imagine oblique motions and truth should refute that supposition for this we see to be obvious and manifest that heavy bodies as far as depends on themselves cannot when they fall from above advance obliquely a fact which you may yourself see but who is there that can see that atoms do not at all turn themselves aside even in the least from the straight direction of their course further if all motion is connected and dependent and a new movement perpetually arises from a former one in a certain order and if the primary elements do not produce any commencement of motion by deviating from the straight line to break the laws of fate so that cause may not follow cause in infinite succession whence comes this freedom of will to all animals in the world whence i say is this liberty of action wrested from the fates by means of which we go wheresoever inclination leads each of us whence is it that we ourselves turn aside and alter our motions not at any fixed time nor in any fixed part of space but just as our mind has prompted us for doubtless in such matters his own will gives a commencement of action to every man and hence motions are diffused through the limbs do you not see also that when the barriers on the race-course are set open at a certain instant yet the eager strength of the horses cannot spring forward so suddenly as the inclination itself desires for the whole mass of matter throughout the whole body excited in all the members must be collected and roused simultaneously into action that it may second the desire of the mind in connection with it so that you may see that the commencement of motion is produced from the heart and that the tendency to act proceeds in the first place from the inclination of the mind and is thence spread onwards through the whole body and its members nor is this similar to the case in which we go forwards when impelled by a blow from the great strength and violent compulsion of another person 
for then it is evident that the whole matter of the entire body moves and is hurried onwards against our consent until the will acting throughout the members has reined it back do you now see therefore that although external force drives along many men that is often drives men along and compels them frequently to go forwards against their will and to be hurried away headlong yet that there is something in our breast which can struggle against and oppose it according to the direction of which also the aggregate of matter within us is at times obliged to be guided throughout our several limbs and members and when driven forward is curbed and sinks down into rest wherefore you must necessarily confess that the same is the case in the seeds of matter and that there is some other cause for motion besides strokes and weight from which this power is innate in them since we see that nothing can be produced from nothing for weight forbids that all effects should be produced by strokes and as if by external force but the circumstance that our mind itself is not influenced merely by internal necessity in performing every action and is not as if under subjection compelled only to bear and suffer this circumstance the slight declination of the primordial atoms causes though it takes place neither in any determinate part of space nor at any determinate time nor was the general body of matter ever more condensed together or on the other hand distributed in parts at greater intervals than it is at present for to that body neither does any increase ever take place nor is any diminution made from it through decay for which reason in whatever motion the atoms of primordial seeds are now in the same motion they were in past time and hereafter will always be moved in a similar manner and whatever things have been wont to be produced will still be produced under like circumstances and will exist and grow and acquire strength as far as has been granted to each by the laws of nature nor can any influence change the sum of things for neither is there any part of space to which any kind of matter can fly off from the whole nor again is there any part from which any new force having arisen there can burst in upon the whole and thus change the entire order of things and alter its movements in these matters it is not at all to be regarded as wonderful why when all the primordial elements of things are in motion yet the whole of things seems to stand in perfect rest except whatever individual thing exhibits motion in its own body for the entire nature of original principles lies far removed from our senses and beneath them for which cause when you cannot see the thing itself its motions must also hide themselves from your eyes especially when even many things that we can see nevertheless often conceal their motions from us as being separated from us by a great distance for frequently upon a hill we may observe a flock of woolly sheep spread about cropping the rich pasture wheresoever the grass gemmed with fresh dew calls and invites each while the full-fed lambs sport and frisk about with delight all which objects from a distance appear to us confused and only a whiteness as it were seems to rest upon the green hill also when vast legions fill all the parts of a plain stirring up the image of war the gleam of arms then raises itself to the sky and all the land around glitters with brass while a sound is excited by the force beneath the feet of the men and the neighbouring hills struck with the noise re-echo the shouts of the troops to the stars of heaven and the cavalry at the same time swiftly wheel about and suddenly charge across the plains in the centre shaking them with their violent onset all these are distinct objects and yet there is a certain spot on the high hills whence if you look down they seem to rest on the ground as one body and only a continuous brightness to settle over the field attend now o memmius and learn in the next place of what nature the primordial elements of things are and how very different they are in their forms how they are varied by manifold shapes not that a few only are endowed with the like form 
for those alike are innumerable, but because, throughout the whole, all are not similar to all, but are varied with great differences. Nor is this wonderful, for since the abundance of them is such that, as I have shown, there is neither any limit nor sum of them, they must not, and cannot, assuredly, be all universally endowed with a like figure and like shape to all others. Besides, consider the human race, and the mute swarms of fishes swimming in the sea, and the abundant herds of cattle and wild beasts, and the various birds which frequent the pleasant places about the waters, upon the banks of rivers, fountains, and lakes, and which, flitting through the trees, traverse the pathless groves, of which select any one you please in the several kinds for contemplation, and you will still find that they differ from one another in their forms. Nor, indeed, could the progeny by any other means know its mother, or the mother her progeny. Whereas we see that inferior animals, not less than men, are known to each other. For, on many occasions, a calf, sacrificed at the frankincense burning altars, falls before the beauteous temples of the gods, pouring forth a warm stream of blood from its breast. But the mother, meanwhile, deprived of her young, wandering through the green forests, leaves traces imprinted on the ground with her cloven feet, surveying all places with her eyes, if anywhere she may discern her lost offspring, and then, standing still, fills the leafy grove with her complaints. She also frequently goes back to look at the stall, penetrated with regret for her calf, nor are the tender willows, or the grass fresh with dew, or any streams gliding level with the top of their banks, able to soothe her feelings, and drive away her sudden affliction nor can any other forms of calves over the fertile pastures divert her attention or lighten her of her care, so perseveringly does she require some shape that is familiar and known to her. Moreover, the tender kids with their tremulous voices know, as they plainly indicate, their horned dams and sheep distinguish the bleating of the butting lamb, and thus, as nature requires, each hastens invariably to its own milky udder. Lastly, contemplate any sorts of corn, and still you will not find the whole of each in its own kind, or all the grains of each, to have such a mutual resemblance, but that some difference will run between their forms. And, in like manner, we see the various sorts of shells paint the lap of the earth, where the sea, with gentle waves, strews the bibulous sand on the winding shore. Again and again, therefore, I repeat, the primordial atoms of things, since they exist in their own nature, and are not fashioned to a certain shape by the hand of one artificer, must likewise circulate through the universe in certain shapes, dissimilar one from another. It is very easy for us, then, by the clear guidance of reason, to explain why the flame of lightning passes through the air with much more penetration than our fire which arises from fuel of the earth. For you may justly argue that the celestial fire of lightning, as being more subtle, consists of smaller atoms, and therefore flies through diminutive passages which this fire of ours, taking its rise from wood, and produced by torches, cannot enter. Besides, Light passes through horn, but water is repelled by it. Why? Unless that the atoms of light are less than those of which the genial liquid of water consists. Wine, also, we observe to flow as quickly as possible through a strainer, but thick oil, on the contrary, moves through it slowly, because, as it appears, the latter either consists of larger atoms, or of such as are more hooked and involved with one another and thus it happens, that the individual atoms, not being so quickly detached from their coherence with each other, cannot so easily pass through the individual pores of any body. To this is added, that the liquids of honey and milk are moved about in the mouth with a pleasant sensation to the tongue, but, on the contrary, the bitter substance of wormwood and acrid centaury torment the palate with a disagreeable taste, 
so that you may easily infer that those things which can affect the senses with pleasure consist of smooth and round particles, but that, on the other hand, whatever things seem bitter and rough are held united together of particles more hooked, and that, on this account, they are accustomed, as it were, to tear away to our feelings and to wound the skin of our body at their entrance. Furthermore, all things which are pleasing to the senses, and all which are to the touch unpleasant, are opposed to each other, being formed of atoms of a different shape, that you may not, perchance, imagine that the sharp strider of the creaking saw consists of elements equally smooth with the melodious notes of music, which musicians form upon the strings, awaked, as it were, by their swiftly moving fingers and that you may not suppose that atoms of like form penetrate the nostrils of men when they burn offensively smelling carcasses, and when the stage is freshly sprinkled with Sicilian saffron, and the altar, near at hand, exhales Pantian odours, nor conceive that pleasing colours which can feast the eye with delight, and those which are, as it were, pungent to the sight, and compel us to shed tears, or which seem ugly and hideous with a repulsive look, consist of like seminal atoms. For every object, whatever it be, that soothes the sense of the beholders, is not produced without some smoothness in its elements, but, on the contrary, whatever is of a disagreeable and rough consistence, has not been formed without something offensive in its material principles. There are some atoms also, which are neither justly thought to be smooth, nor altogether hooked with bent points, but rather to be furnished with small angles, slightly jutting out, and which have the power rather to titillate the sense than to wound it, of which kind of atoms consist pickle and the taste of elecampane. Moreover, that warm fire and cold frost penetrate the feelings of the body differently, as being composed of atoms pointed in different ways. The touch of each is a sufficient indication. For the touch, the touch, O sacred deities of heaven, is the sense of the body, and is affected either when something external insinuates itself through the pores, or when something which is generated in the body hurts or delights it in issuing forth, as in the genial exercises of Venus, or when the seeds from striking against each other, raise a tumult in the body itself, and, by mutual agitation, confound the sense, as if, for example, you yourself should strike any part of your own body, and make trial of this sensation. For which reason forms of substance, which can excite various feelings, must necessarily be far different in their elementary principles. Further, those bodies that seem to us hard and dense must necessarily consist of particles more locked with one another, and be held closely compacted, as it were, by branching atoms. Among which kind of bodies, adamantine rocks, naturally adapted to despise blows, stand pre-eminently in the first rank, as well as stout flints, and the strength of hard iron, and brazen hinges, which, as they support the weight of their gates, make a loud grating sound those bodies indeed which are liquid and of a fluid substance must consist more than harder bodies of smooth and round atoms for a draught of poppy juice is even as yielding and as much of a liquid as a draught of water since their several collections of particles are not held together rigidly among themselves and their progress along a descent is voluble and easy. All things, moreover, which you should see scattered themselves in a short space of time, as smoke, clouds, and flames, must necessarily, if they do not wholly consist of smooth and round particles, yet not be bound together with complex ones, so that being as they are, they may have a pungent effect upon the body, and penetrate rocks, but cannot cohere together a power which we all see to be granted to thorns. You may easily understand, therefore, that they do not consist of hooked and complicated, but of acute atoms. 
but that you should observe the same bodies, which are fluid, to be bitter, as is the liquid of the sea, is by no means to be wondered at by any one. For that which is fluid consists of smooth and round particles, and with these smooth and round particles are mixed pungent particles causing pain. Nor yet is it necessary that these atoms should hold themselves together by being hooked, for you may be certain that though the particles are rough, they are yet globose, so that they may flow among those of the liquid, though at the same time they may hurt the sense, and that you may the more certainly believe that rough are mixed with smooth particles, of both of which, for instance, the mass of the waters of the ocean consists, there is, I may mention, a method of separating them and considering them apart. The same water of the sea, for example, becomes sweet when it is often filtered through the earth, so that it may flow, as you may sometimes see, into a trench and thus lose its saltness. For it leaves above or near the surface of the earth the particles of bitter salt, which are rough and jagged, so that they may easily inhere in the earth. Which point, since I have now demonstrated, I shall proceed to join with it another proposition, which, depending on this, derives its credit from it, that the primary atoms of things vary in figure, but only with a limited number of shapes. If this were not so, some seminal principles would, moreover, necessarily be of an immense bulk of body. For this is evident, because within the same individual minute frame of any one seminal principle, the figures or arrangements of its parts cannot vary much among themselves. Since suppose that the primary principles consist of a certain definite number of very small parts, say three, or increase them if you please by a few more, assuredly when, after arranging all those parts, and altering the place of the highest and lowest part of that one body, and changing the right for the left, you shall have tried in every way what representation of forms each arrangement of the whole of that body offers. If perchance you shall wish still further to vary its forms, you will have to add other parts, and from thence will follow in like manner that a third arrangement will require still more if you shall wish by a third arrangement still to vary its forms. An increase in bulk, therefore, follows upon the variation of shapes, for which reason you cannot believe that seminal principles differ from one another by an infinite variety of shapes, lest by such a supposition you should make some to be of immense bulk, which I have already shown that it is not possible to prove. And, if such were the case, if the figures of atoms were infinite, barbaric garments, and shining meliboan purple, tinged with the dye of shellfish from Thessaly, as well as the golden brood of peacocks, painted with smiling beauty, would lose their estimation in your eyes, being thrown into the shade by the new beauty of fresh objects. The perfume of myrrh and the taste of honey would be despised, and the melodies of swans and the tunes of Phoebus varied on the chords of the lyre, would in like manner be silenced as being outdone by something new. For, in every class of things, some new thing might arise more excellent than others which are now thought the best. Or, all things might also fall back into a worse state, as we have said that they might possibly rise to a better. For, in a retrograde order, one thing might arise, time after time, more disagreeable than others preceding it, to the nostrils, ears, and eyes, and taste of the palate. Since this, however, is not so, but a certain limit set to things in both directions, as to what is bad and what is good, confines the whole, you must of necessity admit that the particles of matter also vary from one another only by shapes that are finite in number. Lastly, a distance, so to speak, has been defined from the heat of summer to the freezing cold of winter, and has been measured back from cold to heat in like manner. For the whole year is, or consists of, heat and cold, 
and the moderate warmths of spring and autumn lie between both the other two seasons, filling up the whole in succession. The seasons of spring and autumn, therefore, as made and appointed, are kept distinct by a limited portion to each, since they are marked on each side by two points, and shut in on the one hand by heats, and on the other side by rigid frosts. Since I have now proved this, I shall proceed to join with it another observation, which, depending on this, derives its credit from it, that the primordial atoms of things, which are formed of a like figure one to the other, are infinite in number, for since the diversity of their forms is finite, it necessarily follows that those which are alike are infinite, or it would appear that the sum of matter would be finite, which I have proved to be impossible. Since I have shown this, I will now, give me your attention, demonstrate in a few sweetly sounding verses that the atoms of matter support the whole of things from all eternity by a succession of movements on every side. For though you see in any particular region certain animals to be more rare than others, and observe nature in those less rare to be more productive, yet in another region and district, and in distant lands, it is possible that there may be many animals of that kind, and that the deficiency of their numbers in one place may be compensated in another, just as we see in the race of quadrupeds to be especially the case with the snake-handed elephants, with many thousands of which India is defended as with an ivory rampart, so that it cannot be at all penetrated. So great is the multitude of those beasts in that country, but of which we see very few specimens among us. But yet that I may, if you wish, grant this also, let there be, in your imagination, any single creature you please, existing alone with its own natural body, and to which there may be no creature similar in the whole round of the earth, Yet, unless the quality of the seeds of matter, from which that creature may be formed and generated, shall be infinite in number, it will neither be possible for it to be produced, nor, moreover, if it could be produced, to grow up and be nourished. For let your eyes conceive, i.e., imagine that you see, the generative atoms of any single thing, being limited in number, tossed about through the whole of space, Whence, I ask, where, by what force, and by what means, will they, meeting together, unite, amid so vast an ocean of matter, and so mighty a confusion of dissimilar particles? They have, as I think, no method of combining themselves. But, as when great and numerous shipwrecks have arisen, the vast sea is wont to scatter abroad floating benches, hollow fragments of vessels, sail-yards, prows, masts, and oars, so that the ornaments of sterns may be seen swimming on all the coasts of the earth, and may give admonition to mortals to resolve to avoid the treachery and violence and deceit of the faithless sea, nor on any occasion to be too credulous when the insidious flattery of the calm deep smiles. So if you, in this case, shall once settle for yourself that certain primordial atoms are finite in number, you must then allow that the different agitations of matter will necessarily toss them about, scattered as they will be, forever, so that they can at no time, being driven together, unite in combination, or, if they should unite, remain in combination, or swell with increase, both of which effects manifest proof shows to occur before our eyes, namely, that things are produced, and that, when produced, they have the power to increase. It is therefore evident that, in every class of beings, the primordial elements of things, from which all are supplied, are infinite in number. Nor, therefore, inasmuch as original elements are infinite, can the movements of things, which are destructive to vital existence, always prevail, or bury its safety forever, though neither, on the other hand, can motions productive of generation and increase always preserve things which have been formed. Thus a war of principles, grown up from the infinite space of the past, 
is carried on with equal strife. The vital principles of things prevail sometimes in one place, sometimes in another, and are prevailed over in their turn. The wail which infants raise when they come forth to view the regions of light is mixed with funeral lamentations, nor has any night followed a day, or any morning followed a night, which has not heard groans, the attendance of death and gloomy obsequies, mixed with the weak cries of infants coming into the world. End of section 5section six of on the nature of things this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by raven notation on the nature of things by lucretius translated by john selby watson book two part three in considering these points, it is proper for you also to have it impressed, as with a seal, upon your mind, and to keep it faithfully entrusted to your memory, that there is nothing, among all objects of which the nature is apparent before us, which consists only of one kind of elements, nor anything which does not consist of mixed seminal principles. And whatever possesses in itself more numerous powers and energies than other things, thus demonstrates that it contains more numerous kinds of primary particles and various configurations of them. In the first place, the earth has in itself primary atoms, from which springs, rolling forth cool waters, incessantly recruit the immense sea. It has also in itself atoms from which fires arise. For in many places, the soil of the earth, when set on fire, burns, and the violence of Etna rages with mighty flames. Moreover, the earth contains atoms from which it can raise up rich corn and cheerful groves for the tribes of men, and from which also it can afford waving leaves and abundant pasturage for the brood of wild beasts raging over the mountains. For which reasons, the earth alone is called the great mother of the gods, and mother of beasts, and parent of the human race. The old and learned poets of the Greeks sung that she, in her seat on her chariot, drives two lions yoked together, signifying that the vast earth hangs in the open space of the air, and that one earth cannot stand upon another earth. They added the lions, because any offspring, however wild, ought to be softened when influenced by the good offices of parents. And they surrounded the top of her head with a mural crown, because the earth, fortified in lofty places, sustained cities, distinguished with which decoration the image of the Divine Mother is born, spreading terror through the wide world. Her various nations according to the ancient practice of their worship, call the Adean mother, and assign her bands of Phrygians as attendants, because they say that from those parts corn first began to be produced, and thence was diffused over the globe of the earth. They assign to her also the galley, because they wish to intimate that those who have violated the sacred respect due to their mother and have been found ungrateful to their fathers, are to be thought unworthy to bring living offspring into the realms of light. Distended drums and hollow cymbals resound in their hands around the goddess, and their horns threaten with a hoarse noise, while the hollow pipe excites their minds with Phrygian notes, and they carry weapons outstretched before them, 
as signs of violent rage which may alarm with terror the undutiful minds and impious hearts of the crowd struck with the power of the goddess as soon therefore as riding through great cities she being dumb bestows a silent blessing on mortals they strew the whole course of the road with brass and silver enriching her with munificent contributions while they diffuse a shower of roses overshadowing the mother and her troop of attendants here the armed band whom the greeks call by the name of phrygian curities dance round vigorously with ropes and leap about to their tune streaming with blood shaking the terrible crests on their heads as they nod they represent the dictian curities who are formerly said in crete to have concealed that famous infant cry of jupiter when the armed youths in a swift dance around the child struck in tune their brazen shields with their brazen spears lest saturn having got possession of him should devour him and cause an eternal wound in the heart of his mother either for this reason therefore armed men accompany the great mother or else because the priests thus signify that the goddess admonishes men to be willing to defend the land of their country with arms and valour and to prepare themselves to be a protection and honour to their parents these pageants though celebrated as being fitly and excellently contrived are yet far removed from sound reason for the whole race of the gods must necessarily of itself enjoy its immortal existence in the most profound tranquillity far removed and separated from our affairs since being free from all pain exempt from all dangers powerful itself in its own resources and wanting nothing of us it is neither propitiated by services from the good nor affected with anger against the bad the earth indeed is at all times void of sense but because it contains the primary elements of many things it brings forth many productions in many ways into the light of the sun if any one then shall resolve to call the sea neptune and corn ceres and chooses rather to abuse the name of bacchus than to utter the proper appellation of wine let us concede that such a one may pronounce the orb of the earth to be the mother of the gods provided that it still be allowed to remain its real self but to return then to the infinite variety of atoms the woolly sheep we often see cropping the grass from the same plain and the warlike brood of horses and the horned herds living under the same part of the canopy of heaven and quenching their thirst from the same stream of water grow up of dissimilar species retaining the parent nature and all follow habits according to their kinds so various is the nature of the matter in each kind of herb so great is the variety of particles in each river hence moreover though the same parts bones blood veins heat moisture viscera and nerves make up any one you please of all animals still these being very different in themselves are formed of primary particles of an entirely different figure further whatever bodies being set on fire burn show that there are cherished in their mass if nothing else those various seminal atoms from which they are enabled to throw forth fire and cast up light and also to put sparks in motion and scatter abroad embers surveying other things with like reasoning you will accordingly find that they conceal in their consistence the seeds of many things and contain various conformations of atoms again you observe many objects to which both colour and taste have been assigned together with smell especially most of the gifts which you offer to the gods when you feel your mind affected in a debasing manner with religion these things must therefore consist of various conformations of atoms for scent penetrates where juices which excite the taste do not make a way to the corporeal organs also juices by their particular method and flavour by its particular method 
win their way to the senses, so that you may know that they arise from different conformations of atoms. Dissimilar forms of particles, therefore, combine in one mass, and things consist of mixed seminal principles. Besides, even in my own verses you see everywhere many elements common to many words, though you must nevertheless necessarily acknowledge that the verses and words consist part of some elements and part of others, differing among themselves, not because only a few common letters run through the words, or because no two words, out of all, are alike in having any letter in common, but because, taking the word throughout, all the letters are not common to all. So likewise in other matters, many common elements, as they are the primary principles of many things, may yet exist in dissimilar combinations among themselves, so that the human race, and the fruits of the earth, and the rich groves, may justly be considered to consist each of distinct original particles. Nor yet is it to be thought that all particles can be combined in all ways. For, if this were the case, you would everywhere see monsters arise. You would behold shapes produced half man, half beast, and sometimes tall boughs of trees grow out of an animated body. You would observe many members of terrestrial animals united to those of marine animals, and nature breeding throughout the all-producing earth, chimeras breathing flame from horrid mouths, of which irregularities it is evident that none occur, since we see that all things, being produced from certain seeds, by an unerring generative nature, can, as they grow up, preserve their kind pure and unmixed. And it is plain that this must necessarily be the case according to strict method and laws, for from the several sorts of food that are eaten, the particles, suitable to each animal, pass internally into its limbs and other parts, and, being there combined, produce motions fitted to that animal. But, on the other hand, we see that nature throws back upon the earth those particles which are unsuitable to the animal, and many, existing in imperceptible substances, escape out of the body being wrought upon by the impulses and agitations of other particles, which effluent particles could neither be combined in any part, nor consent and be animated to participate in the vital movements. But lest you should think that animals only are bound by these laws, a certain order and regularity, let me observe, keeps all things distinct. For as, throughout the whole of nature, things dissimilar from one another are individually produced, so it is necessary that each should consist of a different form of elements. Not that only a few elements are endowed with like forms, but because all, throughout all bodies, are not similar to all. Since, moreover, seminal particles differ, their intervals, passages, connections, weights, impulses, collisions, motions must necessarily differ variations which not only keep distinct the bodies of animals but give peculiarity to the land and the whole sea and cause the heaven to differ in nature from the earth and now attend further and receive into your mind my precepts which i with pleasing toil have collected together do not by any chance Imagine that those things which you see before your eyes of a white colour consist, because they are white, of white elemental atoms, or that those which are black are produced from black seminal particles. Nor suppose that any objects which are tinged with any colour whatsoever wear that colour because their material elements are tinctured with a hue similar to it. For there is no colour at all in the elementary atoms of matter, either similar to that of the bodies in which they exist, or dissimilar. Into the nature of which elementary atoms, if you think that the mind cannot penetrate, so as to form an idea of them, because they are without colour, you wander far away from the truth. Since, 
When those who have been born blind, and who have never seen the light of the sun, yet distinguish substances by the touch, which to them have seemed unmarked by colours from their earliest youth, we may understand also that substances actually untinctured with colour may be brought under the comprehension of our intellect. Moreover, whatever objects we ourselves touch in thick darkness, we do not perceive to be tinged with any colour at all. Since I prove it to be possible that atoms may be colourless, I will now show that it certainly is so. For every colour is, or may be, changed into all colours whatsoever. But this is a transmutation which primordial elements must by no means undergo, since it is necessary that there should remain something unchangeable, lest all things should be reduced utterly to nothing. For whatsoever being changed goes beyond its own limits, this change forthwith becomes the death or termination of that which it was before. Be cautious, therefore, not to tinge the seeds of things with colours, lest all things for your gratification should be reduced to nothing. Besides, if no kind of colour has been assigned to primary particles, and if they are endowed with various forms by which they generate and vary all kinds of colours, and since, moreover, it is of great consequence with what atoms, and in what configuration, seminal particles are severally combined, and what impacts they mutually give and receive, you may at once, with the greatest ease, render a reason why those objects which were a while ago of a black colour, may suddenly become of a marble whiteness, as when the sea, after violent winds have stirred up its waters, is changed in hue, and boils up into waves white as the whiteness of marble. For you may readily say of any object, which we generally observe to be black, that, when its material atoms have been disturbed, and the order of the particles changed, and some taken away and others added, it forthwith becomes possible that it may seem of a glowing whiteness. But if the waters of the sea consisted of cerulean atoms, they could by no means become white, for, in whatever way you may disorder and commingle those atoms which are cerulean, they can never pass into the colour of marble. But if the atoms which make up the simple and pure colour of the sea were tinged with various and diverse colours, as frequently we see from different forms and dissimilar figures, is formed a perfect square, consisting of only one figure. It would follow that, as in the square, we see the other different figures exist, so in the water of the sea, or in any other simple and pure colour, we should see those wholly different and distinct colours, from which the uniform colour of the sea proceeds. Further, the different figures which make up the square by no means hinder or prevent the whole outline of the compound figure from being or appearing square. But the various colours of any substances which make up any compound substance impede and prohibit that whole compound substance from possibly being of one uniform hue. Then, moreover, the reason which prompts and induces us sometimes to impute colours to primary particles, namely, that coloured substances are compounded of them, passes for nothing, because white substances, as the foam of the sea, for instance, are not necessarily produced from other white substances, nor substances which are black from other black substances, but from substances of various colours, and because, moreover, white substances will more readily arise and be produced from primary particles of no colour than from primary particles of a black colour, or from particles of any other colour whatsoever that is adverse and opposed to white. Further, since there can be no colours without light, and the primary particles of things do not come forth into the light, you may hence feel certain that they are vested with no colours at all. For what sort of colour will there possibly exist in thick darkness, when colour is a thing which is changed in and by mere light, because it appears different, 
as it is struck by direct or oblique light as the plumage of doves which is situate round the back of the head and encircles the neck appears of a different colour as it is seen differently in the sun for in one position it is affected so as to be red with the hue of the bright carbuncle at another time in a certain aspect it is so changed that it seems to mix the colour of green emeralds with blue the tail of the peacock also when it is covered with a flood of light changes its colours as it is presented in different ways in like manner and since all these colours are produced by a certain effect of the light it must be considered that colour cannot be produced at all without that light since too the pupil of the eye receives upon itself one kind of impulse when it is said to perceive a white colour and another again when it perceives black and other colours and since it is of no moment as to the feeling with what colour those things which you touch are distinguished but rather of what shape they are formed you may conclude that primary particles have no need of colours but have only to affect the touch differently through the different forms in which they are combined besides since there is no certain kind of colours peculiar to certain shapes and since all shapes of seminal atoms may exist with any colour whatsoever why if we suppose that seminal atoms which are of manifold shapes have colour are not those creatures which consist of those seminal atoms sprinkled over accordingly with all sorts of colours each in its several kind whatsoever it may be for under this supposition it might be expected that crows as they fly would often shed forth a white colour from white feathers and that swans if springing perchance from black atoms would be born black or if from atoms of any other colour might be of any other hue whatsoever uniform or varied moreover the more any body is divided into small parts the more you can see its colour by degrees die away and become extinct as happens when gold is broken into small fragments so purple and scarlet by far the brightest of colours when they have been divided thread by thread are utterly deprived of lustre so that you may from this infer that the small parts of bodies throw off all colour before they are reduced to their ultimate atoms further since you grant that all bodies do not emit sound or smell it consequently happens that you do not attribute to all bodies sounds or smells so since we cannot see all bodies with our eyes we may conceive that certain bodies exist which we do not see as much destitute of colour as others are free from smell and void of sound and that an intelligent mind can form a notion of these colourless bodies no less than of others which are destitute of other qualities and distinctions but that you may not perchance imagine that primary atoms remain void of colour only they are also you may understand altogether destitute of heat and cold and are understood to be barren of sound and dry of all moisture nor do they send out any odour of their own from their substance thus when you proceed to compound a sweet ointment of amaracus and myrrh and the flower of nard which breathes nectar to the nostrils it is in the first place proper to seek as far as is convenient and as far as you may be able to find the substance of inodorous olive oil which emits no scent to the nostrils that it may as little as possible by the infection of any strong smell of its own corrupt the odours mixed and digested in its body as a vehicle for them finally therefore it must be granted that the primary atoms of things communicate no odour or sound of their own to the things to be produced from them since they can emit from themselves none of these qualities nor in like manner do they emit any savour at all or cold or heat other qualities moreover 
which are such that they are themselves, and in the bodies with which they are connected, perishable, as pliancy from softness, brittleness from decay, hollowness from tenuity of substance, must all of necessity be separated from primary elements, if we wish to lay an everlasting foundation for things, on which their entire security may rest, that the whole universe may not be resolved into nothing. And now let me observe that those creatures, whatsoever they are that we perceive to have sense, you must necessarily acknowledge to consist wholly of senseless atoms. Nor do manifest appearances, which are readily observed, refute this position, or in the least oppose it, but rather themselves lead us by the hand, as it were, and compel us to believe as animals, though possessed of sense, are generated, as I say, from atoms without sense. For you may observe living worms proceed from foul dung, when the earth, moistened with immoderate showers, has contracted a kind of putrescence, and you may see all other things besides change themselves, similarly, into other things. The rivers turn themselves into leaves of trees, and the rich pastures into cattle. The cattle change their substance into that of our bodies, and from our bodies the strength of wild beasts and the frames of birds are often augmented. Nature, therefore, changes all kinds of food into living bodies, and hence produces all senses of animals in a method not very far different from that by which she resolves dry wood into flames, and turns all combustible bodies into fire. Do you now understand, therefore, that it is of great importance in what order the primordial elements of things are severally placed, and with what other elements, being mingled, they give and receive impulses? Besides, what is it that acts upon your mind? What moves you, and induces you to express a different opinion, preventing you from believing that what is possessed of sense is produced from atoms without sense. It is evidently this, that stones and wood and earth, however mixed together, are nevertheless unable to produce vital sense. On these subjects, then, it will be proper for you to remember this principle, that I do not say that what has sense, or that senses themselves, are of course produced from all atoms in general, whatsoever generate things, but that it is of great importance in the first place, of what size those atoms are which are to produce a being of sense, and with what shape they are distinguished, and in the next place, what they are in their movements, arrangements, and positions, of which particulars we, from our imperfect perceptions, see nothing take place in wood and clods, and yet these, when they are as it were rendered putrescent by rain, produce worms, and for this reason, because the atoms of matter, being driven from their former arrangements by some new impulse, are combined in such a manner as makes it indispensable for animals to be produced. Besides, when philosophers determine that a being which has sense can be produced only from atoms endowed with sense, they, forthwith, accustomed to adopt opinions from others, make those atoms soft. For all sense is connected with viscera, nerves, veins, and whatever soft substances we see exist and grow in a mortal body. But let it be supposed, for a moment, that these atoms of which animals consist may, though sensible and soft, remain eternal. They must then, however, either have sense as parts of animals, or be thought similar to whole animals. But it cannot be that as parts they have sense of themselves, for every part and member, if separated from the body, breaks off connection with the other senses of the other members. Nor can the hand, when dissevered from us, nor any part of the body whatsoever, retain alone the sense of the whole body. It remains, therefore, that they must resemble whole animals, so that they may be animated with vital sense throughout. But how, then, 
will it be possible for them to be called the elements of things, and avoid the paths to death, when they are of an animal nature, and, existing themselves in perishable animals, are one and the same with them? Yet if we allow that primordial atoms, though imperishable, may nevertheless be endowed with sense, they will necessarily in that case produce nothing but a crowd and multitude of animals, just as men, cattle, and wild beasts would be unable to produce by combination severally among themselves anything but men, cattle, and wild beasts. How then could things inanimate as trees and metals be produced? It is only on this supposition, accordingly, viz. that they can generate nothing but sentient beings, that we should be obliged, as far as we see, to allow primordial atoms to be sentient. But if, perhaps, you say that the primordial atoms being, as you think, sentient, lay aside, in combination, their own proper sense, and take another, what need was there, in that case, that that should be assigned to them, which is afterwards taken away? And besides, to recur to an illustration to which we had recourse before, inasmuch as we see eggs of animals changed into birds, and worms spring forth when a kind of putrescence from immoderate rains has affected the ground, we know that animals having senses may be produced from objects without senses. But if any one, perchance, shall say that sentient beings may certainly arise from senseless atoms, but that this must be effected by some change which takes place in those atoms, as from some new birth, before the sentient being which they constitute is brought forth into existence, it will be sufficient to explain and prove to him that no birth ever takes place, unless from some combination previously formed, and that no change is effected without a combination of primordial atoms. For no senses of any animal body can exist before the substance itself of the animal is formed, and this is evident inasmuch as senseless matter is kept dispersed throughout the air, rivers, earth, and things produced from the earth. Nor, though it may have united, has it so united as to engender in itself those concordant vital motions, but which the all-observing senses of animals, being generated, direct and preserve every living creature. Besides, a blow inflicted, if heavier than nature can endure, strikes down any animal at once, and has the effect of confounding all sense of the body and of the mind. For the positions and connections of the atoms are dissolved, and the vital motions are utterly impeded, until, at last, the matter of the body, suffering concussion in every member, unlooses from the body the vital ties of the soul, and drives it forth, scattered abroad through every outlet. For what more can we suppose that an inflicted blow can do, than shake to pieces and dissolve the several elements that were previously united? It also happens that when a blow is inflicted with less violence, the remains of vital motion often prevail, prevail, I say, over the effects of it, and calm the violent disorders occasioned by the stroke, and recall everything again into its proper channel, and thus dispel, as it were, the movement of death, when asserting its power in the body, and revive the senses when almost lost and overcome. For under what influence, if not under this revival of the sentient motions, can bodies return to life, the mind being re-established, even from the very threshold of dissolution, rather than depart and pass away to the bourne, to which they had almost accomplished their course? Furthermore, since pain happens when the principles of matter in any living body, disturbed by any force throughout the viscera or the limbs, are agitated in their situations within, and driven from their proper places. And since an agreeable pleasure succeeds when they return into their places, it is but right to infer 
that primordial atoms can be affected with no pain and enjoy no pleasure of themselves for they being primary bodies do not consist of those combinations of primary bodies the motions of which suffer pain or receive enjoyment of gentle pleasure from alteration primordial atoms therefore must not be considered as endowed with any sense whatever besides if in order that animals may severally have sense sense is also to be attributed to their primary elements then forsooth the elements of which the human race is peculiarly constituted both laugh shaking their sides with tremulous cachinnation and sprinkle their faces and cheeks with distilling tears they moreover can tell much of the mixture of bodies and inquire besides what are their own elements for as they resemble entire men compounded of elements they themselves must also be compounded of other elements and these others must be composed of others again so that reckoning thus you would never make a stop but go on to infinity for i shall pursue the argument and demand that whatever you shall admit to speak and laugh and understand must consist of other elements exercising the same powers but if we plainly see such reasoning to be absurd and insane and if a being can laugh that is compounded of elements which do not laugh and can understand and render a reason in intelligible words though he be not compounded of intelligent and eloquent seminal principles why may not all those creatures which we observe to be sentient around us be compounded of seminal atoms wholly destitute of sense finally we are all sprung from celestial seed the father of all is the same ether from which when the bountiful earth has received the liquid drops of moisture she being impregnated produces the rich crops and the joyous groves and the race of men produces all the tribes of beasts since she supplies them food by means of which they all support their bodies and lend a pleasant life and propagate offspring on which account she has justly obtained the name of mother that also which first arose from the earth returns back into the earth and that which was sent down from the regions of the sky the regions of the sky again receive when carried back to them nor does death so put an end to things as to destroy the atoms of matter but only disunites their combinations and produces new unions of particles and is the cause that all things so change their forms and vary their colours and receive perception and in a moment of time yield it up again so that you may understand it to be of the greatest importance with what elements and in what position and connection the same primordial atoms of things are combined and what impulses they mutually give and receive nor suppose that the primary particles of things cannot remain eternal because we see them fluctuate upon the surface of things and sometimes apparently born and suddenly perish as even in these very verses of mine it is of great consequence with what letters and in what order other letters are severally placed for the same letters variously selected and combined signify heaven sea earth rivers sun the same signify corn groves animals if the words are not all yet by far the greater part are alike at least so far as to have some letter or letters in common but the subjects which they express are distinguished by the different arrangements of the letters to form the words so likewise even in things themselves when the intervals passages connections weights impulses collisions movements order position and configurations of the atoms of matter are interchanged the things which are formed from them must also be changed give your attention now closely 
to the conclusions of just reasoning from what we have previously stated, for a new doctrine presses earnestly to approach your ear, and a new scene of things to display itself. But neither is anything so easy or credible as that it may not seem rather difficult of belief at first, nor likewise is there anything so great or anything so admirable at first, at which all men alike do not by degrees less and less wonder. In the first place, consider the bright and pure colour of the sky, and that which the stars, wandering in all directions, contain in themselves, and the resplendency from brilliancy of light of the moon and the sun, all which objects, if they were now first apparent to mortal eyes, if they were, I say, now first presented to them unexpectedly and suddenly, what could be mentioned, which would be more wonderful than these phenomena, or which the nations of the world could less presume, beforehand, to believe would exist? Nothing, as I conceive, so wonderful to men would this scene of things have been, for the sake of which no man, you may observe, now deems to look up to the bright regions of the sky, every one being listless from Seichi of viewing it. Wherefore, forbear, though being alarmed at mere novelty, to reject any argument or opinion from your mind, but rather weigh it with severe judgment, and, if it seem to you to be just, yield your assent to it, or, if it be false, gird up your loins to oppose it. For since the sun of space, abroad beyond these walls of our world, is, as I have proved, infinite, my mind proceeds to make inquiry what there exists farther onwards, in those parts into which the mind perpetually longs to look, and into which the free effort of thought itself earnestly desires to penetrate. The first point which I advance is, that in every direction around us, and on all sides, above and below, there is no limit through the whole of space, as I myself have demonstrated, and as truth itself spontaneously proclaims, and the nature of the profound itself makes clear as light. But by no means can it be thought probable, when infinite space lies open in every quarter, and when seminal atoms, of incomputable number and unfathomable sum, driven about by everlasting motion, fly through the void in infinite ways, that this one globe of the earth and this one heaven have been alone produced, and that those innumerable particles of matter do nothing beyond our sphere, especially when this world was made by merely natural causes, and the atoms of things jostling about of their own accord in infinite modes, often brought together confusedly, ineffectually, and to no purpose, at length successfully coalesced. At least such of them as, thrown together suddenly, became in succession the beginnings of great things, of the earth, the sea, the heaven, and the race of animals. For which reason, it is irresistibly incumbent on you to admit that there are other combinations of matter in other places, such as is this world, which the ether holds in its vast embrace. Further, when abundance of matter is ready, and space is at hand, and when no object or cause hinders or delays, things must necessarily be generated and brought into being. And now, if there is such a vast multitude of seminal atoms as the whole age of all living creatures would not suffice to number, and if there remains the same force and nature that can throw together the atoms of things into every part in the same manner as they have been thrown together into this, you must necessarily suppose that there are other orbs of earth in other regions of space, and various races of men, and generations of beasts. To this is to be added, that in the whole of our world there is no one thing which is produced single, 
and grows up alone and by itself, but that every thing is of some class, and that there are many individuals in the same kind. Thus, among animals especially, you will, by your own observation, see this to be the case as to the brood of wild beasts that range over the mountains. You will find the same as to the race of men, male and female, the same, moreover, as to the mute swarms of fishes, and all the kinds of birds. Wherefore it is to be admitted that, in like manner, the heaven and the earth, and the sun, the moon, the sea, and other things which exist, are not single, but rather of infinite number, since these follow the same general law as other things that arise and decay, the limit of existence, deeply and unalterably fixed, awaits these parts of nature as well as others, and they consist as much of a natural body, generated but to die, as the whole race of animals which abound, in their several kinds, in this state of things. Which points, if, being well understood, you keep in mind and reason from them, the system of nature immediately appears, as a free agent, released from tyrant masters, to do everything itself, of itself, spontaneously, without the help of the gods. For, O ye sacred bosoms of the deities, that pass in tranquil peace a calm and most serene existence, who is able to rule the world of this immense universe? Who can hold in his hand, with power to guide them, the strong reins of this vast combination of things? What God can, at the same time, turn round all the heavens and warm all the earth with ethereal fires? Or what God can be, at the same moment, present in all places, to produce darkness with clouds, and shake the calm regions of heaven with thunder, and then to hurl bolts and overturn, as often happens, his own temples, or, afterwards, retiring to the desert and uninhabited parts of the earth, to rage there, exercising that weapon with which he often misses the guilty, and kills the innocent and undeserving. And after the time when the world was produced, and the natal day of the sea, and the rise of the earth and the sun, atoms were added from without, seeds which the vast whole, by agitation, contribution, were conjoined, whence the sea and the earth had the means of increase, and whence the mansion of the sky amplified its vastness, and raised its lofty vaults far above the earth, and the air rose higher and higher. For to every body in nature, from all regions of space, are contributed, by the agitation of particles, its own proper atoms, and they betake themselves severally to their own kinds of matter. The particles of moisture pass to water, the earth is increased with atoms of earth, and the fiery principles produce fire and the aerial air, until, as such operations proceeded, nature, the perfectress and parent of the world, brought all things to the utmost limit of growth, as happens when that which is received into the vital passages is no more in quantity than that which flows away and passes off. In these circumstances, the age and growth of all things must be at a stand. Here, nature, by her own influence, restrains further increase. For whatsoever creatures you see enlarge themselves to a full and lively bulk, and climb by degrees the steps to a mature age, receive into themselves more atoms than they emit, whilst the nourishment is readily distributed through the veins, and whilst their bodies are not so widely dilated as to expel many, that is, a disproportionate number of particles, and to cause the waste to be greater than the food on which their life sustains life. For certainly we must admit that many atoms flow off and pass away from bodies, but, till they have reached the highest point of growth, more ought to accrue to them. 
from that point age reduces by degrees their mature force and strength and melts away and sinks down to its decline since the larger any creature is at the time when its increase is stopped and the greater is its extent of surface the more atoms it disperses and emits from itself in all directions around nor is the whole of its food readily distributed through its veins nor is there sufficient nourishment generated from the food in proportion to the effluvia which the body discharges whence as much support as is necessary can arise and be supplied to it and whence nature can recruit what is requisite bodies therefore naturally decay as they are wasted by their substance passing off and as all things yield to external attacks for food at last fails to support advanced age and hostile atoms striking externally cease not to exhaust every creature and subdue it with assaults so likewise the walls of the great world being assailed around shall suffer decay and fall into mouldering ruins for if things are kept in vigour it is nourishment that must recruit them all by renewal and it is nourishment that must support nourishment that must sustain all but it is in vain to expect that this frame of the world will last for ever for neither do its veins so to speak submit to receive what is sufficient for its maintenance nor does nature minister as much aliment as is needed and thus even now the age of the world is debilitated and the earth which produced all races of creatures and gave forth at a birth vast forms of wild animals now being exhausted scarcely rears a small and degenerate offspring the earth i say which produced all creatures for it was not as i conceive a golden chain from above that let down the tribes of mortals from heaven into the fields nor did the sea or the waves that beat the rocks produce them but the same earth which now nourishes them from her own substance generated them at first moreover the earth herself of her own accord first produced for mortals rich crops and joyous vineyards she herself supplied sweet herbs over the abundant pastures which now scarcely reach a full growth though assisted and augmented by our toil we both wear out our oxen and exhaust the strength of our husbandmen being scarcely supplied with fruits from our slowly yielding fields to such a degree do the productions of the earth decline and increase only with human labour and in these days the sturdy ploughman shaking his head sighs that his great toil has too often fallen out in vain and when he compares the present times to the times past frequently praises the good fortune of his forefather the planter of the degenerate vine also sad and fatigued accuses the progress of time and wearies heaven with prayers for better seasons and often remarks how the ancient race of men full of piety spent their lives happily within narrow limits when the portion of land cultivated formerly by each individual was much less than at present nor does his untaught mind understand that all things exhausted by a long course of time gradually waste away and pass to their grave end of section six Section 7 of On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 7. Book 3, Part 1. O thou who from so great darkness was first able to raise so effulgent a light, shedding a lustre on the blessings of life. Thee, O glory of the Greek nation, 
I follow, and now place the steps of my feet formed upon thy impressed traces, yet not because I am so eager to rival, as because, from the love which I feel for thee, I desire to imitate thee. For why should the swallow contend with swans, or what that is all similar, can kids with trembling limbs and the strong vigour of the horse perform in the race? Thou, O Father, art the discoverer of truths. Thou suppliest to us paternal precepts, and from thy writings, O illustrious teacher, as bees gather from all blossoms in the flowery glades, so we feed upon thy golden words. Golden, I say, and most worthy of perpetual existence. For as soon as thy system of philosophy began to proclaim aloud the nature of things, as it arose in thy divine intellect, the terrors of the mind disperse, the walls of the world open, I see things conducted throughout the mighty void of space, the calm divinity of the gods appears, and their tranquil abodes, which neither winds disturb, nor clouds sprinkle with showers, nor snow falling white, congealed with sharp frost, inconveniences. But the pure air is always cloudless, and smiles with widely effulgent light. To them, moreover, nature supplies all things, nor does any cause at any time diminish the tranquillity of their minds. But the regions of Acheron, on the other hand, are nowhere apparent, nor does the dark earth hinder but that all things, whatever are done beneath our feet throughout the void, may be seen and contemplated. Under the influence of these wonders disclosed there, a certain divine pleasure and dread penetrates me, amazed that nature, thus manifestly displayed by thy power, has been in all parts revealed to us. And since I have shown of what kind the primordial atoms of all things are, and how, differing in their various forms, and actuated by motion from all eternity, they fly through the void of space of their own accord, and since I have also demonstrated by what means all individual things may be produced from them, the nature of the mind and of the soul now seems, next to these subjects, proper to be illustrated in my verses, and there must be driven utterly from our minds that fear of Acheron which disturbs human life from its very foundation, suffusing all things with the blackness of death, nor allows any pleasure to be pure and uncontaminated. For as to what men often say, that diseases and a life of infamy are more to be feared than Tartarus, the successor of death, and that they know the consistence of the soul to be of the nature of blood, or even of breath, if their inclination happen to lead them to such an opinion, and have no need at all of our reasoning and instruction, you may perceive, for the reasons that follow, that all these observations are thrown out more for the sake of praise and vainglory than because the belief itself is settled in their minds, for the very same boasters, exiled from their country, and driven far from the sight of man, disgraced with foul guilt and afflicted with all calamities, yet still continue to live, and whithersoever, notwithstanding, the unhappy men have come, they offer sacrifices to the dead, as if their souls were still in existence, and immolate black cattle, and send oblations to the Dei Manes, and, in their calamitous circumstances, apply their minds much more zealously to religion than before. For which reason it is more satisfactory to contemplate a person, in order to judge of his character, in doubtful dangers, and to learn what he is in adverse circumstances, since words of truth are then at least elicited from the bottom of the heart, and the mask is taken away while the reality of the man remains. Furthermore, avarice and the blind desire of honours, which drive men to transgress the bounds of right, and sometimes, as the accomplices and ministers of crimes, to strive night and day with excessive labour to rise to the height of power, these passions, I say, which are the wounds and plagues of life, are nourished for the most part by the dread of death. For, in general, infamous contempt 
and sharp poverty seem removed from a pleasing and secure state of life, and seem to dwell, as it were, before the very gates of destruction, from which cause, while men, not submitting to die to avoid those evils, but restrained by a false terror of death and its consequences, wish that they may escape far and remove themselves to a distance, from disgrace and want, they increase their property with civil bloodshed, and greedily double their riches, heaping slaughter on slaughter, they cruelly rejoice at the sad end of a brother, and hate and dread the tables of their relations. From the same terror, in like manner, envy often wastes men away. They grieve that he who walks before them in shining honour should be powerful, should be looked upon with respect. They complain that they themselves are tossed about in obscurity and dishonour. Some pine to death for the sake of statues and a name, and often to such a degree from the fear of death does the hatred of life and of seeing the light affect men that with a despairing mind they commit self-murder, forgetting that this fear is the source of all cares, that this violates modesty, that this bursts the bonds of friendship. This, in fine, prompts mortals to overthrow piety and virtue, for men have often betrayed their country and their dear parents while seeking to avoid the regions of Acheron, since as children tremble and fear everything in thick darkness, so we, in the light, fear sometimes things which are not more to be feared than those which children dread and imagine about to happen in the dark. This terror of the mind, therefore, is not the rays of the sun or the bright arrows of day, that must dispel, but the contemplation of nature and the exercise of reason. First, then, I say that the mind, which we often call the intellect, in which is placed the conduct and government of life, is not less an integral part of man himself than the hand and foot and eyes are portions of the whole animal. Although, indeed, a great number of philosophers have thought that the sense of the mind is not placed in any certain part, but is a kind of vital habit, a resulting power of the body, called by the Greeks a harmony, which causes us to live endowed with a mental sense, though the mind is situate in no particular part of us. As frequently, when good health is said to be a sensation of the body, and yet this health is itself no portion of the person that enjoys health, so those philosophers place the sense of the mind in no particular part of the person, in which hypothesis they seem to wander far astray. For frequently the body, which is openly seen, is diseased and dejected, while we nevertheless feel pleasure in the other part, which is hid within us. And, on the other hand again, it often happens that the reverse is the case, when he who is wretched in mind is well in his whole body, just in the same way as if, when the foot of a sick man is pained, his head, in the meantime, happened to be in no pain at all. Besides, when the limbs are resigned to gentle sleep, and the body, heavy with slumber, lies stretched without sense, there is yet something else within us, which, at that very time, is agitated in diverse ways, and admits into itself all the affections of joy, and all the empty solicitudes of the heart, and now also that you may be further convinced that the soul is actually one among our members and is not one to hold or occupy the body as a harmony it happens in the first place you may observe that even when much of the body is taken away the life nevertheless often remains in the members that are left and again the same life when a few atoms of the heat of the body have dispersed and air has been sent forth through the mouth immediately quits the veins and relinquishes possession of the bones, so that you may conclude from hence that all particles of the body have not equal parts and powers, but that those which are the constituent atoms of air and quickening heat exercise more influence than others, that life may dwell and be retained in the members. The vital heat, therefore, and air, which desert our limbs when dying, are existent in the body itself, and form a part of it, for which reason, since the nature of the mind and the soul is thus found to exist as a part of man, 
give back to these philosophers their name of harmony, whether brought down by musicians from lofty Helicon, or whether they themselves took it from any other quarter, and transferred it to that object which then wanted a distinctive appellation. Whatsoever is the case, let them have it to themselves. Listen thou to the rest of my arguments. I now affirm that the mind and soul are held united with one another, and form of themselves one nature or substance, but that that which is, as it were, the head, and which rules in the whole body, is the reason, the thinking or intellectual part, which we call mind and understanding, and this remains seated in the middle portion of the breast, for here dread and terror throb, around these parts joys soothe, here therefore is the understanding and mind. The other part of the soul, or vital power, distributed through the whole body, obeys and is moved according to the will and impulse of the mind, and this rational or intellectual part thinks of itself alone, and rejoices for itself, at times when nothing of the kind moves either the rest of the soul or the body. And as when the head or the eye, when pain affects it, is troubled in us, and as part of us, but we are not afflicted throughout the whole body, so the mind is sometimes grieved itself alone, and is sometimes excited with joy, when the other part of the soul, diffused through the limbs and joints, is stimulated by no new sensations. But when the mind is more than ordinarily shaken by violent terror, we see the whole soul, throughout the several members, sympathize with it, and perspirations and paleness, in consequence, arise over the whole body, and the tongue rendered powerless, and the voice die away, while we find the eyes darkened, the ears ringing, and the limbs sinking underneath. Furthermore, we often see men faint altogether from terror of mind, so that any one may easily understand from this that with the mind is united the soul, which, when it has been acted upon by the power of the mind, then influences and affects the body. This same course of reasoning teaches us that the nature or substance of the mind and soul is corporeal. For when this nature or substance is seen to impel the limbs to rouse the body from sleep, and to change the countenance, and to guide and turn about the whole man, of which effects we see that none can be produced without touch, and that touch, moreover, cannot take place without body, must we not admit that the mind and soul are of a corporeal nature? Besides, you see that the mind suffers with the body, and sympathizes for us with the body. Thus, if the violent force of a dart driven into the body, the bones and nerves being divided, does not hurt the life itself, yet there follows a languor and a kind of agreeable inclination to sink to the ground, and when we are on the ground, a perturbation and giddiness which is produced in the mind, and sometimes, as it were, an irresolute desire to rise. It therefore necessarily follows that the nature of the mind is corporeal, since it is made to suffer by corporeal weapons and violence. I shall now proceed to give you a demonstration, in plain words, of what substance this mind is, and of what it consists. In the first place, I say that it is extremely subtle, and is formed of very minute atoms, and you may, if you please, give me your attention, in order that you may understand clearly that this is so, from the following arguments. Nothing is seen to be done in so swift a way, as if the mind proposes it to be done, and itself undertakes it. The mind, therefore, impels itself more speedily than anything, among all those of which the nature is manifestly seen before our eyes. But that which is so exceedingly active must consist of atoms exquisitely round and exquisitely minute, that they may be moved when acted on by a slight impulse. For water is moved and flows with so trifling a force as we see act upon it, inasmuch as it is composed of voluble and small particles. But the substance of honey, on the other hand, is more dense, and its fluid sluggish, and its movement more tardy, for its whole mass of material particles clings more closely together, because, as is evident, it consists of atoms neither so smooth nor so small and round. 
for a gentle and light breeze can make a tall heap of poppy-seed waste away, from the top to the bottom, before your eyes, but, on the contrary, can have no such effect upon a heap of stones and darts. Particles, therefore, according as they are most diminutive and most smooth, have also the greatest facility of motion. But, on the other hand, whatever particles are found of a greater weight and rougher surface are so much the more fixed and difficult to move. Since, therefore, the nature of the mind has been found preeminently active, it must of necessity consist of particles exceedingly diminutive and smooth and round, which point, being thus known to you, my excellent friend, will be found useful and be of advantage in many of your future inquiries. This fact also indicates the nature of the soul, and shows of how subtle a texture it consists, and in how small a space it would contain itself if it could be condensed, because, when the tranquil repose of death has taken possession of a man, and the substance of the mind and the soul has departed, you can there perceive nothing detracted as to appearance, nothing as to weight, from the whole body. Attend, this potent truth thou'lt well perceive, for what its point so swiftly can achieve as mind, in boundless nature what can vie with its unlimited velocity. Death leaves all things entire, except vital sense and quickening heat. It must therefore necessarily be the case that the whole soul consists of extremely small seminal atoms, connected and diffused throughout the veins, the viscera, and the nerves, inasmuch as, when the whole of it has departed from the whole of the body, the extreme outline of the members still shows itself unaltered, nor is an atom of weight withdrawn, just as is the case when the aroma of wine has flown off, or when the sweet odour of ointment has passed away into the air, or when the flavour has departed from any savoury substance. For still the substance itself does not, on that account, appear diminished to the eye, nor does anything seem to have been deducted from the weight, evidently because many and minute atoms compose the flavour and odour throughout the whole constitution of bodies. End of section 7「Section 8 of On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 8, Book 3, Part 2. Wherefore, again and again, I say, you may feel assured that the nature or substance of the mind and soul is produced from exquisitely small seminal atoms, since, when it escapes from the body, it carries away no weight with it. Nor yet is this nature or substance to be regarded by us as simple and uncompounded. For a certain subtle aura, mixed with heat, leaves dying persons. The heat, moreover, carries air with it, nor is there any heat with which air is not also mixed, since, as its substance is rare, many atoms of air must necessarily be borne with it. The substance of the mind is now therefore found to be triple. Nor yet are all these constituent parts, aura, heat, and air, sufficient to produce mental sense or power, since the mind admits none of these to be able to generate sensible motions, such as revolve any thoughts in the mind. A certain fourth nature, or substance, must therefore necessarily be added to these. This is wholly without a name. It is a substance, however, than which nothing exists more active or more subtle, nor is anything more essentially composed of small and smooth elementary particles. And it is this substance which first distributes sensible motions through the members. For, being formed of small atoms, it is itself first excited, then the heat, and the secret power of the aura, receive motion from it. Next the air, and afterwards all parts, are quickened. The blood is agitated, and all the viscera partake in the sensation, and, whether it be pleasure or whether it be the contrary feeling, 
it is communicated to the bones and marrow last of all. Nor can pain easily penetrate, or any violent evil spread, so far as this, without all parts being perturbed, so that, in such a case, room is wanting for life, and the particles of the soul fly off through all the passages of the body. But on the surface of the body, as it were, a limit is generally put to sensible motions, and from this cause we have the power to retain life within us. And now, though I would fain give a full exposition in what manner these principles are mixed one with another, and how, being arranged, they possess vigour, the poverty of my native tongue restrains me against my will. But notwithstanding, as far as I shall be able to treat of these subjects summarily, I will touch upon them. For the primordial atoms, by the motion of the elements among themselves, so actively intermingle in the substance of the soul, that no one can be separated from the rest, nor can their power become divided by any interval, but, being many, they are, as it were, the power of a single body. As, in the herd of animals, which soever you would inspect, there is a certain odour, and heat, and taste, and still from all these is composed one mass and combination of body, so heat and air and the secret power of aura and that other active force, which communicates the beginning of motion from itself to the other three, whence a sensible movement first arises through the viscera, being mixed, produce one nature or substance. For this fourth principle lies entirely hid and remains in secret within nor is anything more deeply seated within our body, and it is itself, moreover, the soul of the whole soul. As the force of the mind and the power of the soul, mixed up with our limbs and entire body, remains latent, because it is composed of small and few atoms, so this nameless force, compounded of small particles, lies concealed, and is, besides, as it were, the very soul of the whole soul, and rules throughout the whole body. In like manner it must be the case that the aura and air and heat, mixed throughout the limbs, possess their vigour one with another, and that one may possibly subside at times, or become prominent, more than the rest, but so that they may still seem to be one principle compounded of them all, and that the heat and aura by themselves, or the power of air by itself, may not, being separated from the whole, destroy and dissipate the sense. There is also that heat in the mind which it assumes in anger when it burns, and ardour gleams vividly from the eyes. There is also much cold aura, the attendant of fear, with which it produces shivering throughout the various members, and agitates the limbs. There is also that state of the air when at rest, which happens in concurrence with a tranquil breast and serene countenance but in those animals whose fierce hearts and angry feelings easily burn in wrath, there is more heat, in which class especially is the violent fury of lions, which, raging, often burst, as it were, their hearts with roaring, nor can contain within their breasts their torrents of ire. But the cold temperament of deer has more of the aura in it, and sooner excites a chill influence through the viscera, which cause a tremulous motion to arise in the limbs. But the nature of the ox subsists more on calm air, nor does the smoky torch of wrath applied to him ever irritate him to fury like that of the lion, suffusing him with a shade of thick darkness. Nor is he torpid, transfixed with the cold darts of aura, but is situate between the two natures, those of deer and fiercer lions. Thus is the race of men. Each has a certain temperament, and, though instruction may in a manner render some individuals polished, it still leaves the first traces of the nature of every mind, nor is it to be thought that vices can be so plucked out by the root, but that one man will run more readily than another into violent anger, a second will be affected somewhat sooner than another by fear, while a third will regard certain things more indulgently than is right, and in many other respects the various natures and yielding manners of men must necessarily differ, of which differences I cannot now explain the secret causes, nor find so many names for figures as there are diversities of shape in the atoms from which this variety in things arises. 
but, with reference to these subjects, I think myself competent to affirm this, that so small are the traces left of the natural principles which reason cannot remove by her dictates, that nothing hinders men from leading a life worthy of the gods. This mental nature, therefore, or compound intellectual substance, is contained in every body, and is itself the guardian of the body, and the cause of its safety, for the two, the body and soul, cohere, as it were, by common roots with one another, nor seem capable of being torn asunder without destruction to both. For, as it is impossible to separate the perfume from balls of frankincense, without the nature of it at the same time being destroyed, so it is impossible to extract the nature or substance of the mind and soul from the whole body, without all parts being dissolved. With such closely interwoven elements, from their first origin, are they endowed with common life. Nor does the power of the body or mind seem capable of having perception apart, each for itself, without the vigour of the other. But the sentient power lighted up through our viscera is conjointly produced by their common motions one with the other. Besides, the body is never produced, nor ever grows by itself, nor is it observed to retain its existence after death, or the departure of the soul from it. For it is not as when the liquid substance of water frequently throws off heat, which has been communicated to it, nor is on that account dispersed itself. Not so, I say, can the limbs, when deserted by the soul, bear the separation of the soul from them, but, thus divided from it, altogether perish and rot. For the mutual interconnections of the soul and the corporeal frame, from the very beginning of life, even in the body and secret womb of the mother, so acquire the vital movements together, that a separation cannot take place without destruction and damage to each. So that you may see that, since their means of preservation are united, the nature and substance of them must also be united. For what remains to be considered, if any one denies that the body has sense, and believes that the soul, mixed with the entire body, takes wholly upon itself that motion which we call sense, he contends against manifest and certain facts. For who will ever explain what it is for the body to have sense, if it be not that which experience itself has manifestly shown and taught us? But the soul being set free from the body, the body is void of sense in all parts, for it loses that which was not peculiar to itself in any period of its life, and it besides loses many things, as the soul is being expelled by age. To affirm, moreover, that the eyes themselves can see no object, but that the mind merely looks through them as through open doors, is difficult. When the sense of these eyes leads to a contrary opinion, for the sense of the eyes draws the mind and attracts it from within to the sights or pupils themselves. While, let it especially be considered, we are often unable to look at bright objects because our eyes are prevented by their effulgence which is not the case with regard to mere doors, for mere open doors, where we look through, do not feel any inconvenience. Besides, if our eyes are only instead of doors, the mind, when the eyes are taken out, and the doorposts themselves, so to speak, removed, seems bound to see even more clearly than before. On these points you can by no means assume as true that which the divine opinion of the philosopher Democritus lays down, namely, that the several atoms of the body and mind, applied and corresponding each to each, vary and connect the members. For not only are the atoms of the soul much more diminutive than those of which our body and viscera consist, but are also inferior in number, and are distributed thinly, with spaces between them, throughout the limbs, so that you may safely warrant that the primary particles of the soul occupy and are distributed at those intervals only, at which corporeal atoms cast upon us, and striking against us, may, if of sufficient gravity, be able to excite sensible motions through the body, the concussions being communicated from the surface to the internal parts. For neither at times do we perceive the adhesion of dust on the body, nor feel powdered chalk shaken over the limbs settle on them nor do we feel a mist at night, nor the subtle threads of the spider's web meeting us, when we are entangled in them as we go along, nor do we notice the old vesture of the same spider fall upon our head, nor feathers or birds, 
or the flying down of thistles, which, from extreme lightness, generally fall with difficulty, and strike but gently the object on which they fall. Nor do we observe the progress of every creeping animal, nor every first step of the feet, which gnats and other such insects place upon our body. So many particles in us must be moved before the primordial atoms of the soul, mixed throughout the limbs in our bodies, can feel the sensation, and, impelling one another, at how great intervals, can, in succession, strike together, meet, and rebound. And the mind is more efficient in holding the bars of life, and more prevalent to preserve vitality, than the power of the soul. For without the understanding and mind, no part of the soul can have its residence in the body, even for a small portion of time. But when the mind takes its departure, the soul readily follows as its companion, and leaves the chilled limbs in the cold of death. But he to whom understanding and mind have remained continues in life, although he be mutilated, with his limbs even cut off on all sides. The trunk, though portions of the soul be taken away around it, and it be separated from the limbs, still lives and inhales the vital air. Deprived, if not altogether, yet in a great measure, of the soul, it still delays and continues in life. So when the eye is lacerated round about, if the pupil has remained uninjured, the vivid faculty of seeing survives. But this is only provided you do not injure the entire ball of the eye, but merely cut round the pupil and leave that alone whole for such injury cannot be committed without destruction of the eyes. But if the very smallest part of the middle of the ball is perforated, though the bright orb be otherwise unharmed, the sight is at once lost and darkness follows. With such a connection the soul and the mind are constantly united. And now attend, that thou mayst understand that living creatures have minds and subtle souls, born and perishable, I will proceed to arrange verses worthy of thy life and virtues, verses collected during a long time and prepared with sweet labour. And thou, my friend, take care to include both of them under one name, whichsoever of the two I may use. And, for example, when I proceed to speak of the soul, teaching that it is mortal, suppose that I also speak of the mind, inasmuch as they are one by mutual combination, and their substance is united. In the first place, since I have shown that the soul, being subtle, consists of minute particles, and is composed of much smaller atoms than the clear fluid of water, or mist, or smoke, for it far surpasses those bodies in susceptibility of motion, and is more readily impelled when acted upon from a slight cause, inasmuch as both the mind and soul are moved by the mere images of smoke and mist, as when, lulled in sleep, we see high altars exhale with vapour and carry up smoke, since doubtless these phantasms are produced in us. Now, therefore, I say, since when vessels are broken to pieces you see water flow about and any other liquid run away, and since also mist and smoke disperse into the air, you must conclude that the soul is likewise scattered abroad and is dissipated much sooner than mist and smoke and more easily resolved into its original elements, when it has once been withdrawn from the body of a man, and has taken its departure. For how can you believe that this soul can be held together by any combination of air, when the body itself, which is, as it were, its vessel, cannot contain it, if it be convulsed by any violence, or rendered thin and weak by blood being taken from the veins? How can that air which is more rare than our body confine it, Besides, we observe that the mind is produced together with the body, and grows up along with it, and waxes old at the same time with it. For as children wander and totter about with a weak and tender body, so the subtle sense of the mind follows and corresponds to the weakness of their frame. Then, when their age has grown up in robust vigour, their understanding is also greater, and their strength of mind more enlarged. Afterwards, when the body is shaken by the prevailing power of the time, and the strength being depressed, the limbs have sunk into infirmity, the understanding then halts, the tongue and the mind lose their sense, all parts fail and fade away at once. It is therefore natural that the whole substance of the soul should be dissolved as smoke 
into the sublime air of heaven, since we see that it is produced together with the body, and grows up together with it, and both, as I have shown, overcome by age, decay in concert. To this is added that as we observe the body itself to be subject to violent diseases and severe pain, so we see the mind to be susceptible of sharp cares and grief and fear, for which cause it is reasonable that it should also be a partaker of death. Moreover, the mind, in diseases of the body, often wanders distracted, for it loses its faculties and utters senseless words, and sometimes, by a heavy lethargy, is borne down into a deep and internal sleep, the eyes and the nodding head sinking, hence it neither hears the voice nor can distinguish the countenances of those who stand around recalling it to life, bedewing their faces and cheeks with tears." Wherefore you must necessarily admit that the mind is also dissolved, since the contagion of disease penetrates into it. For pain and disease are each the fabricator of death, a truth which we have been taught by the destruction of many millions in past times. Further, when the violent power of wine has penetrated the heart of men, and its heat, being distributed, has spread into the veins, a heaviness of the limbs follows, the legs of the tottering person are impeded, the tongue grows torpid, the mind is, as it were, drowned, the eyes swim, noise, hiccups, and quarrels arise, and other things of this kind, whatever are consequent on intoxication. Why do these effects happen, unless, because the vehement force of the wine has exerted its customary power to disturb the soul, as it is diffused through the body itself? But whatsoever things can be thus disturbed and obstructed in their operations show that if a cause somewhat stronger shall spread within them, the consequence will be that they must perish, deprived of all future existence. Moreover, frequently, overcome by the force of disease, a person suddenly falls down before our eyes, as if struck by the blow of a thunderbolt, and foams at the mouth, groans and trembles in his joints, loses his senses, stretches his nerves to rigidity, is distorted, pants with irregular breathing, and wearies his limbs with tossing about. Evidently, because the violence of the malady, dispersed throughout the body, and acting upon the soul, perturbs it, as the waves on the foaming salt ocean boil with the strong fury of the winds. Groans are then forced out, because the limbs are seized with pain, and especially because the particles of the voice are drawn forth, and carried, collected in a body, out of the mouth, the way by which they have, as it were, been accustomed to pass, and where the course of the road is paved for them. Loss of understanding takes place, because the united power of the mind and soul is disturbed, and, as I have shown, is divided and rent asunder, distracted by that same distemper. Afterwards, when the cause of the disease has given way, and the violent humour of the disordered body has retired into its hiding-place, then, as if staggering, the person first rises, and, by degrees, returns to all his senses, and repossesses the right state of his soul. When these substances, therefore, the mind and the soul, are shaken with such powerful diseases in the body itself, and suffer, distracted in such miserable ways, why do you conceive that the same mind and soul can support an existence without a body, in the open air, and amidst strong winds? And since we see that the mind may be healed, like a sick body, and wrought upon by means of medicine, this also signifies that the mind exists only as a mortal substance. For whoever attempts and commences to change the mind, or to alter any other nature or substance whatsoever, it is requisite either that he add new parts, or transpose the parts in a new order, or take away at least some small portion from the whole. But any substance which is immortal neither allows its parts to be transposed, nor to be increased by addition, nor permits an atom to pass away from them. For whatever, being changed, goes beyond its own limits, this change is forthwith the death or termination of that which it was before. The mind, therefore, whether it be diseased, or whether it be wrought upon by medicine, exhibits, as I have demonstrated, mortal symptoms, 
so far is the force of true reason seen to oppose false reasoning, and to cut off escape from him who shrinks from its conclusions, and to overthrow what is wrong by a double refutation. Furthermore, we often see a man decay by degrees, and lose his vital power in one limb after another. On the feet we observe the toes and nails first grow livid, then the feet themselves and the legs mortify. Afterwards, throughout the other limbs, we perceive the traces of cold death thence proceed step by step. And since the substance of the soul is thus divided and does not continue, always and at the same time entire and unimpaired, it must be deemed mortal. But if perchance you think that the soul can itself contract itself internally throughout the limbs, and condense its parts into one place, and thus withdraw feeling from all the members successively, yet in such a case that place in which so great a mass of soul is collected ought to seem in possession of greater feeling but since this place of such increased feeling is nowhere apparent the soul as we said before is evidently being separated into parts scattered abroad and therefore perishes moreover if we even consent to grant that which is false and to allow that the soul may be thus concentrated in the bodies of those who leave light and life by dying part after part, you must still confess that the soul is mortal, for neither is it of any importance whether it perishes, being scattered throughout the air, or loses its sense when drawn together from being dispersed in its several parts, when animation steals away from the whole man more and more on all sides, and less and less of life is everywhere left and as the mind is one single part of a man, and remains fixed in a certain place, as the ears and eyes are, and the other organs of sense, whatsoever govern life, and as the hand and the eye or nose, when detached from us, cannot, separately of themselves, have sensation, or even existence, for, when cut off, they are in a short time wasted with putrefaction, so the mind cannot of itself exist without the body, and the man himself, which body seems to be, as it were, its vessel, or whatsoever else you would imagine to be more closely united with it, since it adheres to the body by connection. Further, the animated powers of the body and mind are vigorous and enjoy life only when joined with one another, for neither can the nature or substance of the mind, without the body, alone, and of itself, produce vital motions, nor again can the body, deprived of the soul, continue its state of existence and use its faculties. Just, for example, as the eye itself, torn from its roots, can discern no object apart from the whole body, so the mind or soul seems to have no power in itself, evidently because when mingled throughout the veins and viscera, throughout the nerves and bones, they are held in close confinement by the whole body, and their primary particles, not being free, cannot fly asunder to great distances. Consequently, being thus confined, they move with sensitive motions, with which, after death, when cast forth beyond the body into the air of heaven, they cannot move, for this very reason that they are not held confined in a similar manner. For surely the air forms body and soul. If the soul shall be able to keep itself together in the air, and to contain itself for exerting those motions, which it before exercised amidst the nerves, and in the body itself. On which account, I say again and again, you must necessarily admit that when the whole enclosure of the body is dissolved, and the vital breath cast forth, the sentient existence of the mind and the soul is dissolved, since there is common cause and like fate to both. Besides, when the body cannot bear the dissociation of the soul without putrefying with offensive odour, why do you doubt but that the essence of the soul, rising from the depths and innermost parts of the body, has passed forth and has been diffused abroad like smoke, and that for this reason the body, decaying with so great a dissolution, has utterly fallen away, because the foundations have been removed from their place, and the spirits pass out through the limbs and through all the windings of the passages and ducts that are in the body, so that you may understand from many considerations that the nature or substance of the soul, being disparted, has gone out through the members of the body, and that it was dissevered within the body itself, before, 
gliding outwards, it flowed forth into the air of heaven. Moreover, whilst the soul dwells within the bounds of life, it yet frequently, when it has received a shock from some cause, seems to pass away, and presents the appearance that the mind is let loose from the whole body, and the countenance then seems to become inanimate as at the last hour, and all the relaxed members to fail the languid frame. Such is the case when it is said that the mind has been damaged, or the vital power has suffered syncope, while all is trepidation, and all are anxious to recover the last link of life. For then all the mind and power of the soul are shaken, and these, it is evident, sink with the body itself, so that a cause of somewhat greater force may bring them to dissolution. Why then do you doubt but that at the hour of death the soul driven forth at length, weak and helpless, out of the body, and being in the open air, with its covering removed, can not only not endure throughout all time, but cannot even maintain his existence for the smallest space whatsoever. Nor does any one, when dying, appear to feel his soul go forth entire from his whole body, or come up first to his throat and to his jaws above it, but he finds that part of it which is placed in any certain portion of the body fail and decay in that part, as he is conscious of the other senses losing their power each in its own quarter. But if our soul were immortal, it would not so much complain that it suffers disillusion when dying, but would rather rejoice to pass forth abroad, and to leave its covering, as a snake delights to cast its skin, or an old stag its too long antlers. Again, why are the understanding and faculty of the mind never produced in the head, or the feet, or the hands, but remain fixed in all men alike in their peculiar seats and definite quarters, if it be not that certain spots are assigned to each part to be born in, and where each, whatever it be, may preserve its existence when born, and if it be not that such is the case with respect to the whole of the various members, so that there may nowhere arise an improper arrangement of the parts. So invariably in the operations of nature does one thing follow another, nor is fire one to be produced from rivers, or coal to be generated in fire. Besides, if the nature of the soul is immortal, and can have a sentient existence when separated from our body, we must consider it, as I suppose, to be endowed with the five senses, nor in any other way can we represent to ourselves the infernal souls as wandering on the banks of the Akron. Accordingly, painters and the past generations of writers have introduced in their compositions souls thus endowed with senses. But neither can the eyes, nor the nostrils, nor the hand itself preserve existence apart from the soul, nor can the tongue nor can the ears perceive hearing, or even remain in being, apart from the soul. How, then, can souls be possessed of the five senses, when all the organs of those senses have perished? And since we see that the vital sense spreads through the whole body, and that the whole is animated, if, on a sudden, any violence shall cut through the body in the middle, so as to sever the two parts asunder, the substance of the soul, also, without doubt, being disunited and divided together with the body, will be dispersed and scattered abroad. But that which is divided and separates into any parts evidently shows that it has not an ever-during nature. People relate that chariots armed with scythes, warm with promiscuous slaughter, often cut off limbs with such suddenness that the part which, being severed, has fallen from the body, is seen to quiver on the ground, when, notwithstanding, the mind and spirit of the man, from the quickness of the wound, cannot feel any pain. And because, at the same time, the mind, in the ardour of battle, is given up to action, it pursues fighting and slaughter with the remainder of the body. Nor is one man aware, frequently, in the midst of the horses, that the wheels and amputating scythes have carried away his left hand, which is lost together with its defence nor is another conscious, while he climbs the wall and presses forward, that his right hand has dropped off. A third next attempts to rise after having lost his leg, while his dying foot close by him moves its toes on the ground. And the head of a fourth, severed from the warm and living trunk, 
keeps, while lying on the ground, its look of life and its eyes open, until it has yielded up all remains of the soul within it. Moreover, if, when the tongue of a serpent vibrates against you, and his tail and long body threaten you, you may feel inclined to cut both tail and body into several parts with your sword, you will see all the parts separately, cut through with the recent wound, writhe about, and sprinkle the earth with blood, and you will observe the forepart turning backward, seeking itself, that is, the hinder part of the body, with its mouth, so that, pierced with the burning anguish of the wound, it may seize it with its teeth. Shall we then say that there are entire souls in all those several parts? But from that position it will follow that one living creature has several souls in its single body. And since this is absurd, we must admit, therefore, that that has been divided which was one with the body. Wherefore both must be thought to be mortal, since both are equally divided into several portions. Besides, if the nature of the soul exists imperishable and is infused into men at their birth, why are we unable to remember the period of existence previously spent by us, nor retain any traces of past transactions? For if the power of the mind is so exceedingly changed that all remembrance of past things has departed from it, that change, as I think, is not far removed from death itself. For which reason you must of necessity acknowledge that whatever soul previously existed has perished, and that that which exists for the present has been produced for the present. Again, if after the body is completely formed, the vital power of the soul is wont to be introduced into us at the very time when we are born, and when we cross the threshold of life, it would not be in accordance with this that it should seem, as it now seems, to have grown up in the blood itself together with the body, and with its several members, but it would rather be natural that it should live alone, as in a cage, by itself and for itself, though in such a manner that the whole body, by its influence, should abound with sense and vitality. For which reason, I say again and again, we must neither think that souls are without beginning, nor that they are exempt from the law of death. For neither must we deem that souls, if infused into us from without, could have been so completely united with our bodies, which complete union, on the contrary, manifest experience proves to take place, for the soul is so combined with the body throughout the veins, viscera, nerves, and bones, that even the very teeth have a share of feeling, as their aching proves, and the acute pain from cold water, and the cringing of a hard pebble suddenly among our food. Nor, when they are so completely united, does it seem possible for them to come out entire, and to extricate themselves unharmed from all the nerves and bones and joints. But if still, perchance, you think that a soul, infused from without, is wont to expand itself through our limbs, yet to admit this is only to admit that every man's soul, being spread out with the body, will so much the more certainly perish with it. For that which is diffused throughout the body is dissolved with it, and therefore perishes. Being distributed, then, through all the passages of the body, as food, when it is distributed through all the members and limbs, is dissolved and takes of itself another nature, so the soul and the mind, although, under this supposition, they go whole into the body at first, yet are dissolved, like digested food, in diffusing themselves through it, while the particles are distributed, as if through tubes, into all the limbs. The particles, I say, of which is formed this substance of the mind, which now rules in our body, and which has been generated, like the new nature of food, from that which lost its consistence when it was spread throughout the limbs. For which reasons the nature or substance of the soul seems neither to have been without a natal day, nor to be exempt from death. Again, whether do any atoms of the soul remain in a dead body or not? For if any remain and exist in the body, it will not be possible for the soul to be justly accounted immortal, since when she took her departure she was diminished of some lost particles. But if, when removed, she fled with all her parts so entire that she left no atoms of her substance in the body, whence do dead carcasses, when the viscera become putrid, send forth worms? 
and whence does such an abundance of living creatures void of bones and blood swarm over the swollen limbs but if perchance you think that perfectly formed souls may be insinuated into those worms from without and if you suppose that they may pass each into its own body and yet omit to consider for what cause many thousands of souls should congregate in the place from which one soul has withdrawn this point however which you leave out of consideration is of such a nature that it seems especially worthy to be sought into and brought under examination it is proper not only to reflect i say whether souls hunt for particular atoms of worms and build for themselves carcasses in which they may dwell or whether they infuse themselves into bodies already made but also to consider that there is no reason to be given why they should make bodies or why they should labour at all for while they are without a body they fly about undisturbed by diseases and cold and hunger since it is the body that rather labours under these maladies as well as from death and the soul suffers all evils from contact with it but nevertheless let it be as advantageous as you please for these souls to make a body which they may enter there seems however to be no means by which they may make it it is fair therefore to conclude that souls do not make for themselves bodies and limbs nor yet is there a possibility as it appears that they can be infused into bodies perfectly formed for neither under that supposition can they be exactly fitted together nor will their mutual motions be carried on with sympathy furthermore why does violent rage attend upon the sullen breed of lions and craft upon that of foxes and why is flight communicated to stags from their sires and why does hereditary fear add speed to their limbs and as to other qualities of this sort why do they all generate in the body and temperament from the earliest period of life if it be not because a certain disposition of mind grows up together with each body from its own seed and stock but if the soul were immortal and were accustomed as pythagoreans think to change bodies surely animals would gradually alter and grow of mixed dispositions the dog of hyrcanian breed would often flee from the assault of the horned stag the hawk flying through the air of heaven would tremble at the approach of the dove men would lose their understanding and the savage tribes of wild beasts become reasonable for that which some assert namely that an immortal soul is altered by a change of body is advanced upon false reasoning as that which is altered loses its consistence and therefore perishes since the parts are transposed and depart from their original arrangement wherefore the parts of the soul under this hypothesis must also be subject to dissolution throughout the limbs so that finally they may all perish together with the body but if they shall say that the souls of men always migrate into human bodies i shall nevertheless ask why a soul from being wise in a wise body should possibly become foolish in the body of a fool why no child is found discreet or informed with a soul of mature understanding and why no foal of a mare is as skilful in his paces as the horse of full vigour why i say is this if it be not because a certain temper of mind grows up with each body from its own seed and stock these philosophers forsooth will take refuge in the assertion that the mind becomes tender in a tender body but if this be the case you must admit that the soul is mortal since being so exceedingly changed in its new body it loses its former vitality and powers or in what way will the vigour of a soul strengthened in concert with each particular body be able to reach with it the desired flower of mature age unless it shall be joined to it in its first origin or with what motive does the soul go forth from limbs that are grown old does it fear to remain imprisoned in a decaying carcass lest it should decay with it or is it afraid lest its tenement shaken with a long course of life should fall and overwhelm it but to that which is immortal there are no such dangers moreover to imagine that souls stand ready at the amorous intercourses or parturitions of beasts to enter into the young seems exceedingly ridiculous 
it appears too absurd to suppose that immortal beings, in infinite numbers, should wait for mortal bodies, and contend emulously among themselves which shall be first and foremost to enter, unless perchance you suppose that agreements have been made among the souls that the first which shall have come flying to the body shall have first ingress, and that they may thus have no contest in strength with one another. Again, neither can a tree exist in the sky, nor clouds in the deep sea, nor can fish live in the fields, nor blood be in wood, nor liquid in stones. It is fixed and arranged where everything may grow and subsist. Thus the nature or substance of the mind cannot spring up alone without the body, or exist apart from the nerves and the blood. Whereas, if this could happen, the power of the mind might at times rather arise in the head or the shoulders, or the bottom of the heels, and might rather accustom itself to grow in any place, than to remain in the same man and in the same receptacle. But since it seems fixed and appointed also in our own body, where the soul and the mind may subsist and grow up by themselves, it is so much the more to be denied that they can endure and be produced out of the entire body. For which reason, when the body has perished, you must necessarily admit that the soul, which is diffused throughout the body, has perished with it. Besides, to join the mortal to the immortal, and to suppose that they can sympathize together, and perform mutual operations, is to think absurdly. For what can be conceived more at variance with reason, or more inconsistent and irreconcilable in itself, than that that which is mortal, joined to that which is imperishable and eternal, should submit to endure violent storms and troubles in combination with it. Furthermore, whatsoever bodies remain eternal must either, as being of a solid consistence, repel blows and suffer nothing to penetrate them that can disunite their compact parts within, such as are the primary particles of matter, the nature of which we have shown above, or they must be able to endure throughout all time, because they are free from blows or unsusceptible of them, as is a vacuum which remains intangible and suffers nothing from a stroke. Or they must be indestructible for this reason that there is no sufficiency of space round about into which their constituent substances may, as it were, separate and be dissolved, as the entire universe is eternal, inasmuch as there is neither any space without it, into which its parts may disperse, nor are there any bodies which may fall upon it and break it to pieces by a violent concussion. But, as I have shown, neither is the nature of the soul of a solid consistence, since with all compound bodies vacuum is mixed, nor is it like a vacuum itself, nor, again, are bodies wanting which, rising fortuitously from the infinite of things, may overturn this frame of the mind with a violent tempest, or bring upon it some other kind of disaster and danger. Nor, moreover, is vastness and profundity of space wanting, into which the substance of the soul may be dispersed, or may otherwise perish and be overwhelmed by any other kind of force. The gate of death, therefore, is not shut against the mind and soul. But if, perchance, the soul, in the opinion of any, is to be accounted immortal, the more on this account, that it is kept fortified by things preservative of life, or because objects adverse to its safety do not all approach it, or because those that do approach, being by some means diverted, retreat before we can perceive what injury they inflict, the notion of those who think thus is evidently far removed from just reasoning. For besides that it sickens from diseases of the body, there often happens something to trouble it concerning future events, and keep it disquieted in fear, and harass it with cares, while remorse for faults from past acts wickedly and foolishly committed torments and distresses it. Join to these afflictions the insanity peculiar to the mind, and the oblivion of all things, and add besides that it is often sunk into the black waves of lethargy. End of section 8
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 9. Book 3, Part 3. Death, therefore, is nothing, nor at all concerns us, since the nature or substance of the soul is to be accounted mortal. And as in past times we felt no anxiety when the Carthaginians gathered on all sides to fight with our forefathers, and when all things under the lofty air of heaven, shaken with the dismaying tumult of war, trembled with dread, and men were uncertain to the sway of which power everything human, by land and by sea, was to fall. So when we shall cease to be, when there shall be a separation of the body and soul of which we are conjointly composed, it is certain that to us who shall not then exist, nothing will by any possibility happen or excite our feeling, not even if the earth shall be mingled with the sea and the sea with the heaven. And even if the substance of the mind and the powers of the soul, after they have been separated from our body, still retain their faculties, it is nothing to us who subsist only as being conjointly constituted by an arrangement and union of body and soul together. Nor, if time should collect our material atoms after death and restore them again as they are now placed, and the light of life should be given back to us, would it yet at all concern us that this were done, when the recollection of our existence has once been interrupted? And it is now of no importance to us, in regard to ourselves, what we were before, nor does any solicitude affect us in reference to those whom a new age shall produce from our matter, should it again be brought together as it is at present. For when you consider the whole past space of infinite time, and reflect how various are the motions of matter, you may easily believe that our atoms have often been placed in the same order as that in which they now are. Yet we cannot revive that time in our memory, for a pause of life has been thrown between, and all the motions of our atoms have wandered hither and thither, far away from sentient movements. For he among men now living, to whom misery and pain are to happen after his death, must himself exist again in his own identity, at that very time on which the evil which he is to suffer may have power to fall. But since death, which interrupts all consciousness and prevents all memory of the past, precludes the possibility of this, and since the circumstance of having previously existed prohibits him who lived before, and with whom these calamities which we suffer might be associated, from existing a second time, with any recollection of his other life, as the same combination of atoms of which we now consist, we may be assured that in death there is nothing to be dreaded by us, that he who does not exist cannot become miserable, and that it makes not the least difference to a man when immortal death has ended his mortal life that he was ever born at all. Whenever, therefore, you see a man express concern that it should be his lot after his death either to putrefy on the ground when his body is laid aside, or to be destroyed by flames, or by the jaws of wild beasts, you may know that his mind is not in a healthy state, and that some secret disquietude as to his fate is concealed in his breast, although he may himself deny that he believes any consciousness will remain to him after death. For, as I think, he does not make good what he professes, nor speaks from conviction from which he pretends to speak nor withdraws and removes himself in thought wholly out of life, but, foolish as he is, makes something of himself still to survive. For when any one of such a character represents to himself, while alive, that birds and beasts will tear his body at death, he is seized with commiseration for himself, for neither does he at all distinguish himself dead from himself living, nor sufficiently withdraw himself from his exposed carcass but supposes it to be still himself, and standing by it in imagination, communicates to it a portion of his own feeling. Hence he is concerned that he was born mortal, nor reflects that in real death there will remain of him no other self 
which, surviving, may mourn for him that he has perished, and, standing upright, may lament that he, lying down, is torn in pieces or burnt to ashes. For if it is an evil at death to be ill-treated by the jaws and teeth of wild beasts, I do not see how it can be otherwise than unpleasant for a man being laid on a funeral pyre to burn in hot flames, or placed in honey to be suffocated, or to grow stiff with cold when he is lying on the highest flat of a gelid rock, or to be pressed down and overwhelmed with the weight of superincumbent earth. For now, men say, your pleasant home shall no more receive you, nor your excellent wife, nor shall your dear children run to snatch kisses, and touch your breast with secret delight. You will no more be able to be in flourishing circumstances, and to be a protection to your friends. Unhappily, one adverse day has taken from you, unfortunate man, all the numerous blessings of life. In such remarks they do not add this, nor now, moreover, does any regret for those things remain with you. Which truth, if men would well consider in their thoughts and adhere to it in their words, they would relieve themselves from much anxiety and fear of mind. You, for your part, says a mourner over a corpse, laid to sleep in your bed, will so remain as you are for whatever time is to come, released from all distressing griefs. But we, standing near you, shall inconsolably lament you reduced to ashes on the awful pyre, and no lapse of time shall remove our unfading sorrow from our hearts. Of him, however, who makes such lamentations, we may ask this question. If the matter of death is reduced to sleep and rest, what can there be so bitter in it that any one should pine in eternal grief for the decease of a friend? This also is often a practice among men, that when they have sat down to a feast, and hold their cups in their hands, and overshadow their faces with chaplets, they say seriously and from their hearts, This enjoyment is but short to us, little man, soon it will have passed, nor will it ever hereafter be possible to recall it. As if at their death this evil were to be dreaded above all, that parching thirst should scorch and burn up the wretches or an insatiable longing for some other thing should settle on them. Yet how different will be the fact, since not even when the mind and body are merely at rest together in sleep will any one feel concern for himself and his life, for, for our parts, our sleep might thus be eternal, nor does any care for ourselves affect us. And yet, at that season, the atoms throughout our limbs withdraw to no great distance from sensible motions, and the man who is suddenly roused from sleep quickly recollects himself. Death, then, we must consider to be of far less concern to us, if less can be than that which we see to be nothing. For a greater separation of the atoms of matter takes place in death, nor does any man awake when once the cold pause of life has overtaken him. Furthermore, if universal nature should suddenly utter a voice, and thus herself abrade any one of us, what mighty cause have you, O mortal, thus excessively to indulge in bitter grief? Why do you groan and weep at the thought of death? For if your past and former life has been an object of gratification to you, and all your blessings have not, as if poured into a leaky vessel, flowed away and been lost without pleasure, why do you not, O oh, unreasonable man, retire like a guest satisfied with life, and take your undisturbed rest with a resignation? But if those things of which you have had the use have been wasted and lost, and life is offensive to you, why do you seek to incur further trouble, which may all again pass away and end in dissatisfaction? Why do you not rather put an end to life and anxiety? for there is nothing further which I can contrive and discover to please you. Everything is always the same. If your body is not yet withered with years, and your limbs are not worn out and grown feeble, yet all things remain the same, even if you should go on to outlast all ages in living, and still more would you see them the same if you should never come to die. What do we answer to this but that nature brings a just charge against us, and sets forth in her words a true allegation. 
but would she not more justly reproach and upbraid in severe accents him who being miserable unreasonably deplores death away with thy tears wretch she might well say and forbear thy complaints but if he who is older and more advanced in years complain she may retort thus after having been possessed of all the most valuable things of life thou pinest and wasted away with age but because thou always desirest what is absent and despisest present advantages life has passed from thee imperfect and unsatisfactory and death has stood by thy head unawares and before thou canst depart content and satisfied with thy circumstances now however resign all things unsuitable to thy age and yield at once with submissive feelings to that which is stronger than thou for it is necessary and justly as i think would she address him justly would she upbraid and reproach him for that which is old driven out by that which is new always retires and it is indispensable to repair one thing out of another nor is any man consigned to the gulf of erebus or black tartarus but allowed to retire peaceably to a dreamless sleep the matter of which thou art made is wanted by nature that succeeding generations may grow up from it all which however when they have passed their appointed term of life will follow thee and so have other generations before these fallen into destruction and other generations not less certainly than thyself will fall thus shall one thing never cease to rise from another and thus is life given to none in possession but to all only for use consider also how utterly unimportant to us was the past antiquity of infinite time that elapsed before we were born this then nature exhibits to us as a specimen of the time which will be again after our death for what does there appear terrible in it does anything seem gloomy is not all more free from trouble than any sleep and of the souls likewise whatever are said to be in the profundity of acheron all the sufferings happen to ourselves not in death but in life tantalus torpid with vain terror does not as it is reported fear the huge rock impending over him in the air but such terror rather dwells with us in life a groundless fear of the gods oppresses mortals and they dread that fall which fortune may assign to each nor do vultures penetrate into titius lying in hades nor however they might search in his huge breast would they be able to find through infinite time anything to devour of however vast an extent of body he may be even though it be such as may cover with its limbs outspread not merely nine acres but the orb of the whole earth nor yet would he be able to endure eternal pain or to supply food incessantly from his own body but he is a titius among us whom lying under the influence of love the vultures of passion tear and anxious disquietude devours or whom cares with any other unbecoming feeling lacerate a sisyphus likewise is before our eyes in life who sets his heart to solicit from the people the fasces and sharp axes and always retires repulsed and disappointed for to seek power which is empty nor is ever granted and constantly to endure hard labour in the pursuit of it this is to push with effort the stone up the hill which yet is rolled down again from the summit and impetuously seeks the level of the open plain to feed perpetually moreover an ungrateful nature and to fill it with good things and never to satisfy it a kindness which the seasons of the years do to us as they come round in their course and bring their fruits and various charms whilst we notwithstanding are never satisfied with the blessings of life this is i think that which they relate of the damsels in the flower of their youth that they pour water into the punctured vessel which however can by no means be filled but also Kerberus and the furies are mentioned and privation of light and tartarus casting forth fires from his jaws objects which are nowhere nor indeed can be but there is in life an eminent dread of punishment for enormous crimes there is the prison the reward of guilt and the terrible precipitation of those who are condemned from the rock there are stripes executioners the wooden horse pitch hot iron firebrands 
and though these may be absent, yet the mind, conscious of evil deeds, feeling dread in anticipation, applies to itself stings, and tortures itself with scourges, nor sees, in the meantime, what end there can be of its sufferings, nor what can be the limit of its punishment, and fears rather lest these same tortures should become heavier at death. Hence, in fine, the life of fools becomes, as it were, an existence in Tartarus. This reflection likewise you may at times address to yourself. Even the good Ancus, as Aeneas expresses it, has deserted the light with his eyes, who was much better in many things than thou, worthless man. Besides, many other kings and rulers of affairs, who swayed mighty nations, have yielded up the ghost. And what am I better than they? He, even himself, who formerly paved a road over the vast sea, and afforded a way to his legions to pass through the deep, and taught them to walk on foot through salt gulfs, and despised the murmurs of the ocean, trampling on it with his cavalry, even he, I say, the light of life being withdrawn from him, poured forth his soul from his dying body. Scipio, the thunderbolt of war, the dread of Carthage, gave his bones to the earth, just as if he had been the meanest slave. Add to these the inventors of the sciences and the graces, add the associates of the muses, over whom the unrivalled Homer, having obtained the supremacy, has been laid to rest in the same sleep with others. When mature old age, too, gave Democritus warning that the mindful motions of his intellect were languishing, he himself, of his own accord, offered his head to death. Epicurus himself, having run through his light of life, is dead. Epicurus, who excelled the human race in genius, and threw all into the shade, as the ethereal sun, when rising, obscures the stars. Wilt thou, then, hesitate, and grudge to die, in whom, even while living and seeing, life is almost dead? Thou, who wasted the greater part of existence in sleep, and snorest waking, nor ceases to see dreams, and bearest a mind disturbed with empty terror. Nor canst thou frequently discover what evil affects thee, when, stupefied and wretched, thou art oppressed with numerous cares on all sides, and fluctuating with uncertain thought, wondrous in terror. If men could feel, as they seem to feel, that there is an oppression on their minds which wearies them with its weight, and could also perceive from what causes it arises, and whence so great a mass, as it were, of evil exists in their breasts, they would not live in the manner in which we generally see them living. For we observe them uncertain what they would have, and always inquiring for something new, and changing their place as if by the change they could lay aside a load. He who has grown weary of remaining at home often goes forth from his vast mansion, and suddenly returns, inasmuch as he perceives that he is nothing bettered by being abroad. He runs precipitately, hurrying on his horses to his villa, as if he were eager to carry succour to an edifice on fire. But as soon as he has touched the threshold of the building, he yawns, or falls heavily to sleep, and seeks forgetfulness of himself, or even, with equal haste, goes back and revisits the city. In this way each man flees from himself. But himself, as it always happens, whom he cannot escape, and whom he still hates, adheres to him in spite of his efforts, and for this reason that the sick man does not know the cause of his disease, which, if every one could understand, he would, in the first place, having laid aside all other pursuits, study to learn the nature of things, since, in such inquiries, the state of eternity, not of one hour merely, is concerned, a state in which the whole age of mortals, whatever remains after death, must continue." Besides, why does so pernicious and so strong desire of existence compel us to remain anxious in uncertain perils? A certain bound of life is fixed to mortals, nor can death be avoided, or can we exempt ourselves from undergoing it. Moreover, we are continually engaged and fixed in the same occupations, nor by the prolongation of life is any new pleasure discovered. Yet that which we desire seems, while it is distant in the future, to excel all other objects. But afterwards, when it has fallen to our lot, we covet something else, 
and thus a uniform thirst of life occupies us, longing earnestly for that which is to come. While what fate the last period may bring us, or what chance may throw in our way, or what death awaits us, still remains in uncertainty. Nor, by protecting life, do we deduct a single moment from the duration of death. We cannot diminish aught from its reign, or cause that we may be for a less period sunk in non-existence. How many generations soever, therefore, we may pass in life, nevertheless that same eternal death will still await us. Nor will he be less long out of being who terminated his life under this day's sun than he who died many months and years ago. End of section 9《Section 10 of On the Nature of Things》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric DeSigo On the Nature of Things by Lucretius Translated by John Selby Watson Section 10, Book 4, Part 1 I range over the trackless regions of the muses, trodden before by the foot of no poet. It delights me to approach the untasted fountains and to drink, and it transports me to pluck the fresh flowers and to obtain a distinguished chaplet for my head from those groves whence the muses have hitherto veiled the temples of no one. In the first place, because I give instruction concerning mighty things, and proceed to free the mind from the closely confining shackles of religion. In the second place, because I compose such lucid verses concerning so obscure a subject, affecting every thing with the grace of poetry, since such ornament, also, seems not unjustifiable or without reason. But as physicians, when they attempt to give bitter wormwood to children, first tinge the rim round the cup with the sweet and yellow liquid of honey, that the age of childhood, as yet unsuspicious, may find the lips deluded, and may in the meantime drink of the bitter juice of the wormwood, and though deceived, may not be injured, but rather, recruited by such a process, may recover strength. So now I, since this argument seems, in general, too severe and forbidding to those by whom it has not been handled, and since the multitude shrink back from it, was desirous to set forth my chain of reasoning to thee, O Memmius, in sweetly speaking Pyrian verse, and, as it were, to tinge it with the honey of the muses, if perchance, by such a method, I might detain thy attention upon my strains, until thou gainest a knowledge of the whole nature of things, and perceivest the utility of that knowledge. But since I have demonstrated of what nature the primordial atoms of all things are, and with how different figures distinguished they fly spontaneously through space, actuated by motion from all eternity, and in what manner all things may severally be produced from them, and since I have shown what is the nature of the soul, and from what substances it derives its vigor, in its connection with the body, and in what way, being separated from it, it returns to its original elements. I shall now begin to treat of another subject, which is of the greatest concern to these inquiries, namely, that there exist those shapes which we call images of things, shapes which, being separated, like membranes, from the surface of the bodies of objects, flit hither and thither through the air, and which same shapes, not only occurring to us when awake, startle our minds, but, 
also alarm us in sleep, when we often seem to behold strange forms and specters of the dead, that frequently, when we are torpid in slumber, rouse us with horror. I say that these are images thrown off the bodies of objects, that we may not, by any possibility, suppose that souls escape from Acheron, or that shades of the dead hover about among the living, or that any portion of us can be left after death when, after the body and substance of the soul have been disunited, they have suffered dissolution into their respective elements. I affirm, then, that thin shapes and figures of objects are detached from those objects, from the surface, I mean, of their bodies, shapes which are to be designated, as it were, their pellicle or bark, because each image bears the likeness and form of that object, whatsoever it be, from whose surface it is detached and seems to wander through the air. This fact any one, with however dull an intellect, may understand from what follows. In the first place, since many bodies, among objects manifest before our eyes, send off, when disunited, various particles from their substance, partly diffused and subtle, as wood discharges smoke and fire heat, and partly more close and condensed, as whenever grasshoppers in summer lay aside their thin coats, and when calves at their birth cast the membrane from the surface of their bodies, and likewise when the slippery snake puts off his garment among the thorns, for we frequently see the briars gifted with their spoils. Since these things, I say, take place, a thin image may naturally be detached from bodies, that is to say, from the extreme surface of bodies. For why those substances which are more dense should more readily fall away and recede from bodies than these shapes which are light and subtle, it is quite impossible to tell, especially when there are numberless minute particles on the surface of objects, which may be thrown off in the order in which they have lain, and keep the outline of their figure, and this so much the more easily as, being comparatively few, and placed on the outmost superficies, they are less liable to be obstructed, for assuredly, we not only see many particles discharge themselves and become detached, as we said before, from the middle and inward parts of bodies, but we observe also color itself frequently fly off from their surfaces, and this effect yellow, red, and purple curtains publicly exhibit when, stretched across the vast theaters, displayed over the poles and beams, they fluctuate with a tremulous motion. For they then tinge the assembly on the benches and the whole face of the scene beneath, the persons of senators, matrons, and gods, and vary them with their own color. And the more the walls of the theater are shut in around, so much the more all these objects within suffused with the hue of the curtains, the light of day being affected with it, smile and look gay. When the curtains, therefore, send off color from their surface, all other objects may naturally send off subtle images. For it is from the superficies that both emit. There are, therefore, we must believe, certain outlines of figures which, formed of a subtle texture, fly abroad, and which, nevertheless, cannot, at the time that they are separated from bodies, be individually discerned by the eye. Besides, if all odor, smoke, vapor, and other similar substances fly off from bodies in a scattered manner, 
it is because, while rising from within, they are, as they issue forth, broken by winding passages, nor are there any direct openings of the orifices by which they strive, as they spring up, to fly out. But, on the other hand, when a thin coat of color from the surface is thrown off, there is nothing that can scatter it, since, being placed on the very superficies, it lies in readiness to fall off unbroken. Moreover, whatever images appear to us in mirrors, in the water, and in any bright object, their substance, since they are distinguished by a form similar to their objects, must necessarily consist in forms thrown off from those objects. For why those grosser consistencies, as smoke and vapor, which many bodies obviously send forth from their substance, should more readily detach themselves and recede from objects, than those which are thin and subtle, there is no possibility of telling. There are, therefore, we may believe, thin images of the forms of bodies, and unlike those of a grosser nature, which, though no one can see them severally thrown off, yet, being thrown off and repelled by successive and frequent reflections from the flat surface of mares, strike the eye and produce sight nor can shapes of bodies be imagined by any other means to be so accurately preserved as that forms corresponding to each should be represented to us. Give me now your attention further and learn of how subtle a nature or substance an image consists. You may imagine this subtlety, in the first place, inasmuch as the primordial atoms of things are so far below our senses, and so exceedingly less than those smallest objects which our eyes first begin to be unable to distinguish. But that I may make plain to you how exquisitely diminutive the primary particles of all bodies are, listen to what I shall state in these few observations. First, there are some animals so exceedingly minute that the third part of them can by no possibility be seen. Of what size can any internal part of these creatures be imagined to be? What is the globule of their heart or of their eye? What are their members and joints? How extremely diminutive they must be! What, moreover, is the size of the several atoms of which their vital principle and the substance of their soul must necessarily consist. Do you not conceive how subtle and minute they must be? Contemplate, besides, whatever bodies exhale from their substance a powerful odor, as panacea, bitter wormwood, strong-smelling southern wood, and pungent century, any one of which, if you shall happen to shake gently, and imagine how small must be the atoms that affect your nostrils, you may then the better understand that numerous images of bodies, composed of still smaller atoms, may flit about in various ways, without force or weight, and without impression on the senses. Of which bodies how fine a part the image is, there is no one can express or give the due estimation of it in words. But lest perchance you should think that those images of objects alone wander abroad, which fly off from the objects themselves, there are others, also, which are produced spontaneously, and are combined of themselves in this sky which is called the air those images, namely, which, fashioned in various shapes, are borne along on high, and being soft in their contexture, never cease to change their figure, and to metamorphose themselves into the outlines of forms of every sort. 
This we sometimes see the clouds do, when we observe them thicken on high, and dim the serene face of the firmament, yet soothing the air, as it were, with their motion, as frequently the faces of giants seem to fly over the heaven, and to spread their shadows far and wide, sometimes huge mountains, and rocks apparently torn from those mountains, seem now to go before the sun, now to follow close behind him, then some monster seems to drag forward and to obtrude other stormy clouds. Understand now with how easy and expeditious a process these images are formed and perpetually flow off and pass away from objects, for there is always on the surface of bodies something redundant, which they may throw off, and this redundancy or outside form, when it comes in contact with certain objects, as, for example, a thin garment, passes through it, but when it strikes against rough rocks, or the substance of wood, is at once broken into fragments, so that it can present no image. But when objects which are bright and dense have stood in its way, as, above all, a looking-glass, neither of these effects happens, for neither can images pass through it like a garment, nor be divided into parts before the smooth surface has succeeded in securing its entireness. From this cause it happens that images abound among us, and, however suddenly, at any time whatsoever, you may place a mirror opposite an object, the image of it appears, so that you may conclude that filmy textures of objects and subtle shapes are perpetually flying off from the superficies of every body. Many images are therefore carried off in a short space, so that the production of these forms must naturally be thought rapid. And as the sun must send forth many rays in a short time, that all places may be constantly full of light, so, by a like process, many different images of bodies must necessarily be carried off from those bodies in a moment of time in all directions round about, since whatsoever way we turn the mirror to the figures of objects, the objects are represented in it of a correspondent form and color. Besides, at times when the state of the sky has just before been clear as possible, it becomes, with extreme suddenness, so frightfully overclouded on all sides that you might think that all the darkness had left Acheron and filled the immense vault of heaven so formidably when such a gloomy night of clouds has arisen, does the face of black terror hang over the earth from above. Of which clouds, thin as they are, how thin a portion of their image must be, as viewed in a reflecting surface, there is no man that can express, or give in words such an estimation as would be conceivable. And now attend further, and with how swift a motion images are borne along, and what activity is given to them as they swim across the air, so that, to whatever part they move, each with its several tendency, a short time only is spent in a long distance, I will proceed to explain, though rather, if possible, in agreeably sounding verses than in many, as the short melody of the swan is better than the croak of cranes swept afar among the ethereal clouds driven by the south wind. In the first place, we have constant means of observing how swift, in their motion those bodies, which are light, and which consist of minute particles, are. Of which kind is the sun's light, and his heat, for this reason, that they are composed of minute primary atoms, which are, as it were, struck out, 
and make no difficulty to pass through the interval of air, driven on by a succeeding stroke, for the place of light passing on is instantly supplied by other light, and brightness is, as it were, propelled by successive brightness. Wherefore images must, in like manner, be able to pass through an inexpressible space in a moment of time. In the first place, because there is always some slight impulse at a distance behind them, which may carry them forward and urge them on, and secondly, because they are sent forth formed with so subtle a texture that they can easily penetrate any substances whatsoever, and, as it were, flow through the intervening body of air. Besides, if those atoms of bodies which are sent forth from within, and from the central portion of them, as the light and heat of the sun are seen, gliding over the whole space of the air, to diffuse themselves abroad in a moment of time, and to fly through sea and land, and to flood the heaven which is above, where they are borne along with such rapid lightness, what shall we say of those particles, then, which lie ready on the outmost surface of bodies? Do you not conceive how much quicker and farther they ought to go when they are once thrown off, and when nothing delays their progress? And do you not feel certain that they should fly over a much greater distance of space in the same time in which the light of the sun traverses the heaven? This also seems to be an eminently fitting example to show with how swift a motion the images of things are borne along, namely, that as soon as a bright surface of water is placed in the open air, when the clear heaven is shining with stars, the radiant constellations of the sky immediately correspond in the water. Do you now understand, then, in what a moment of time this image descends from the regions of the air to the regions of the earth? From which cause, however wonderful, you must necessarily admit, again and again, the existence of bodies which strike the eyes and excite our vision, and flow with a perpetual issue from certain substances, as cold from rivers, heat from the sun, spray from the waves of the sea, which is the consumer of walls round the shore, nor do various voices cease to fly through the air. Moreover, the moisture, so to speak, of a salt taste comes often into the mouth when we are walking near the sea, and again, when we look at diluted wormwood being mixed, a bitterness affects our palate. So evidently a certain substance is borne rapidly away from all bodies, and is dispersed in all directions around. Nor is there any delay or interruption allowed to the efflux, since we perpetually perceive it with our senses, and may see all objects at all times, and smell them, and hear them sound. Further, since any figure felt with the hands in the dark is known to be the same which is seen by day and in clear light, it necessarily follows that touch and sight are excited by a light cause. If, therefore, we handle a square object, and that object affects us as a square in the dark, what object, in the light, will be able to answer to the shape of it, except its quadrangular image. For which reason the faculty of discerning forms is found to depend upon images, and it seems that no object can be distinguished by the eye without them. Now those images of objects, of which I am speaking, are carried in every direction, and are thrown off so as to be distributed on all sides. But, because we can see only with our eyes, 
it therefore happens that whatsoever way we turn our sight all objects on that quarter strike on it with their shape and color and the image causes us to see and gives us means to distinguish how far each object is distant from us for when it is sent forth from the object it immediately strikes and drives forward that portion of air which is situated between itself and our eyes and the whole of that air thus glides through our eyes and as it were brushes the pupils gently and so passes on hence it comes to pass that we see how far distant each object is and the more air is driven before the image and the longer the stream of it that brushes through our eyes the farther each object seems to be removed from us these effects you may be sure are produced with an exquisitely rapid process so that we see what the object is and at the same time how far it is distant in these matters it is by no means to be accounted wonderful why when those images which strike the eyes cannot be severally discerned the objects themselves from which they proceed are perceived for in like manner when the wind strikes upon us by degrees and when sharp cold spreads over us we are not wont to perceive each first and successive particle of that wind and cold but rather the whole together and we then perceive as it were blows inflicted upon our body as if some substance were striking us and producing in our frame a sense of its force which is without us besides when we strike a stone with our finger we touch the very extreme superficies of the stone and the outside color and yet we do not feel that color with our touch but rather perceive the hardness of the stone deeply seated within its substance and now learn in addition to this why the image of an object in a mirror is seen beyond the mirror for certainly it seems extremely remote from us the case is the same as with those objects which are plainly seen out of doors when a door standing open affords an unobstructed prospect through it and allows many objects out of the house to be contemplated for this view also as well as that in the mirror takes place if i may so express it with a double and twofold tide of air for first is perceived the air on this side of the doorposts then follow the doorposts themselves on the right hand and on the left next the external light strikes the eyes and the second portion of air and all those objects which are clearly seen abroad so when the image from the glass has first thrown itself forward and whilst it is coming to our sight it strikes and drives forward the air which is situate between itself and the eyes and causes us to perceive all this air before we see the mirror but when we have looked on the mirror itself the image which is thrown off from us reaches it and being reflected returns to our eyes and so propelling another portion of air before it rolls it on and causes us to perceive this air before we see itself and on that account seems to be distant and to be so much removed from or behind the mirror for which reason again and again i say it is by no means right for those who study these matters to wonder at the effects which attribute vision from the surface of mares to the influence of two portions of air since the appearance is produced by means of both now that which is in reality the right side of our bodies is made to appear on the left side in mirrors for this reason that when the image 
which proceeds from our person, strikes upon the plane of the mirror, it is not reflected without a change, but being turned back, it is so struck out of its former state, as would be the case with a mask of plaster, if, before it were dry, any one should dash its face against a pillar or a beam, when, if it should preserve, at that instant, its true figure as in front, or as when its front was presented to you, and should exhibit itself, or its exact features, driven back through the hinder part of the head, it will happen that the eye which before was the right is now become the left, and that which was on the left correspondently is made the right. It is contrived also that an image may be transmitted from mirror to mirror, so that five and even six images have been often produced. For whatsoever object in a house shall be hid, as lying back in the interior part of it, it will yet be possible that every such object, however removed out of sight by crooked turnings and recesses, may, being drawn out by means of several glasses through the winding passages, be seen to be in the building. So exactly is an image reflected from glass to glass, and, when it has been presented to us on the left hand, it happens afterwards that it is produced on the right, and thence it returns again and changes to the same position as before. Moreover, whatever small sides or plates there are of glasses, formed with a round flexure similar to that of our own side, they, on that account, reflect to us images in the right position, either because the image is transferred from glass to glass and thence, being twice reflected, flies forward to us, or, again, because the image, when it comes forth, is turned about, inasmuch as the curved shape of the glass causes it to wheel itself round to us. Further, you would suppose that our images in a mirror advance together with us, and place their foot with ours, and imitate our gesture, which appearance happens from this cause, that from whatever part of the mirror you recede, the images, after that moment, cannot be reflected from that part, since nature obliges all images to be reflected from mirrors, as well as to fly off from objects, according to the corresponding gestures of the person whom they represent. Bright objects, also, the eyes avoid, and shrink from beholding. The sun even blinds you, if you persist to direct your eyes against it, inasmuch as the power of it is great, and images from it are borne down impetuously from on high through the clear air, and strike the eyes forcibly, disturbing and causing pain in their sockets. Moreover, whatever splendor is strong often burns the eyes, because it contains many seeds of fire, which produce pain in the organs of sight by penetrating into them. Besides, whatever objects jaundiced persons look upon become, in their sight, yellow like themselves, because many atoms of yellow color flow off from their bodies, meeting and tinging the images of objects, and many of the same atoms are moreover mixed in their eyes, which, by their contagion, paint all things with lurid hues. But when we are in the dark, we see, from the darkness, objects that are in the light, because when the black air of the darkness, being nearer to us, has entered the open eyes first, and taken possession of them, the bright white air immediately follows, which, as it were, clears them, and dispels the black shades of the other air for this lucid air is by many degrees more active, and far more subtle and powerful, which, as soon as it has filled with light, 
and laid open the passages of the eyes, which the dark air had previously stopped. Plain images of objects immediately follow and strike upon the eyes, so that we see those objects which are situated in the light. This, on the other hand, we cannot do when we look from the light towards objects in the dark, because the thicker air of darkness follows behind the light air, which thicker air fills the pores and stops up the passages of sight, so that the images of any things whatsoever be involved in it cannot be moved forward into the eyes. And when we behold the square towers of a city a long way off, it happens on account of the distance that they often seem round, because every angle being afar off is seen as obtuse, or rather is not seen at all. The impulse of its image dies away, and the force of it does not reach to our eyes, since, while the images of it are borne through a large body of air, the air, by frequent percussions upon them, obliges that force to become ineffective. Hence it comes to pass that when every angle has escaped our vision at the same time, the constructed stones are seen as if fashioned to a round, not, however, like round objects which are immediately before us, and which are exactly circular, but they appear, as it were, nearly, after a shadowy fashion, resembling them. Our shadow likewise seems to us to move in the sun, and to follow our footsteps, and to imitate our gesture, if you can fancy air devoid of light, to go forwards following the movements and gesture of men, for that which we are accustomed to call shadow can be nothing else but air deprived of light. Evidently because the ground, in certain spots successively, is excluded from the radiance, wherever we, as we go, obstruct it, and that part of it which we have left is again covered with light. From this cause it happens that what was the shadow of our body seems to be still the same, and to have followed exactly opposite us. For fresh illuminations of rays are perpetually pouring themselves forth, and the first disappear as quickly as wool vanishes if applied to a flame. By this means the ground is both easily deprived of light, and again covered with it, and discharges from itself the black shadows. Nor yet, in this case, do we allow that the eyes are at all deceived, for it is their business only to observe in whatever place there may be light or shade, but whether the light is the same or not, and whether the same shadow which was here passes thither, or rather, as we said before, a new one is constantly produced, this the judgment of the mind only must determine. For the eyes cannot know the nature of things, and, therefore, you must not impute to the eyes that which may be the fault of the understanding. A ship in which we sail is carried forward when it seems to stand still, and that which remains stationary is imagined to go by us, and the hills and plains, past which we row our vessel, or fly with sails, seem to flee away astern. All the stars seem to be at rest, as, being fixed to the vaults of the sky, and yet all are in perpetual motion, for when, after rising, they have traversed the heaven with their shining orbs, they return to their distant places of setting, and the sun and the moon, in like manner, seem to remain stationary. Bodies which observation itself shows to be carried forwards, and mountains rising up at a distance from the middle of the sea, between which a free passage for ships is open, yet appear without separation so that one vast island seems to be formed from the two united. 
It likewise happens that to children, after ceasing to whirl themselves about, the rooms seem to turn, and the pillars to run round, so that they can hardly believe that the whole building is not threatening to fall upon them. And when nature begins to raise on high the beams of the sun, red with tremulous fires, and to exalt them above the hills, the hills over which the sun then appears to be, himself apparently touching them close, glowing with its own beams, are scarcely distant from us two thousand flights of an arrow, often even scarcely five hundred casts of a dart. Yet, between them and the sun, which seems in contact with them, lie broad expanses of sea, stretched out under vast regions of sky, and many thousand miles of land also intervene, which various nations of men and tribes of wild beasts occupy and overrun, and, to mention another ocular delusion, a puddle of water, not deeper than a finger, which settles among the stones in the paved streets, affords, apparently, a prospect downwards under the earth to a depth as great as the height to which the lofty arch of heaven extends above the earth, so that you seem to look down upon the clouds and to see a heaven beneath, and to behold, by a surprising effect, the celestial bodies buried in the sky underground. Moreover, when a spirited courser sticks fast with us in the middle of a river, and we look down into the swiftly flowing water of the stream, a force seems to be carrying the body of the horse, though standing still, in a contrary direction to the current, and to drive it rapidly up the river, and whithersoever we turn our eyes, all objects appear to us to be carried along, and to flow in a similar manner. A portico, too, although it be of equal dimensions throughout, and standing supported with equal columns from end to end, yet, when it is viewed from the extremity through its whole length, contracts gradually, as it were, to the apex of a tapering cone, joining the roof to the floor, and all the right-hand parts to the left, until it has narrowed itself to the indistinct point of the cone. To sailors at sea it occurs that the sun, having risen from the waves, seems also to set, and bury its light in the waves, as, in their situation, they behold nothing else but water and sky, a remark which I make, that you may not lightly suppose that the senses are altogether deceived. But to those ignorant of the sea, ships in the harbor often appear to strive, disabled in their equipments, against the broken waves. For, though whatever part of the oars is raised above the water of the sea is straight, and the part of the helm above the water is straight, the parts which go down and are sunk in the water seem all, as if broken, to be turned and inverted, sloping upwards, and thus bent back to float almost up to the surface of the water. And when the winds, in the night-time, carry light vapors athwart the sky, the bright constellations seem then to glide against the clouds, and to pass along on high in a far different direction than that in which they are really born. But if by chance the hand, applied to one eye, presses it underneath, it happens, by some impression on the sense, that all things, at which we look, seem to become double as we gaze on them. Two lights in the lamps appear blossoming with flames. The twin furniture seems to be doubled throughout the house, and the faces of the people seem double, and their persons double. Moreover, when sleep has bound our limbs in agreeable repose, and the whole body lies in profound rest, yet, at that very time, our limbs appear to be awake and to move themselves, and we imagine that, in the thick darkness of night, we see the sun, 
and the light of day, and though in a confined place, we seem to change our position with respect to the heaven, the sea, rivers, and mountains, and to cross over plains on foot, and to hear sounds, though the unbroken silence of night reigns around us, and to utter words, though our tongues remain still. Other things of this class, exciting our wonder, we see in great numbers, all which seek, as it were, to destroy the credit of our senses, but they strive in vain, since the greatest part of these appearances deceive us only because of the fancies which we allow to bear upon them, so that those things which have not been seen by our senses are to us as if seen. For nothing is more difficult than to separate certain from doubtful things, things which the mind, when their fallaciousness is discovered, straightway rejects from itself. Moreover, if any one believes that nothing is known, he himself also knows not whether that can be known from which he, forming a judgment, confesses that he knows nothing. Against him, therefore, I shall forbear to urge argument, who of his own will has placed himself with his face towards his footsteps. And although I should even grant that he knows this, I should still put to him the following question. When he has seen no truth in things previously, how he knows what it is to know and not to know, in contradistinction to one another? What cause I shall ask him, produced his knowledge of truth and falsehood, and what power has proved to him that what is doubtful differs from what is certain. The knowledge of truth, you will find, is derived from the senses as its origin, and you will own that the senses cannot be refuted. For that which, of its own power, can refute false notions by real facts must be found of greater credit than to be liable to confutation. What, then, must be esteemed of greater credit than the senses? Shall reasoning, arising from erring sense, reasoning, I say, which has arisen wholly from the senses, and which can depend on nothing else, be of sufficient force to refute those senses? For unless these, our senses, are true and trustworthy, all reasoning consequently becomes false and unfounded? But what that is external to the senses shall confute the senses, or will they disagree among themselves and refute one another? Will the ears be able to refute the eyes, or will the touch refute the ears, or will the taste of the mouth, moreover, refute the touch? Will the nostrils confute the other senses, or will the eyes contradict them? It is, as I think, not so, for each sense is separately assigned its own faculty. Each has its own power, and it is therefore necessary that what is soft, and what is cold, and what is hot, should seem so. And it is necessary, also, that we should perceive distinctly the various colors of things, and whatever things are connected with colors. The taste of the mouth, likewise, has its own power separately. Scents are produced independently, and sounds independently of the other senses. And it necessarily follows, therefore, that some senses cannot confute others, nor again will they, as a body, confute themselves. For equal trust must at all times be placed in every one of them. That, therefore, which, at any time whatsoever, has seemed true to them, is true. And if reasoning shall be unable to unfold the cause why those objects which, when close at hand, were square, have appeared round at a distance, yet it is better for a man being partially deficient in reasoning, to give explanations of each figure erroneously, than by any means to let slip from his hands things that are manifest, 
and to destroy the first principles of belief, and tear up all the foundations on which life and safety rest. For not only would all reasoning fall to the ground, but life itself would at once come to nothing, unless you venture to trust your senses, and to avoid precipices, and other things of this sort which are to be shunned, and to pursue those things which are of a contrary character. That, therefore, is all an empty body of words, you may be sure, which is arrayed and drawn up against the senses. Lastly, as, in a building, if the rule is wrongly applied at first, if the square, being erroneously placed, deviates from the proper position, and if the level is in the least inexact in any spot, all parts of the edifice are necessarily rendered faulty and distorted, and become ill-shaped, sloping, hanging forwards or backwards, and inconsistent with one another, so that some seem inclined to fall, and some actually do fall, being all made unsound by false measures at the commencement. Thus, accordingly, whatever reasoning on things has sprung from fallacious senses must of necessity be erroneous and deceitful. If the senses be false, all arguments from them must be false. End of Section 10, Book 4, Part 1「Eleven of On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric DeSigo. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 11. Book 4, Part 2 We have already spoken of sight, and now no difficult argument is left for us to show how the other senses discern each its own object. In the first place, every sound and voice is heard when, being infused into the ears, they have struck with their substance on the sense. For we must admit that voice and sound are corporeal, since they can make impression on the senses. On this account the voice often abrades the throat, and its loud sound, as it passes forth, makes the windpipe rougher. For when the atoms of the voice, a larger body of them than usual having risen together, have proceeded to go forth from the mouth, the passage of the mouth, from the pores being filled up, is rendered hoarse, and the voice injures the road by which it issues into the air. It is by no means to be doubted, therefore, that voices and words consist of corporeal particles, as having power to cause corporeal injury. Nor does it escape your knowledge, also, how much substance perpetual speaking, protracted from the rising splendor of aurora to the shade of black night, detracts from the body, and how much it wears away from the very nerves and strength of men, especially if it is uttered with extreme loudness. The voice, therefore, must necessarily be corporeal, since he who speaks much loses, from its effect, a portion of his corporeal substance. Nor do the particles of sound penetrate the ear under a like form, when the crooked barbarian trumpet bellows heavily with a deep murmur and calls up a hoarse, dead sound, and when swans, in the pangs of death, raise, with a mournful voice, a liquid dirge from the veils of Helicon. These words and sounds, therefore, when being formed within, we expel them from our body and send them forth straight by the mouth. The act of tongue, skillful in forming words, articulates, and the shape into which the lips are put, 
partly assists to fashion them. But asperity of the voice is caused by asperity of its particles, and its smoothness is also produced by their smoothness. For this reason, when the distance is not great to the spot whence each word, having started forth, arrives at our ears, it happens, of necessity, that the words themselves are also plainly heard, and distinguished in every note, for the voice keeps its formation and maintains its figure. But if a greater space than is convenient is interposed, the words, passing through a large body of air, are necessarily confused, and the voice, while it flies through the aerial interval, is disordered. It accordingly happens that you hear a sound, but cannot distinguish what is the meaning of the words. So confused and obstructed does the voice come to you. Besides, one word, uttered from the mouth of a crier in the midst of the people, often penetrates the ears of all. One voice, therefore, suddenly divides into many voices, since it distributes itself to each individual ear, stamping on it, as it were, the form and clear sound of the words. But that part of the several voices which does not fall on the ears themselves is lost, being carried past them and diffused through the air. Some portion of it, too, struck against solid objects and rebounding like a stone, returns a sound, and sometimes mocks you with the semblance of a word. Which things, when you consider, my good friend, you may be able to render an account to yourself and others how rocks, in solitary places, regularly return similar forms of words to those which we utter when we seek our companions wandering among the shady hills and call them as they are scattered abroad with a loud voice. I have noticed places repeat six or seven words when you uttered only one, for the mountains, reverberating the words spoken, repeated them so that they were re-echoed without change. Such places the neighboring people pretend that satyrs and nymphs inhabit, and say that there are fawns in them, by whose noise and sportive play, re-echoing through the night, they universally affirm that the dead silence is broken, and that sounds of chords and sweet plaintive notes are heard, which the pipe, struck with the fingers of those playing, pours forth around. They relate also that the race of husbandmen hear far and wide when, frequently, Pan, shaking the piney garland of his half-savage head, runs over the open reeds with his curved lip, ceasing not to repeat his sylvan song. Other wonders and prodigies of this kind they relate, lest, perhaps they should be thought to dwell in lonely places, deserted even by the gods. For this reason they talk of such marvels in their discourse, or, perchance, are prompted by some other cause, as all men are too eager for years that will listen to wonderful stories. Furthermore, it is not surprising how, through places where the eyes cannot discern plain objects, through these very places voices pass and excite the ears. We often, too, witness a dialogue held between two persons in different apartments, with the doors closed. The cause is, evidently, this, that the voice can pass unbroken through winding pores of bodies, though images refuse to pass through them. For the latter are broken to pieces, unless they go through straight passages, such as those of glass, through which every image flies. Besides, the voice is distributed in all directions, inasmuch as some voices are produced from others, for this happens where one voice has split itself into many, as a spark of fire, when it has started forth, is often wont to disperse itself into its own separate fires. Places, accordingly, 
which have been all shut up behind and around the speaker, are filled with voices and shaken with sound. But as for images, they all, when once they have been thrown off, pass only by straight openings, for which reason no one can see objects beyond walls, though he may hear voices from beyond them. And yet this very voice, also, while it goes through the obstructed passages, is dulled, and we seem to hear a sound rather than distinct words. That faculty, by which we perceive taste, the organs being the tongue and the palate, requires for itself somewhat more argument and more explanation. In the first place, we perceive savor in the mouth when we express it from food by mastication, as when any one, for example, proceeds to press and dry with his hand a sponge full of water. What we express is then distributed through all the ducts of the palate and the tortuous pores of the soft tongue. By this means, when the atoms of the juice flowing out are smooth, they touch the sense agreeably and affect all parts around the humid exuding regions of the tongue with pleasure. But, on the other hand, as atoms are severally more endowed with roughness, so much the more, issuing forth in a body, they sting and lacerate the sense. Moreover, pleasure experienced from the taste of food is limited by the extent of the palate, as, when the juice has descended downwards through the throat, there is no enjoyment while it is all being distributed through the members, nor is it of any consequence with what food the body is nourished, so that you be but able to disperse what ye take, when digested, through the organs, and preserve the humic ten tenor and action of the stomach. I will now explain, in order that we may understand this point, how it is that different food is allotted to different animals, or why that which is sour and bitter to some may yet seem to others extremely sweet. And so great is the difference and variety in these matters that that which to some is food, to others is rank poison. Thus it happens that a serpent, which is touched with human saliva, perishes, and even commits suicide by biting himself. Besides, hellebore is strong poison to us, but increases the fat of goats and quails. That you may understand by what means this happens, it becomes you, in the first place, to call to mind what we have often said before, that in bodies are contained many seminal atoms, mingled in many ways. Moreover, as all living creatures which take food are dissimilar externally, and as the extreme outline of their limbs restricts them variously according to their kinds, so they likewise consist of different seminal particles, and vary in the figure of their elements. Further, when the seminal particles differ, their intervals and passages, which we call pores, in all the limbs and in the mouth, and the palate itself must likewise differ. Some of these pores, therefore, must be greater, and some less. Some animals must have triangular pores, some square, many pores must be round, and some polygonal, varied in several ways. For as the nature of the shapes of the seminal particles and their motions require the figures of the pores must differ accordingly, and the intervals among the atoms must vary just as the combination of the atoms demands. On this account, when that which is sweet to some animals is bitter to others, exquisitely smooth atoms must enter gently and easily into the pores of the palate of that animal to whom it is sweet. But, on the contrary, Rough and jagged particles, as is evident, pierce the mouths of those animals to whom the same substance is bitter. From these facts it is now easy to understand every particular connected with this subject, 
For when in any person fever has arisen from the superabundance of the bile, or any violence of disease has been excited by any other means, his whole body is at once disturbed, and all the positions of the atoms in him are changed. It happens that particles which before suited his sense of taste are now unsuitable to it, and others, which, when they have penetrated the pores, produce a bitter sensation, are more adapted to it. For even in sweet bodies, as in the flavor and substance of honey, both rough and smooth particles are mixed, a fact which we have demonstrated to you frequently before. And now give me your attention further, for I shall show in what manner the approach of odor affects the nostrils. First, there must necessarily exist many substances, from which a varied effluence of odors streams forth and evolves itself, for that odors do both flow off and are sent forth and dispersed abroad, we must naturally suppose. But certain odors, on account of the different shapes of their particles, are more suited to some animals than to others, and thus bees are attracted by the smell of honey in the air, however far distant, and vultures by the smell of carcasses. Also the keen scent of dogs, preceding their steps, leads them whithersoever the cloven hoof of the stag has directed its course, and the white goose, the preserver of the citadel of the Romans, perceives from afar the smell of a man. Thus different scent assigned to different animals leads each to its own food, and causes it to recoil from destructive poison, and by this means the tribes of beasts are preserved. Of this very odor, then, which excites the nostrils, it happens that one kind is carried farther than another, but yet none of them is carried so far as sound or as the voice. I forbear to say as those airy substances which strike the eyes and excite vision. For odor, wandering about, passes but slowly, and being dispersed through the yielding air, soon gradually dies away, chiefly because it is with difficulty evolved out of any substance from its interior. For that odors flow and come forth from the interior of substances, this consideration sufficiently indicates that all bodies, when broken, bruised, or split into fragments in the fire, seem to cast a stronger scent than when whole. It is, besides, easy to see that odor is composed of larger atoms than sound, since it does not penetrate through stone walls through which the voice and sounds constantly pass. For which reason you will see that it is not so easy to ascertain in what quarter a body that casts a scent is placed, as to find out one that emits a sound. For the force and impulse of an odor, by moving slowly through the air, soon becomes chill and powerless. Nor do the atoms, the heralds of substances, come warm to the sense. From this cause dogs are often at fault, and have to seek for the traces of the scent. Nor does this occur, indeed, in respect to odors only, and in the case of tastes, but the appearances and colors of things, likewise, do not so agree with the senses of all men alike, but that some are more acrid and repulsive to the sight than others. Even fierce lions cannot endure to stand against and to look upon a cock, which, as his flapping wings startle the night, is accustomed to call Aurora with his loud voice. Lions, I say, will not endure him, so suddenly do they bethink them of flight, the cause evidently being that there are in the bodies of cocks certain particles which, when sent forth into the eyes of lions, pierce the pupils, and cause sharp pain, so that the beasts, however fierce, cannot hold out against them, although these same particles cannot at all hurt our eyes, either because they do not penetrate, or because, if they do penetrate, 
a free outlet from the eye is permitted to them so that they cannot in any respect hurt the organs of sight by remaining in them and now give me your attention and learn what substances affect the mind and understand in a few words whence those things which come into the mind proceed in the first place i assert this that numbers of subtle images of things wander about in many ways in all directions images which when they meet are easily united together in the air as the spider's web and a leaf of gold for these images are far finer in their texture than those which affect the eyes and excite vision since these penetrate through the small pores of the body and excite the subtle substance of the mind within and arouse the sense thus it is that we see centaurs and the members of psylli and the cerberian mouths of dogs and the apparitions of those whose bones after death has been passed the earth contains since spectra of all kinds are everywhere carried about which are partly such as are formed spontaneously in the air partly whatever fly off from various objects and partly those which images formed of figures of these two kinds compose for assuredly the image of a centaur is not formed from a living centaur since there has been no such figure in life but when the images of a horse and a man have come together by chance they easily and quickly cohere as we said before because of their subtle nature and filmy texture other images of this sort are produced in the same manner and since these from their extreme lightness are as i have shown above swiftly carried about any one thin image of them all easily stimulates our mind with a single impression for the mind is itself subtle and eminently excitable that these things take place as i state you may easily learn from hence that inasmuch as this impression on the mind is similar to that on the bodily senses it necessarily follows that that which we see with the mind and that which we see with the eye are effected by similar means as i have shown accordingly that i perceive lions for example by means of images of lions which excite the eyes we may understand that the mind is moved by images of lions in like manner and by other images of other things which it sees and discerns equally and not less than the eyes only we must observe that it sees more subtle images nor for any other reason does this sense of the mind become awake when sleep has spread itself over the limbs than because these same images excite our minds which affect our senses when we are corporeally awake to such a degree that we seem plainly to behold him of whom his life having been yielded up death and the earth have already taken possession this nature of necessity brings to pass and from this cause that all the senses of the body being obstructed and bound up by sleep are at rest throughout the several members and are unable to refute any false appearance by real facts besides the memory lies inactive and torpid in sleep and shows no disbelief in appearances or intimates that he whom the mind imagines that it sees alive has long ago partaken of death and forgetfulness as to what remains for consideration it is not surprising that images should move and agitate their arms and other members with regularity for it happens that many an image seems to do this in our sleep this is to be explained in the following way that when the first image passes off and a second is afterwards produced in another position the former then seems to have changed its gesture this doubtless we must conceive to be done by a very rapid process so great is the activity of images and so great the number of things from which they proceed and so great too is the abundance of atoms 
that it may suffice for that which is to be perceived by the senses at any time whatsoever. And many other questions are raised on these matters, and many points must be made clear by us if we wish to explain these subjects distinctly. In the first place, it is inquired why the mind immediately thinks of that very thing of which any one has desired to think. Do images watch our pleasure, and as soon as we wish, does an image present itself to us? If it is our desire to think of the sea, of the earth, or of the heaven, of assemblies of men, of a procession, of banquets, of battles, does nature create and prepare images of all these things at our word? Especially when the minds of different men in the same country and place think of things entirely different? What shall we say, moreover, when we perceive images in our sleep advance before us in order, and move their pliant limbs, when, as we observe them, they wave with ease their bending arms alternately, and repeat gesture after gesture with the foot corresponding to the look? Are images, forsooth, inspired with the art of dancing, and do they, skilled in gesticulation, wander about, in order that they may make sport for us in the night-time? Or will this rather be the truth, that we perceive that variety of motions in one and the same portion of time, as in that time in which one word is uttered, many smaller portions of time, which reason discovers to be in it, are contained? From this cause it happens that at any time whatsoever any images are ready at hand, prepared for all places, so great is their activity, and so great the abundance of objects from which they proceed. By this means, when the first image passes away, and a second is afterwards produced in another position, the first then seems to have changed its gesture. And because images are subtle, the mind cannot acutely discern any but those which it earnestly endeavors to discern. All, therefore, which exist besides these pass away unnoticed, unless the mind has thus prepared itself and endeavored to distinguish them. The mind, accordingly, does prepare itself and expects that that will occur which is consequent on that which has preceded so that it observes each particular occurrence. Thus, therefore, the effect is produced. Do you not see, also, that the eyes, when they have begun to look at things which are small, exert and prepare themselves, and that we could not, without this exertion, clearly discern them? And even in respect, also, to objects easily distinguishable, you may observe that if you do not apply your mind to remark any one of them, it is just the same as if it were all the time removed and far distant from you? How is it therefore surprising if the mind loses sight of all other images except those concerning matters to which it is itself directed? Besides, we form opinions of great things from small indications and thus lead ourselves into the delusion of deceit. It happens also that sometimes a second image is not presented of the same kind as the first, but that that which was before a woman under our hands seems to be before us changed into a man, or that one face and one age follows after another, but at this sleep and oblivion prevent us from wondering. In these matters, remember that it is necessary diligently to shun this fault, and to avoid it cautiously as a most grievous error, the fault, namely, of supposing that all the parts of animals were formed with a view to the uses to which they have been adapted, lest you should suppose that the bright luminaries of the eyes were produced that we may be able to see with them, and that the pillars of the legs and thighs built upon the feet, were united for this purpose, that we might take long steps on the road, and moreover, that the forearms fitted to the stout upper arms, 
and the hands ministering on either side were given us that we might perform those offices which would be necessary for the support of life other suppositions of this sort whatever explanations men give are all preposterous reasoning being thus perverted for nothing was produced in the body to the end that we might use it but that which has been produced being found serviceable for certain ends begets use neither was the faculty of seeing in existence before the light of the eyes was made nor that of speaking with words before the tongue was formed but rather the origin of the tongue long preceded speech and the ears were made long before any sound was heard and in fine all members as i think existed before there was any use of them discovered they could not therefore have been produced for the sake of being used but on the contrary to engage in battle with the hand and to tear the limbs and to pollute the body with gore was practised long before bright darts were hurled and nature compelled us to avoid a wound before the left hand by the help of art presented the defence of a shield and certainly to commit the wearied body to rest is of much more antiquity than the soft cushions of the couch and to quench the thirst was practised before cups were invented such things as these then which were found out from experience and the objects of life may be believed to have been invented for the purpose of using them those things however which were all first produced independently gave a knowledge of their utility afterwards of which kind especially we see that the senses and members of the body are wherefore again and again i say it is impossible for you to believe that they could have been produced for the sake of use this also is not to be wondered at that the very nature of the body of every animal requires food for i have shown that many atoms pass off and recede from substances in many ways but the most numerous must pass off from animals because they are exercised by motion and many particles are carried forth urged from the interior of the body by perspiration many also are exhaled through the mouth when they pant from weariness by these means, therefore, the body wastes, and all its nature is undermined, a state on which pain is attendant. On this account food is taken, that it may support the limbs, and being given at intervals may recruit the strength, and repress the eager desire of eating throughout the organs and veins. Liquid also descends into all parts of the body, whatsoever require liquid and the moisture coming into the frame dissipates the many collected atoms of heat which cause a burning in our stomach and extinguishes them like fire so that arid heat may no longer dry up our limbs thus therefore you see panting thirst is expelled from our bodies thus the pining desire of food is satisfied End of section 11. Book 4, Part 2。Section 12 of On the Nature of Things. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric DeSigo. On the Nature of Things by Lucretius. Translated by John Selby Watson. Section 12, Book 4, Part 3. I will now state how it comes to pass that we can advance our steps when we please, and how it is given us to move our limbs out of the direct line and what causes want to push forward this great weight of our body do thou my friend attentively receive my instructions 
I affirm, then, that images of going first approach to the mind and impinge on the mind, as we observed before respecting images in general. Thence arises will, for no man begins to do any thing before his mind has discerned what it will do, and, according to what it discerns, is the image of his action. When, therefore, the mind so stirs itself that it desires to proceed and move forward, it immediately acts on the substance of the soul, which is distributed in the whole body, and through the limbs and joints, and this is easily done, since the substance of the soul is held united with the mind. That substance of the soul forthwith acts upon the body, and thus, by degrees, the whole mass of the man is protruded and moved forwards. The body at that time, moreover, opens its pores, and the air, which is always easily excited to motion, enters, as it naturally must indeed, through the open spaces, and penetrates the passages abundantly, and is thus dispersed through every minute portion of the body. Thus, therefore, the body, by two several powers, is made to move along as a ship with sails and wind. Nor yet is it wonderful, in these matters, that atoms so small can wield so great a body, and turn about all our weight. For the wind, though but light and of thin substance, drives forward a large ship with vast power, and one hand rules the vessel with whatever speed it may be going, while one helm turns it in any direction. And a machine, by the help of wheels and pulleys, lifts many bodies of great weight, and raises them on high with but a slight force. And now I shall explain by what means sleep spreads rest through our limbs, and dispels the cares of the mind from our breast. But I shall do this rather in agreeably sounding than in numerous verses, as the short melody of the swan is better than the croak of cranes, dispersed among the clouds of heaven, driven by the south wind. Do you only, O Memmius, devote to me your attentive ears and discerning mind, that you may not deny what I say to be possible, and depart from me with the breast repelling true precepts, when you yourself are in fault, and yet cannot perceive that such is the case. In the first place, sleep occurs when the substance of the soul has been disturbed throughout the several members, and has partly seceded from the body, as being driven forth abroad, and has partly, as being more concentrated, retreated into the interior of the body. For then, at length, when the frame is in this state, the limbs are relaxed and lose their power. Since there is no doubt but that this our vital sense exists in us by means of the soul, which sense, when sleep hinders from being exerted, we must then suppose that our soul is disturbed and expelled from the body, but not wholly. For if it were all withdrawn, the body would lie steeped in the eternal cold of death, as, in that case, no part of the soul would remain latent in the members, concealed as fire lies hidden under thick ashes, whence the sense might be suddenly rekindled throughout the limbs, and flame, as it were, rise from secret heat. But by what means this change from wakefulness to sleep is produced, and how the soul may be disturbed, and the body languish, I will explain. Do you, my friend, take care that I may not pour out my words to the winds? In the first place, it necessarily happens that the body, since it is touched by the breezes of the air to which it is exposed, must be externally assailed and harassed by the frequent impulse of that air. And for this reason, 
Almost all animated bodies are covered with hide, or even with shells, or with hard skin or bark. This same air, likewise, impinges on the interior part of the body of animals when, as they breathe, it is drawn in and respired. For which reason, when the body is affected from both causes, and when assaults penetrate through the small pores of our frame to its primary parts and first elements, a labefactation, as it were, takes place by degrees throughout our members, for the positions of the elements of the body and mind are disturbed, so that part of the soul is drawn forth from them, and part retires hidden into the interior. Part also, dispersed throughout the limbs, cannot remain united together, nor perform its ordinary motions mutually with the other parts, for nature obstructs the communications and passages, and therefore, the motions of the atoms being changed, sense wholly fails. And since there remains nothing that can, as it were, prop up the limbs, the body becomes weak, and all its members languish, the arms and the eyelids fall, and the hams often subside with a sinking lassitude, and relax their strength. Sleep, too, follows upon taking food, because food, while it is being distributed through all the veins, produces the same effects which the air produces, and that sleep is far the most heavy which you take when full or weary, because most of the atoms of the frame are then disturbed, being shaken with much effort. By the same means, a deeper concussion in the substance of the soul takes place, as well as a larger ejection of it without, and it becomes more divided in itself and distracted within. And in general, as each of us, having pursued any study, is devoted to it in his thoughts, or in whatever occupation we have been much engaged previously, and the mind has been more exerted in that pursuit, we seem, for the most part, to go through the same employments in sleep. Lawyers seem to plead causes and to make laws, generals to fight and engage in battles, sailors to wage settled war with the winds, and myself to pursue this work and investigate perpetually the nature of things and to explain it when discovered in the language of my country. Thus other studies and arts seem generally, in sleep, to occupy the minds of men with delusions. And whatsoever persons have given continual attention to games and spectacles for many days in succession, we generally see that, in those persons, when they have ceased to observe those objects with their bodily senses, there are yet passages remaining open in the mind where the same images of the same objects may enter. For very many days, Therefore, those same images are presented before their eyes, so that they seem, even when awake, to see figures dancing, and moving their pliant limbs, and to listen with their ears to the liquid music and speaking chords of the lyre, and likewise to perceive the same assembly, and to contemplate, at the same time, the various decorations of the scene shining before them. Of so great influence is study and inclination, and so much difference does it make in what pursuits not only men, but indeed all animals, have been accustomed to be engaged. For you will see stout horses, when their limbs shall be stretched in sleep, yet perpetually perspiring and panting, and apparently exerting their utmost strength for the palm of, of victory, or often starting in their sleep as if the barriers were just set open. And the dogs of huntsmen, 
when stretched in gentle repose, often throw out their legs on a sudden, and hurriedly utter cries, and frequently draw in the air with their nostrils, as if they were pursuing the newly discovered traces of wild beasts. And oftentimes, after they are wakened, they follow in imagination the empty images of stags, as if they saw them turned to flight, until, their delusions being dispelled, they return to their senses. And the fawning breed of dogs that are accustomed to the house begin at times to rouse themselves and start up from the ground, just as if they saw strange faces and looks. And the more fierce any breeds are, the more must the same breeds show fierceness in their sleep. But various birds likewise take flight, and suddenly disturb with their wings the groves of the gods during the night if, in their quiet sleep, hawks have appeared, pursuing and flying after them, to offer battle and threaten hostilities. Moreover, the minds of men, whatever great things they effect with vast efforts in the day, frequently perform and carry on the same things also during their sleep. Kings storm cities, are taken prisoners, join battle, raise a cry as if they were being stabbed on the spot. Many struggle desperately, and utter groans as if in pain, and fill all parts around with loud shrieks, as if they were torn by the bite of a panther or savage lion. Many in sleep speak of important matters, and men have often made in dreams a revelation of their own guilt. Many apparently die. Many show terror through their whole frame, like persons who are casting themselves to the ground from high mountains, and, as if deprived of their senses, so disturbed are they by the agitation of their body, scarcely, after sleep, recover themselves. A thirsty man, also, in his dream, often sits near a river or pleasant fountain, and almost swallows up the whole stream with his mouth. Boys, too, bound fast in sleep, fancy that, being near a tank or broken vessel, they are raising up their garment, and pour forth the bottled liquid of the whole body, when the Babylonian coverlets of magnificent splendor are saturated. Or when at length the full ripe hour is reached of vigorous manhood, and the genial stores crowd through the members, ceaseless then at night, forms of the fair, of look and hue divine, rush on the spirit, and the ducts of love so stimulate, where throngs the new-born tide, that, as the tender toil were all achieved, full flows the stream, and drowns the snowy vest. For, as we erst have sung, the seeds of life first spring when manhood first the frame confirms, and as on various functions various powers alone can act propulsive, human seeds by naught but human beauty can be roused. These, when once gendered from their cells minute, or every limb, or every organ spread, crowd in full concourse towards the nervous fount, by nature reared appropriate, whence abrupt excite they oft, as forms of beauty rise, the scenes at hand, the regions ruled by love. Then springs the tender tumor, the warm wish full o'er the foe, the luscious wound who deals with dexterous aim to pour the high-wrought charge, and full contending in the genial fight. So falls the victim on the part assailed, with the red blood the glistening bruise so swells, and o'er the assassin flows the tide he draws. So he who feels the shaft of love propelled from the dear form that charms him towards the spot, aims, whence the wound proceeds, supreme he pants to join the contest, and from frame to frame pour the rich humor, 
for the fierce desire now felt assures how vast the bliss to come this this is venus this he deems true love hence flow the drops delicious that the heart erode hereafter and its train of cares for though the form adored be absent still her phantoms haunt the lover and his ear rings with her name whate'er the path pursued yet fly such phantoms from the food of love abstain libidinous to worthier themes turn turn thy spirit let the race at large thy liberal heart divide nor lavish gross or one fond object thy exhausted strength gendering long cares and certain grief at last for love's deep ulcer fed grows deeper still rank and more poisonous and each coming day augments the madness if the wretch perchance heal not old wounds by those of newer date from fair to fair wide wandering or his mind turned from such subjects to pursuits unlike nor are the joys of love from those shut out who brutal lust avoid the pure of heart far surer pleasures and of nobler kind reap than the wretch of lewd and low desires who in the moment of enjoyment's self still fluctuates with a thousand fears subdued or the fair wanton dubious long who hangs what charm his eyes his hands shall first devour till fixed at length with furious force the spot painful he presses through his luscious lips drives his keen teeth and every kiss indents striving in vain for joys unmixed and urged by latent stimulus the part to wound where'er its seat that frenzies thus his soul but venus softly smooths the wrongs endured and mutual pleasures check the lover's rage then hopes he too in the same form to quench the maddening fires where first the flame arose vain hope by every fact disproved for this the more the soul possesses still the more craves she with keenest ardor foods and drinks as through the frame they pass by toil worn out fill many a huge interstice obvious whence dies the dread sense of hunger and of thirst but human beauty and the rosy cheek with naught the panting lover can endow but fruitless hopes but images unsound scattered by every wind as oft the man parched up with thirst amid his dreams to drink strives but in vain since naught around him flows but void unreal semblances of floods so with her votaries sports the power of love false phantoms soul presenting nor can sight where'er it rove be sated with the gaze nor can the lover's lawless fingers tear aught from his idol or her as he hangs and the full power of every charm explores e'en when in youth's prime flower his panting frame enclasps her frame that pants when all his soul expects the coming bliss and venus waits to sow the fertile field though then amain in amorous fold he press her lip to lip join and drink deep the dulcet breath she heaves tis useless all for still his utmost rage cannot subtract nor through the fair one force his total frame commingled with herself yet oft thus strives he or thus seems to strive so strong the toils that bind him so complete melt all his members in the sea of love and though when now the full collected shock pours from the nerves some transient pause ensue yet short its period the fond fever soon the frenzy quick returns 
and the mad wretch still pants to press that which he pressed before nor aught of antidote exists so deep pines he perplexed beneath the latent ill then too his form consumes the toils of love waste all his vigor and his days roll on in vilest bondage amply though endowed his wealth decays his debts with speed augment the post of duty never fills he more and all his sickening reputation dies meanwhile rich unguents from his mistress laugh laugh from her feet soft sikon's shoes superb the green rayed emerald o'er her dropped in gold gleams large and numerous and the sea-blue silk deep worn and clasps her with the moisture drunk of love illicit what his sires amassed now flaunts in ribbons in tierra's flames full o'er her front and now to robes converts of chian loose or alidonian mould while feasts and festivals of boundless pomp and costliest viands garlands odors wines and scattered roses ceaseless are renewed but fruitless every art some bitter still wells forth perpetual from his font of bliss and poisons every floweret keen remorse goads him perchance for dissipated time and months on months destroyed or from the fair haply some phrase of doubtful import darts that like a living coal his heart corrodes or oft her eyes wide wander as he deems and seek some happier rival while the smile of smothered love half dimples o'er her cheeks such are the ills that on amours attend most blessed and prosperous but on those adverse throng myriads daily obvious and more keen hence by the muse forewarned with studious heed shun thou the toils that wait for easier far those toils to shun than when thy foot once slides to break then tangling meshes and be free yet though ensnared and in the silly net led captive thou mayst still if firm of mine and by these numbers swayed thy foot release first the defects then of the form adored of mind of body let thy memory ne'er one hour forget for these full oft mankind see not by passion blinded while reversed charms they bestow which never were the fairs hence frequent view we those each grace denied the coarse the crooked held in high esteem and lovers laugh o'er lovers and exhort offerings to venus since so vilely swayed while yet themselves are swayed more vilely still to such the black assume a lovely brown the rank and filthy negligence and ease the red-eyed is a palace the firm-limbed all bone a bounding row the pygmy dwarf a sprightly grace all energy and wit the huge and bulky dignified and grand the stammerer lisps the silent is sedate the pert virago spirit all and fire the hectic fine and delicate of frame the victim worn with pulmonary cough on life's last verge a maid of matchless waste the broad big-bosomed series full displayed as from the bed of bacchus the flat-nosed of monkey shape a satyr from the woods and the broad-lipped a nymph for kisses formed but countless such conceits and to narrate idle yet grant the frame adored possessed a face divine that all the power of love plays o'er each limb symphonious others still exist of equal beauty still ourselves once lived without her 
and full well we know she, too, each art essays the baser need, and so with sense bedobs her that her maids far fly oppressed, and vent their smothered laugh. Then, too, the wretched lover oft abroad bars she, who at her gate loud weeping stands, kissing the walls that clasp her, with perfumes bathing the splendid portals, and around scattering rich wreaths and odiferous flowers. Yet when at length admitted, the first breath so deep offends him, he some motive seeks instant to quit her, his long-labored speech of suffering drops, and owns himself a fool, that for one moment he could deem her crowned with charms the race of mortals ne'er can boast. This know full well the Paphian nymphs, and, deep behind the scenes of action, each defect strive they to hide from him they fain would sway. But vain the attempt, for oft the mind will guess the latent blemish, and the laugh unfold. Whence those of soul ingenious frankly own, frequent, those faults which none can all escape. Yet not forever do the softer sex feign joys they feel not, as with close embrace, breast joined to breast, their paramours they clasp and print their humid kisses on their lips. Oft from their hearts engage they, urged amain by mutual hopes to run the race of love. Thus nature prompts, by mutual hopes alone, by bliss assured, birds, beasts, and grazing herds, the task essay. Nor would the female else e'er bear the burden of the vigorous male, by mutual joys propelled. Hast thou not seen, hence tempted, how in mutual bonds they strive, worked off to madness? How the race canine stain with their vagrant loves the public streets, diversely dragging, and the chain obscene tugging to loose, while yet each effort fails? Toils they would ne'er essay if unassured of mutual bliss, and cheated to the yoke, whence o'er and o'er the bliss must mutual prove. If when the male his genial energy imparts, the female deep her breath retract transported most, the race produced will, then, from female store prove female, if reversed, from store paternal male. But when the form blends both its parents' features, it ascends from equal powers of each, the impulse warm rousing alike, through each conflicting frame, the seeds of latent life in scale so nice that neither conquers nor to conquest yields. Oft view we, too, the living lines portrayed of ancestors remote, for various seeds commingled various through the parent frame lurk, which from race to race preserve entire the form, the features of the anterior stock. Diversely such the power creative blends, whence oft the voice revives the hair, the hue, the full complexion of the race deceased, for these as sure from seeds defined ascend, as e'en the face, the body, or the limbs. Then, too, though male the fetus, female stores aid the production, while, if female formed, the tide paternal mixes in the make, for both must join, or naught can e'er ensue. But obvious this, that when the semblance more inclines to either, the prevailing sex chief lent the seeds of life, and reared complete the virgin embryo, or incipient man. Nor ever interfere the gods above in scenes like these, the genial soil lock up, or curse with barren love the man unblessed, no lovely race who boasts to hail him sire, as deem the many who, 
in sadness drowned, oft offer victims, and with fragrant gums kindle the blazing altar, wearying heaven vainly to fill the void reluctant womb. For blank sterility from seeds ascends too gross, or too attenuate, if the last, ne'er to the regions that generic spread, cleave they, rejected instant as propelled. But if too gross the genial atoms, dull move they, and spiritless, or never urged with force sufficient, or if power devoid, the puny ducts to pierce, or pierced, to blend harmonious with the vital fluid found. For love harmonious, whence increase alone can spring, oft differs largely, easier far some filling some, and others easier filled, and gravid made by others, whence, at times, those many a hymen who have erst essayed vainly at length the appropriate stores acquire, and feel the lovely load their wombs enrich. While he, perchance, whose prior bands forbade all the fond hope of offspring, happier now a mate has found of more concordant powers, and boasts a race to prop his crumbling age. So much imports it that the seeds of life with seeds should mix symphonious, that the gross condense the rare, the rare the gross dilute, and man with woman duly paired unite. Much, too, concerns it what the foods employed, for some augment the genial stores, and some dissolve their crasis, and all power destroy nor small the moment in what mode is dealt the bland delight. The sage who views minute herds, and the savage tribes by nature led, holds that the virtuous matron chief conceives, when, with subsiding chest and loins erect, her dulcet charms she offers, fittest then the luscious tide to absorb. For naught avail exerted motions, the perpetual heave of frame high strained, and ever laboring lungs. These, rather, urged beneath the tender fray, all fruit prohibit, since the genial share oft turn they from the furrow as it holds its course direct, and break the impinging shock. And hence the wanton mistress acts like these frequent indulges to preclude increase, and more transport the lawless form she clasps. Arts the chaste matron never needs essay. Nor from the darts of Venus, nor the smile of gods above, is she of homelier make, frequent beloved. The praise is all her own. By her own deeds, by cleanliness most chaste, and sweet consenting manners, the delight lives she of him who blends his lot with hers. Such virtues must prevail, and day or day perfect their power, for, though of gentlest kind, yet urged perpetual, such the sternest heart must gradual soften, and at length subdue. Hast thou not seen the fountain's falling drops scoop in long time the most obdurate stone? End of section 12, book 4, part 3 End of book 4